Welcome to Sammy J's Audiobooks channel. Your go-to plug for all genres of Sammy J novels audio narrations that will keep you yearning for more. Please subscribe and turn on post notification to get alerts on all new audiobooks upload. In Too Deep A possessive dark romance novel by Sammy J, narrated by John Harper. Chapter 1 Aiden the heat surging from the tightly packed soil created a shimmering mirage in the air as I stepped out into the bright sunlight. A surging cheer echoed across the Plaza de Toros de la Real Maestranza de Caballeria de Sevilla, one of Spain's oldest and most sagaciously regarded bullfighting rings. I appealed to the crowd with a wave, my traja de luces resplendent with gold and maroon. The people's faces appeared indistinct beyond the veil of heat rising from the earth and the gold-bedecked stones of the ancient structure. I could feel the history there, throbbing through my feet as surely as the roar of the crowd throbbed through my breast. Having so many eyes upon me might seem the very antithesis of my chosen profession, and with good reason. I'm a cleaner, also more commonly referred to by people who have no real knowledge of the underworld, by the rather unflattering nom de guerre, Hitman. Simply put, I kill people for money. But things are never simple, are they? For example, you'd think Antonio Gallicos would have learned by the examples of those who died before him that the Main Brothers LLC does not look kindly upon those who traffic children. Not kindly at all. But he went and did it anyway, didn't he? And then he hired a veritable army of bodyguards to protect him at his Madrid villa, and hasn't ventured outside of it in weeks. My reputation is starting to suffer. Normally I conclude my business in short order. Not to sound conceited, but I am really quite good at what I do. My uncle Lucian saw potential in me from an early age. He sowed the seeds of my future, sending me to train with every type of martial arts master you could imagine. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Got my purple belt at 12. Muay Thai? I was middleweight champion at 16. Krav Maga? Highly overrated and derivative. I stopped studying and spent my time pursuing lovely Israeli girls instead. I have a reputation for more than just being good at my job. But I digress. You're not interested in hearing my backstory, are you? No. You want action, blood, passion, and intrigue. Steamy, incredibly profound romance? You're in luck. My story has all of that, and so much more. I took my position in the center of the arena, sweat rolling off my skin in rivulets. One thing a lot of people don't realize about Spain is how blasted hot it is most of the year. And needless to say, the dirt-packed arena of the Sevilla offers nary one strip of shade at this time of day. It must be murder in the stands. At least I was getting a breeze to cool the sweat on my skin. They released the bull so I could begin the first phase, the Tercio de Varas. It was a magnificent beast, all surly rippling muscle beneath a shiny black fur replete with a glaze of sweat. Its horns gleamed sharp and deadly as it stampeded out a dozen yards onto the packed earth. Like most of its ilk, this bull has spent most of its life living free on a ranch with next to no human contact. Then it was captured, shoved into a narrow stable on a truck, and driven here in high heat. Needless to say, it was a little bit perturbed. I snapped my capote about to get its attention. Time to find out if my three-day crash course on bullfighting was going to pay off. The bull lowered its horns and charged at me, kicking up gouts of dry dirt beneath its ferocious hooves. I rose onto the balls of my feet, waiting until the last moment to twist just out of reach of its deadly horns. The crowd roared with approval, so apparently I moved with at least enough grace to be convincing. This stage was all about testing the bull seeing its patterns and which horn it favors. My bovine opponent seemed to prefer goring me with his right horn, but I didn't think he'd be picky about impaling me with the left one either. The bull twisted about, bucking its rear end and pivoting on its front legs. 
It snorted loudly enough I could hear it over the crowd. I snapped the capote about and it dug in for another charge. I swept to the side, allowing its deadly horns to pass by within an eyelash of my brocaded vestments of light. Lowly silver, because even I'm not arrogant enough to wear the elite gold. The crowd had surged to their feet, waiting with bated breath for the next pass. I didn't have much time. Soon the picador would appear, a lancer mounted on an armored, blinkered horse. His role was to impale the bull's muscular shoulders with a spear in order to weaken it for the eventual ritualistic kill. I had no intention of letting things go that far. While I have no compunctions about killing people, obviously given my profession, I don't have the stomach to kill animals. Don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those nimbies who want to abolish bullfighting. I realize it has great cultural significance, even religious overtones for the people who practice it. That doesn't mean I want to participate, however. I'd come to kill Galagos, not the bull. I'd been working my way slowly toward the north end of the stands, where Galagos sat beneath a red canopy draped over Doric columns painted bright yellow. The Seville is a beautiful structure. I'll give it that. You'd never know just how blood-soaked the ground really is. I could see him now, beyond the bull's heaving sides, watching with a slight grin on his mustachioed face. I wondered if he grinned like that while he sold children peddling them like goods on the market. Usually when Lucian asked me to eliminate someone, it wasn't personal. It was just business. I didn't allow myself to enjoy the actual killing because I'm not a sadist or a butcher. But this time, just this one time, I decided Galagos's crimes warranted a certain pleasure in his demise. The sound of the gate drawing up to allow the picador's ingress stirred me out of my semi-reverie. The bull charged in, and I swept to the side again, thrilling the crowd. Then I bent low and charged, my feet kicking up dirt just as the bull's hooves had before. Galagos's face crossed with a confused frown just as I leaped up and leveraged myself over the wall. One of his bodyguards, apparently not so slow on the uptake as Galagos, moved to intercept me, but I threw my capote into his face. While he grappled with the surprisingly heavy cloth, I charged in at Galagos unobstructed. No horas con los mains, I said. Don't fuck with the mains. Then I buried the Hispanic shimmering length smoothly into his breast. Galagos's mouth opened to allow a frothy fountain of blood to escape. I could have withdrawn my blade cleanly, and he would have died without much further pain. But that's not what I wanted. Galagos deserved an agonizing death. So I took the copper-wrapped hilt in both hands and twisted it viciously. Galagos tried to scream, choking on his own blood and vomit. I left the sword embedded in his chest and ran in an entirely different direction than anyone would have thought. I jumped over the wall and back into the arena. Any good assassin knows to plan their escape route ahead of time. And I'm not just any good assassin. I'm the best. The picador struggled to control his mount. The armored beast had picked up on its rider's anxiety. That worked in my favor as I dashed up and seized his wrist. With a mighty yank, I pulled him off the horse to collapse into a groaning pile on the hard-packed dirt. The crowd was screaming now, in a state of panic. This was not the type of bloodshed they were expecting. But perhaps it was the type they deserved for harboring one such as Galagos in their midst. I ripped the blinder off the horse and kicked my heels into his flanks. The horse took off like a bolt of lightning, and I guided him toward the yawning exit. As I rode hard, the portcullis began lowering. I knew I'd never make it through in time. I'd be unmounted, or perhaps even decapitated or impaled. Digging my heels in harder, slapping the reins on the horse's flanks to encourage greater speed, I tilted myself in the saddle and rode under the portcullis like a true Comanche warrior on the ancient plains of America. The horse and I plunged into the dark tunnel, which smelled of dirt and livestock, past surprised members of my entourage, who no doubt would be quite displeased they wouldn't get to duel the bull by my side, 
and out through the rear exit of the arena. Surprised pedestrians scrambled to get out of my way as I galloped down the avenue. The streets were old here, narrow and twisty, and it was quite easy to get lost. But one of the most important attributes an assassin could have is a good memory. I guided the horse through a trash-strewn alley, and then turned the corner and headed into a large thoroughfare, not meant for motor vehicles, let alone a galloping armored horse. A produce stand loomed before me, and I kicked the horse into a full charge. We leaped over the frightened stall vendor, snapping the thin wooden poles that held up his protective sun canopy. I became somewhat entangled in the canopy, and struggled to free it with one hand while guiding the reins with the other. A policeman surged toward me, waving his arms wildly in an attempt to spook the horse, which might have worked if this were not an equine trained to do battle with bulls. I tossed the canopy over his head and caught him up in it. He was pulled off his feet, and I dragged him for half a block before I finally managed to free myself. The horse surged forward with greater speed, now free of the extra burdensome weight. We plunged through a narrow alleyway, me ducking under clotheslines, holding drying linen. When I was halfway through the alley, I reached up and grabbed one of the lines, pulling myself out of the saddle and spectacularly dismounting. I dove into the dark environs of the rear exit to a small family-run restaurant. The man who owned it owed the mains more than he could ever repay. The staff feigned ignorance as I quickly stripped and handed my garments to the proprietor who threw them into a fire-brick oven. Then I moved up a narrow flight of stairs, clad only in my black silk Calvin Klein underwear, and a lovely young maiden gave me a hasty sponge bath before drying my skin and helping me into a tailored three-piece suit. Then I headed down to the restaurant level and sat down at a table. Immediately, a plate of jamón Iberico appeared before me, and I spread a napkin over my lap, I calmly ate, enjoying a nice, dry, white wine with my meal. The police thrust their ugly noses into the restaurant, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Surely a man who just murdered another man in front of ten thousand witnesses would not be sitting down placidly to enjoy a meal. They moved on, and I finished my dinner before tipping lavishly. The owner suddenly nodded to me as I exited into the hot afternoon sun. I caught a taxi back to my hotel, chatting with the driver in his native tongue. Castilian Spanish can be tricky, but I've got a knack for language, a helpful attribute in my line of work. When I reached my hotel, the front desk clerk greeted me cheerfully and invited me into the back office where a phone call awaited me. I put the cradle to my ear and spoke. Hello, Lucian. Aiden, he said in a tense but polite tone. I take it the matter has been settled. It has. Good. I want you on the next flight back to New York. New York? I asked in alarm. I'm supposed to be heading to Morocco next. There's going to be a lot of heat on you, Aiden. You need to lie low for a bit. But I already have the Morocco job set up, I said. There's no need to jump across the pond and then come right back. You're coming home, Aiden, Lucian said firmly. I expect you on the next available flight. The line went dead. I laid the phone down on the cradle and grimaced in frustration. It looked like I was going home after all, whether I liked it or not. Chapter 2 Selena the lights shone off the Thames in blurry resplendence as I strolled down the walk in six-inch heels. I'd have chosen more practical footwear, but my red Valentino evening gown clashed with virtually everything I brought with me to London. A man smiled broadly at me as I passed, though I remained utterly indifferent to his interest. I didn't mind the attention, at least when I'm not on the job. My particular skill set lends itself to a vocation known to operate best in the shadows. I'd been referred to by many different titles. Specialist. Cleaner. Spook. Assassin. The last one was rarely used in polite company. 
In fact, the only people who referred to me by such a crass and overt title were the authorities who investigated my handiwork. For years, I trotted the globe plying my trade. I'd been to Budapest, Moscow, Tokyo, Chicago, Honolulu, and everywhere in between. No one had ever gotten close to discovering my identity. Or my true profession. Which was understandable as I was trained by the best. My father, Vladimir Yeltsin. God rest his soul. My father ran a branch of the Olafs, a group of Russian, shall we say, businessmen, who operated globally but with a particular stake in New York City. Ran as in past tense. Given his line of work, his dying peacefully of old age was nigh impossible, but I didn't expect to still be in my twenties when he passed. Passed. Was murdered, more likely, by my wicked stepmother, Moira. It seems that Vladimir Yeltsin survived car bombs, poisonings, bullets, and blades, only to be brought low by a different kind of enemy with a different kind of weapon. The weapon all women carried between their legs. Some say the cradle of civilization. Moira and I had always been cool but civil toward each other. Even after my father died, choked on his food, they say. I didn't allow myself the luxury of being openly hostile toward her. That would have been a very short career trajectory indeed. Moira Yeltsin was the queen of the Olafs now. And God help anyone who crossed Her Majesty. Among my father's assets when he passed was a six-story building on the Thames, crumbling but beautiful in its own way. My stepmother had it demolished and built the garish glass and steel tower she dubbed the Palace, in direct opposition to the actual Buckingham Palace not far away. It was a nightclub, at least ostensibly. Indeed, the bottom three floors were taken up by a multi-stage dance floor with four separate bars, so a means to slake your thirst was always within reach. The upper levels were host to many different activities. On the fourth floor, you could partake in high-stakes gambling, off the books, of course. And if you needed a loan, there was no need to worry about collateral, because the Dark Queen's collateral was you. Failure to repay would result in a visit from one of my ilk. Not me, though. I'm too high-end. I only got out of bed for the high-value targets. But I digress. Back in those days, I was full of piss and vinegar and resentment. Every man I strangled or shot or pushed into a river wore my stepmother's face. I saw myself killing her in my dreams at night. Revenge seemed so distant a probability in the real world that I had to do something with those urges. In spite of the fact that my stepmother killed my father, and she knew I knew, our association was surprisingly congenial. She paid me well. Very well, in fact. Twice the standard fees, along with the use of her vast array of homes, fleets of vehicles, and, of course, all the surplus military equipment my suitcases could hold. There's a reason I only brought seven pairs of shoes to London. I needed the cargo space for other things. Like my Dragunov high-caliber sniper rifle, the most powerful of its kind in the world. I once took out a target by firing a round through the engine block of his Shelby Cobra. I approached the ground floor entrance, and as usual, the line of eager, would-be dancers stretched around the block. They stood there, shivering in the London night chill, wearing their finery. Some of the younger, more vibrant young women wore just a suggestion of clothing. Translucent skirts lit up with LED hues, their undergarments on full display, or non-existent. The palace is a wild place, even for the London nightlife. Of course, I didn't need to go to the end of the line, or any place in the line for that matter. I approached the velvet rope guarded entrance, and a hulking mass of muscles stuffed into an ill-fitting tux grinned from ear to ear. Welcome back, Miss Selena, he rumbled in a deep baritone. His blunt features belied the grace of his speech and his excellent manner. 
Nice to see you, Lindsay, I said with a smile. Been staying out of trouble? Ah, you know me. A paradigm of virtue and clean living. We shared a light chuckle as he moved the velvet rope aside for my ingress. Unfortunately, one of the waiting would-be patrons, a young man with unfortunate spiked hair that went out of style a decade ago, took exception to this. Oh, come on. I've been standing here in the miserable rain, you limey bastard. Oh, an American. Uncouth has been encoded into the strands of their DNA. Then you'll be waiting a lot longer with that attitude, you sot. Lindsay said with a growl. You must be a VIP, the American said, leering at the expanse of leg revealed through the slit in my evening gown. How about me and you ditch this dumpster fire and go somewhere with some class? I'm sorry. I have a prior engagement, I said with a smile. Perhaps another time. His hand closed on my bicep, an action which would never have occurred if I had not allowed it. Hey, Trick, he snapped. There wasn't a request. He tried to tug me down the shallow, i.e. elegant, steps. And I went with the motion and stepped behind him, pulling his arm into a painful hammerlock. Ah, oh, let me go, he cried plaintively. I leaned in close and whispered in his ear. Your wish is my command. I twisted his arm just a bit and dislocated his elbow with a wet pop. The man screamed and fell to the rain-drenched pavement cradling his injured limb. Lindsay laughed as I entered the club, tidying up my hair a bit on the way inside. Always a pleasure, Miss Selena. Likewise, Lindsay, I replied. The deep pulsing throb of EDM blasted over me. Gyrating bodies swirled in a molten sea of fiery embraces on the dance floor. Naked sexual energy oozing from their every pore. Drinks started at 70 pounds, and that's for the house white wine. The well-heeled criminal elite and politically mighty peruse the palace. But it's like a magnificent carpet draped over a fetid sea of roaches and rodents. Lift up a corner, allow the light of day to shine upon them, and they will scurry away in every direction. I headed for the elegant glass lift, which took me up to the topmost floor of the palace. The door slid open and I moved across a marble floor with rich black striations set within purest ivory. Exquisite sculptures of nude mythic figures lined the corridor as I headed past rows of closed, likely locked doors. On this floor, the most dangerous of games were played. Illegal auctions, underworld trades, and many other things, which beggar the imagination. The hallway terminated in a set of tall double doors, nearly nine feet of solid oak painted a rich, bloody red. Golden rods acted as handrails. And when I say gold, I'm not referring to their color for their composition. A pair of burly men, not quite as large as Lindsay, but more tastefully garbed, nodded politely at me as I approached. They each seized one of the rods in their meaty fists and swung them open with a grunt of exertion. No less than 20 feet of bare marble floor separated me from the large, ornate desk in the dead center of the room and the woman sitting behind it. Moira smiled at me as I approached, rising from her seat and coming over with a swish of her D&G blazer dress. Selena, she said in a light tone. We embraced for a moment, and then she moved back behind the desk, and I seated myself in one of the overstuffed leather chairs before it. It's so good to see you, she lied. How are things in Prague? Just fine, I lied back. It had been an ordeal to get my target in the crosshairs, but I wasn't going to show weakness to the evil queen in our own court. How have things been here at home? Moira's ice-blue eyes narrowed ever so slightly, even though her smile remained intact. She's beautiful despite her forty-something-odd years, elegant and even regal down her back, and rich ruby-red lipstick glistened in the elegant overhead lights. 
Oh, you know, I can't complain, she said. I'm so glad you were able to get here swiftly. I have an urgent matter of the utmost importance, which requires your personal attention. I smiled and crossed my legs, leaning back in the chair. Who's the client? I asked. Moira chuckled and opened her desk, removing a manila envelope. We don't use digital files much. Those can be hacked. She slides it across the glass top of her desk, and I snap my finger down on top of it with a loud splat. I opened the folder and peered inside as a smile spread over my lips. Well, isn't he a handsome devil? I asked. The man in the photos was indeed good-looking, with dark hair, blue eyes, and high cheekbones with a strong jaw. Most of the photos were clearly taken from the society page of a newspaper website, but several were more candid. In one of them, he rose from a swimming pool in a tight speedo, chiseled physique dripping with water. Quite. I hear he's something of a ladies' man. Well, that will make my job that much easier. Normally, I wasn't into sleeping with my clients. Too much of a chance of a complication. But in this case, I decided I might make an exception. Who is he? Moira paused for a long moment, eyeing me with an inscrutable expression. Aiden Maine. Aiden Maine? I blurted. This is an honor. Now, isn't it? Aiden Maine was legendary, as in everyone had heard of him, but no one had actually met him that I knew of. Or rather, all of those who had were dead. Indeed. I knew you were the only one I could rely upon for this matter. You're taking a big risk. Going after one of the Mayhem brothers, I replied. What's his sin? He slew Antonio Galagos in broad daylight during a bullfight. I whistled and closed the file. My, my. Such a naughty young man. I suppose he'll have to be disciplined. Moira grinned and gestured toward me. That I will leave in your expert hands. Be careful, Selina. The mains are incredibly dangerous. I laughed softly and opened the folder once more to gaze upon the magnificence of Aiden's body. So am I, Moira, I said coldly. So am I. Aiden Maine is just my type. Handsome, suave, and dangerous. Too bad I have to kill him. Chapter 3 Aiden when Lucian Maine said jump, most people asked, How high, sir? Even those, no, especially those who were related to him. So it should come as no surprise that I was, in fact, on the first available flight back to the Big Apple, which turned out to be a red eye. The Madrid airport crawled with extra security, and everyone's papers were checked and rechecked several times. I was singled out for a random search, which caused me no consternation whatsoever. I'm not dumb enough to try and get my gear, my wonderful toys, through airport security. Everything is shipped directly via the main family's air freight business. Lucian pays a pretty penny to ensure the right people look the other way at precisely the right times, of course. Even if, for some reason, my illegal military-grade weapons were to be discovered by the wrong person... There were enough shell corporations and fall guys already in place to prevent it from being a full-scale debacle. The lights of New York glimmered through my window, a shimmering sea of artificial stars which seemed oddly ostentatious after the more subtle hues of the Spanish metropolis I left in my wake. By the time the plane landed and taxied about to the terminal, the first pink heralds of dawn kissed the horizon. The stark, sleek skyscrapers of glass and steel appeared in stark relief against the cheery hue, as if resisting the sun brightening their darkness. When I headed out of LaGuardia, the sun had emerged triumphantly. Those formerly black sentinels of gloom had become spectacular fields of a million mirrors reflecting the sun's glory. I was reminded of the bright Spanish sun 
when I had stood in my raiment of light on the hard-packed dirt. Here it seemed much gentler. I knew that wouldn't last. Once the sun climbed to its zenith, the Big Apple would be baking. Fortunately, I had an air-conditioned car waiting for me, complete with a driver, my cousin Will. He stood leaning against a blue-and-white Dodge Charger, its chassis polished to a gleam in the early morning sun. One of Will's muscular arms draped over the slender, freckled shoulders of his bride-to-be, Scarlet. I'd met her a few times. She was more than a match for ex-Special Forces Will. In fact, sometimes I felt sorry for him. Then again, I'd never make a play for a family member's woman, but Scarlet looks awfully good in her capri top and cut-off shorts, which display a length of shapely freckled leg. Their sunglass-shrouded gazes turned my way, and a grin spread over Will's face. The prodigal son returns, he said, clasping my hand. Good to see you, Will, I said, smiling back. You too, Scar. How was your flight? she asked. Just fine. Julio is a fine pilot. I gestured toward the sapphire-hued charger. New toy? Yeah. Just finished restoring her, Will said. A fierce grin crossed his face. You want a driver? Do I? I said as he threw me the keys. You know, new cars look like something barfed out of a bad sci-fi writer's imagination. These 70s lead sleds had something special. Class, Scarlet suggested. Will and I nodded in agreement as I slipped behind the wheel. Restored leather bucket seats cradled my body, and I adjusted the seat as I'm a bit shorter than Will. Scarlet got in the rear while Will rode up front with me. How long's it been since you drove stick? He asks. Last week, actually. Something sporty? I wish. It was a pinto. A pinto? Scarlet blurted. When you're looking for a getaway ride, beggars can't be choosers. We rode to Lucian's uptown office in style. It was a bit frustrating, though. All those horses, no room to gallop. When they dropped me off, I made Will promise to let me drive the Charger somewhere I could really let loose. Lucian's secretary slash bodyguard buzzed me, favoring me with a sweet smile. Our gazes lingered together over long, so much so that Lucian favored me with a recriminating brow arch. Try not to break any hearts in the office, he said. Who said anything about breaking her heart? I said. You know me, uncle. I don't get emotional in the business of physical pleasure. He sighed and invited me to sit opposite him. Lucian was ensconced on a leather-backed half-sofa, twin to the one I settled upon. Coffee? he asked. Always, I replied gratefully. He tipped the small black pitcher and poured a stream of steaming magnificence into a white porcelain cup with engraved ivy leaves. I took a sip and closed my eyes to savor the notes. I detect chocolate, coconut, and cinnamon. Kansas City blend. You're way off. Houston blend, Lucian said with a chuckle. Now... This is the part where I tell you to pass the Morocco job off to Navajo Joe, and where you throw a fit and say no. I chuckled and took another sip. Sweet Jesus, where did Lucian get his coffee? One of these days I had to find out. I'd like to think I won't throw a fit, I say. But come on, Lucy. Joe? Joe's a solid worker, Lucian said, putting emphasis on the word worker. Lucian calls assassination, doing the work. Yeah, he's solid, all right. He's also a blunt instrument, and the Morocco job requires a scalpel. I'm your scalpel. I'm the surgeon. Surgeon? Lucian asked with a laugh. That's rich, considering you cosplayed as a matador and stuck a sword through a guy's chest. Heard about that, did you? I asked. Who hasn't heard about it? We've pulled strings to bury it on the back page of the internet, figuratively speaking, but still. I didn't have much choice. Galagos knew you were coming after him, 
so he took measures. I had to get creative. Creative is one word for it. Still, nice work. Galagos did the one thing that makes me mad. He messed with kids. Kids walk with the gods. Damn straight, I said. We bumped our mugs together with a clink. A bit of coffee sloshed out of my cup onto the table, and I used a napkin to mop it up. Look, Lucy, I know there's heat on me, but I've spent months setting up the job. You just want to cosplay as a race car driver, he said. With all respect, Uncle Lucy, I wasn't cosplaying in Spain. I worked hard to learn the art of bullfighting. It's a lot more complex than just snapping a cape, you know? Quite. Lucian sighed and rubbed his eyes, suddenly seeming tired. When's the last time you slept? I'm fine, Aiden. All right, I'm going to let you go to Morocco. But watch your back. Galagos had a lot of powerful friends in high places. I will, Uncle Lucy. You can count on me. I know I can, boy, he said with a grin. I wouldn't be sending you if I couldn't. Stay sharp. I spent the night in the Big Apple, hanging out with my cousin Derek and his spirited fiancée, Ella. They had a whole high school sweethearts reunited as adults thing going, but that's not my story to tell. The next morning, I was on a flight to Africa, traveling as my alter ego, Aiden Miller, ace Formula One racer and an alternate for Maine Motorsports, Lucian's creatively named Vanity Project. At least it was coming in useful for me. Casablanca was a strange place, having begun its life as a pirate bay used by more pirates to harass Christian ships and then being taken over by a succession of European powers. Every new conqueror built upon and around the old structures. Some of the city appeared very French in regard to architecture, but then you'd turn a corner and feel like you were back in the early days of the Persian Empire and everything felt ancient and haunted. The glittering sea crawled, sunlight dappling the gentle waves as I headed into town in the rear of a taxi with poorly functioning air conditioning. It let me off at my hotel, a JW Marriott built a few years ago. I checked in and then set about establishing a paper trail for Aiden Miller. I had to make it look, as much as possible, that I was him. So... What does a foreigner with money and time to burn do upon arrival at the most romantic city on the continent? Paint the town red, of course. I dined in a five-star restaurant, tipped lavishly, and hit on everything with two X chromosomes in sight. Being sure to mention I was a race car driver, of course. By the end of my meal, I had a vast collection of phone numbers stored on my Android. Perhaps I'd look some of them up. Not because I was that taken with them, but because it would make me appear more normal. I asked about entertainment and was directed to an old-school blues club built during the Second World War. The building itself was old masonry, but the interior appeared to have every modern convenience. Free Wi-Fi, too. I wound up at a table in front of the Half Moon stage, watching an American troupe whose youngest member was probably in his 70s. They sure could jam, though. I'm not even a huge blues fan, but I clapped with genuine enthusiasm at the end of their set. As I nursed a bottle of Chardonnay, the lights abruptly dimmed. The MC came on and spoke in accented English, since that's the language spoken by most of the patrons. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to our stage the lovely and talented Miss Selena Blaze. Selena Blaze? Had to be a stage name. I could think of two possible scenarios. One, either she was old and ugly, but could really croon. Or two, she was young and pretty, and couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. The spotlight snapped on, startling me as it cast a pool of radiance over a woman on stage. My jaw dropped open at the sight of her. Long-limbed, skin as white as the driven snow with lustrous, semi-curly black locks cascading over her bare shoulders. Her curvaceous form was clad in a sequined blue evening gown, with a neckline plunging enough to be sexy, but not sluttish. I looked into her blue eyes, 
and felt as if I were plunging into icy pools atop a melting glacier. It took me a moment to realize I had stopped breathing. When I respired again, it was with a great gasp filling my lungs. Yes, I thought, she definitely won't be able to sing. Selena stepped up to the microphone and grasped it in both her hands. The band started into sooner or later, and she parted her ruby red lips. A sweet, soulful mezzo-soprano emanated from her, washing over me and everyone else. Crowd settled down. The clink of knives against plates ceased. Conversations died on the vine. All eyes turned toward the mesmerizing woman on stage. I found myself instantly, painfully erect. I took in the sight of her, feasting with my eyes even as I consumed her brilliance with my ears. Her dress had a slit all the way to the waist, showing an expanse of shapely, dark, hose-clad leg. I watched as she took the mic off the stand and moved toward the edge of the stage, drowning out all other presences in the room with a sheer, naked charisma that would-be performers would die to possess. She swept her gaze over the audience, knowing she had them in her grasp, but so lost in her song that she was as much a prisoner as the rest of us. Then our eyes met for the first time. An invisible, soundless crackle of energy connected us for that brief moment. I found myself leaning forward, as if aching to be nearer her. I found myself thinking... It would totally be in character for an ace driver to make a play for the sexy chartreuse. I was also thinking I had to make her mine, even if only for one night. Yes, I had to make her mine. Chapter 4 Selena He wouldn't be foolish enough to continue with his mission, my stepmother said and waved her hand as if brushing away the notion. I shrugged to appease her. I knew his arrogance would get the better of him. Despite the obviousness of his plan, he was confident no one would be smart enough to see through it. I was glad he was going to go through with it. I wanted the action. I had grown bored. Plus, toying with a mark was always more fun than a straight kill. I'll handle it either way, I told her. She huffed a bit and left, the trail of her cloying perfume still lingering. I strode over to the dressing room mirror and studied my outfit. The blood-red dress suited me perfectly. It clung to my slim curves and hugged my legs until it brushed the tops of my ankles. It shimmered in the light, and I knew it would draw his attention. I felt a flush of pleasure thinking about his eyes on me. It really was a shame I had to kill him. If it weren't my last, and if he wasn't the key to my freedom, I might not do it. But I wanted my freedom, and he was the price to be paid. My eyes were bright with the anticipation of the game. There was nothing like drawing the prey in. I checked my reflection one last time, I only had a moment before I had to be on stage. The stylist had left my hair down and curled a few delicate waves around my face, giving me the appearance of an old-fashioned starlet. It was rather becoming. Selena, you're on again in five, a voice called through the door. Coming, I replied and hurried from the room. I had three more sets tonight. I don't want any visitors. No one comes here after the show, got it? I barked at security. They both nodded, unfazed by my sharp tone. I supposed after working for Moira, I was probably the nicest person they had guarded. One of the guards offered me a bottle of water. I took a large swig and passed it back to him. Let's do this. I clapped my hands together and strutted out onto the darkened stage. I could feel him in the audience. A jolt of excitement shot through me as the lights snapped on, and the music began. My voice rang out softly across the room, settling into the corners. I made sure my hair covered half of my face, so he couldn't get a good look at me. Thankfully, it gave me the appearance of being coy, 
which I could feel enticed him. I closed my eyes and felt myself getting swept up in the song, my emotions wafting through the audience. I was bringing them along with me. Their reactions pounded against my senses, but I didn't lose focus. Instead, I drank it up, using it to fuel me. When the last note rang out, the audience leaped to their feet, whistles and clapping reverberating against the walls. I gave a small smile and sauntered off the stage, throwing one last peek over my shoulder. His sharp blue eyes were appraising me thoughtfully. I hustled back into the dressing room so I could pull off the ridiculously high heels I had chosen to wear. My feet seemed to sigh in relief as I shucked them. A tray balanced on the dressing table bearing a bottle of champagne and one glass. Ah, oh, thank God, I declared and poured myself a large dram. The bubbles tickled against my nose as I sipped. A light knock sounded on the door, and I quirked an eyebrow. He didn't. The door opened, and his handsome face appeared around the corner. I narrowed my eyes at him. I thought I made it clear to them I didn't want any visitors, I said, and crossed my legs up onto the table, causing my dress to fall away past my knees. I watched his eyes travel up my legs. I hid the fact that I was impressed he had gotten past security. I had done it as a test, and he passed. He smirked and walked into the room, holding the door ajar. Is that an invitation to stay? His voice was deep and melodic. Does that work on all the girls? I asked, and tossed back the rest of my drink. He paused for a minute. I don't usually have to do a lot of persuading. His eyes darkened slightly. Hmm... I replied nonchalantly, and gazed into my empty glass. I could feel his confusion. He usually didn't meet this much resistance when it came to women. So, is that a no? He made to leave. I waved my hand at him. You can say, I suppose, but I only have one glass. I gestured toward the glass in my hand. He smiled and closed the door leaning against it. I didn't come back to have a drink. His reply was smooth and calculated. Had he not been a mark, I would have had him then and there. Instead, I proffered a small laugh and poured more champagne into my flute. So, what did you come back here for? I will say, it must be a hell of a reason to sneak past security, assuming you didn't kill them. I glanced at him over the rim of my glass. His handsome face broke out into a smile. He shook his head. No, I didn't kill them. They were just easily distracted, is all. I didn't press the matter. I found him intriguing. Anyways, I came back because I wanted to meet you. I'm flattered, I replied. His grin deepened and he moved a little closer. I stood up and motioned to the small settee in the corner. He sat on the ledge facing toward me. I scooted back against the plush cushions and tucked my feet underneath me. I knew it would make me seem smaller and more easily persuaded. Your voice is incredible, he began, his eyes roaming over my artfully placed body. I know. I smiled and toyed with the neckline of my dress. I felt his eyes narrow in. I guess you must, considering the size of the audience. I shrugged. It's just another night. I sipped the drink delicately, licking a stray drop from the rim. I could nearly feel his rush of desire. A sharp knock at the door drew our attention away from each other. Five minutes until you're on again, the voice called. I sighed and stretched, arching my back just so. Can I see you after? He asked, a slight tone of urgency in his voice. I gave him a small smile. Why should I? I challenged and stood, pushing my feet back into my heels. 
I'll make it worth your time, he said instantly, a smile that dripped with promise. I felt myself flush, the blood pinking my pale face. I guess we'll see if you live up to it. You can meet me here after the set. He reached for my hand and grazed his lips across my knuckles. A ripple of pleasure rolled through me. Until then, he replied and laughed. My heart pounded. I wasn't sure if it was from the thrill of a kill or his lips. I pushed the thought away and straightened my dress. Only a few songs until he would be back here. My eyes glittered in the vanity lights as I cast one last look at myself. The pink still lingered on my cheekbones. I finished the rest of my set. I noticed he wasn't in the crowd. I wondered if he had gotten cold feet or simply found something or someone else that sparked his interest more. I felt a pang of disappointment at the thought. My dressing room was blissfully quiet after the clamor of the audience. I stripped off the gaudy dress and tossed it on the floor. I surveyed the items in my bag and decided on an outfit I knew would play up my best features. But that was more me than the glittery show dress. I tucked my curves into a pair of tight, high-rise jeans that accentuated my figure and hugged my small waist. I topped it with a long sleeve black shirt and brushed the curls out of my hair, preferring the natural wave. I wiped some of the show makeup off, instead opting for a more natural look. The door opened as I swiped some gloss across my lips. It was Moira. You're up late, I remarked, blotting the excess lip balm. She scowled. He's still alive. She crossed her arms, leaning against the now closed door. Obviously, I wasn't going to kill him in my dressing room. I'm meeting him shortly. Her eyebrows lifted. A less obvious location for the job, I said slowly, sarcasm dripping from my words. Her eyes narrowed. As long as it is done, her retort was sharp. I've never not done it. Plus, I'm not going to shy away just because he has a pretty face. I pushed my feet into my boots and grabbed my purse. Her eyes followed me across the room. Good. I need this done. The sooner the better. Yeah, yeah. Can I go now? I stood in front of her. She hesitated. I wondered if she was going to strike me. I felt my adrenaline go up. I was itching for a fight. After a long minute, she moved aside so I could get past her. Oh, and Selena? She called out sweetly. I turned. Do try not to fall in love with him. I snorted and slammed the door behind me. The night was cool and refreshing after being cloistered in the nightclub. A slight breeze lifted my sweaty hair from my collar, and I felt calmer. I pulled my vape pen from my purse and took a long drag of the bitter apple flavor I loved. The smoke billowed around me and was carried away by the wind. I checked my watch. He was late. I would give him ten minutes before I headed home. I could always kill him tomorrow. I closed my eyes and let the ocean breeze soothe my ire. Another long drag. The street was beginning to empty. I was getting annoyed. Patience, I whispered to myself. I didn't know why I was so on edge. I wanted to see him again. It was irritating. I saw a drunk man come stumbling from the club, swaying as he tried to hold himself upright. I watched him with disdain as he weaved in my direction, the smell of alcohol wafting from him. Oh, it's you, he slurred, grinning stupidly at me. I glared at him. I don't think I know you, I replied coolly my hand sliding down to my waist where my gun was neatly hidden. You sh should, he stammered, coming closer. I don't think so, I whispered, my hand wrapped around the butt of my pistol. He lurched forward and I slapped his hand away, causing him to stumble. You bitch, he hissed and turned. 
That's not very nice, I said, and lightly pushed him with the heel of my boot. He fell ungracefully to his knees and growled at me as he reached out. I saw a taxi pull up to the curb and checked my watch. It should be him. My date's here, gotta run. With a swift shove, he fell back into the bushes, and I leaned nonchalantly against the wall. I took a deep drag and watched Aiden walk toward me through the smoke, a smile on his face. Chapter 5 Aiden Even as the warm night breeze caressed my skin and brought a scent of the sea, I could still smell Selena's mix of performance sweat and expensive perfume. My mind glowed with the pleasure of our brief time together and the knowledge that shortly I'd have her all to myself again. I flagged down a taxi and climbed into the back seat. What a contrast the little mini car was compared to Will's muscle car beast. I was surprised there wasn't a little key to wind it up with, but I didn't have the time to be choosy. I only had a couple of hours until I was scheduled to meet with Selena again, and I needed every minute of it. The taxi let me out at my hotel, where I took a fast shower and selected more date apropos gear. I'd done this a thousand times before, and normally it didn't take all that long. Throw on a nice shirt and trousers, some cologne, maybe run a comb through my hair, and out the door I went. But I'd underestimated just how enchanting Selena truly was. I wound up trying on nearly every garment I'd brought along before settling on a black sport coat worn over a white silk shirt. I mixed it up a little with charcoal slacks, polished my ostrich hide shoes, and checked the time. I grew alarmed, seeing I only had half an hour to make it back in time. Hastily, I called down to the front desk and asked them to have a cab waiting for me in five minutes. When I breezed into the bathroom to check my appearance one last time, I was chagrined to find my face stubbly. But I had no time to shave, and had to hope I could overcome the handicap with charm. I paused, frowning at my reflection. Why did I care so much? Sure, Selena was something else, but I was a well-known man about town. I didn't form long-term connections with women, though I wasn't one of those creeps who lied, either. I'd never told a woman I loved her when it wasn't true, even if it would have made my mission easier. I made a vow to myself, man to mirror. No matter how smitten I might have been with Selena, I would not get involved too deeply. Once my target lay dead, I would have to beat a fast retreat out of Casablanca, out of the entire Eastern Hemisphere, in fact. Getting involved emotionally was a bad idea. The little voice in the back of my mind told me that even seeing her at all was a bad idea. I was here to do a job, to work for Lucian, and then leave. While I often found something soft and sweet to fill my bed on the job, that's all it was. A way of fulfilling my physical needs and no more. But I didn't listen. I could tell I already had no chance in hell of staying away from her. I just didn't want to admit it. When I hit the street, my taxi wasn't there yet, despite my demands of the hotel desk staff. I tried to be casual, watching the pedestrians pass by. Some of them wore hijabs. Some didn't. A curious mix of traditional practices and modern sensibilities. The stars were nigh invisible against the bright tapestry of nighttime Casablanca but the fat yellow moon still worked its magic. My taxi arrived at last, and I rode with increasing anxiety back to the club and Selena. I was going to be late. I knew it and berated my driver furiously for such. Fortunately for him, and unfortunately for me, he didn't speak English. And my Arabic was rusty. I feared Selena would believe I'd set her up and leave. I had been a fool not to get further information about her. I didn't even know her last name. Relief flooded through me in a cooling rush when I looked out the window and saw her leaning on the wall outside the club. One leg was drawn up under her, foot braced against the masonry, and her arms were crossed over her chest. She drew on a vape and let out a puff of smoke torn away almost instantly by the breeze. 
Her blue eyes remained inscrutable as I exited the cab and went to stand before her. You're late, she said flatly amid another puff of smoke. I know. I'm deeply sorry. I smiled sheepishly at her. Aiden Maine doesn't smile sheepishly. He grins like a wolf. But Selena had me that disarmed already. Thanks for waiting. Five minutes isn't bad, she said, a hint of a smile playing at her lips. Another wave of relief washed over me, though I was careful not to let it show. Ten minutes. Well, that's when I'd start thinking about taking off. I wasn't aware that there was a chronology of when to leave a tardy date in your wake. She smiled a bit more and puffed on her vape. Oh, yes. We vote on it every year at the Secret Council. Is that so? I asked. Yeah. I'm such a VIP I sing my throat raw six nights a week at a rundown blues bar in Casablanca, she said with a self-deprecating shrug. So, what would you like to do? I asked. This time of night? Morning? Whatever it is? She shook her head with world-weary resignation. Not much open. Then perhaps you'd like to take a walk, I asked, offering her my arm. She eyed me coolly with a half-lidded gaze. Not going to murder me, are you? I laughed, maybe a little too loudly. Do I look like the kind of man who'd be a killer? No, she said, and I believed it was honest. But maybe that should make me worry even more. After all, don't killers excel at blending in and getting people to drop their guard? By that logic, you could be a killer as well. She shrugged again and looked away up the street. The taillights of a passing vehicle cast a red glow over her features before they faded into sepia tones in the deep shadow. Never said I wasn't. Scenarios played across the landscape of my mind. A jilted lover on the run for shooting a cheat, perhaps? Something happened to this woman, I realized. Something that left her scarred on the inside, in stark contrast to her outer beauty. Well, I'll take my chances just the same, I said, still offering her my arm. Shall we? For a long moment, she stared at me, and I feared she might refuse. Then she tucked her vape into a red vinyl purse and stepped out of the shadows fully. She wore a pair of tight designer jeans, high-waisted as the bleeding edge of fashion dictated. A black, long-sleeved shirt bared her midriff, the pearl snap buttons reflecting the overhead lights. She took my arm, and together we strode down the sidewalk. I angled our path toward the sea, because if most things had closed down for the evening, at least we would have something lovely to look at. Not that I needed anything else to rest my gaze upon. Selena was hiding something. I had no doubt. In my line of work, that raised all kinds of alarms. For all I knew, she was an enemy agent, sent to foul me up, or even get revenge for Galagos's spectacular demise in Spain. But I didn't think that. Maybe I just didn't want to. I found her enigmatic nature just another compelling facet to admire. Tell me, Selena. I said suddenly as we turned around a corner, and the crawling sea came into view. What brings a girl like you to a place like this? Ouch. Careful with that line, she said with a soft chuckle. It might break, being an antique and all. I arched an eyebrow, not used to encountering so much resistance in a woman. Who says it was a line? Maybe I'm genuinely curious. Genuinely curious about what? Me, or what I've got between my legs? She withdrew her arm from my own and halted, staring up at me with those frosty, but oh-so-delightful blue eyes. Both, I said, being honest for one of the rare times in my life. She cocked her head to the side, a bemused, close-lipped grin crossing her face. All right, fair enough, she said, slipping her arm back into mine. We continued on to the docks and paused at the rail. The moon is lovely tonight. Now who's dropping lines? I asked teasingly. She arched a brow at me, a slight smile twitching on her lips. Do women really use lines? She asked. Not that I know of, I said. 
But I agree. The moon is lovely tonight. But even its celestial magnificence pales to the might of a mere candle before your beauty. Selena looked at me for a long moment, and then burst into laughter. I felt a stab of pain at the seeming rejection. Was I really this rusty at the game? Oh, you're good, she said, pointing at me and speaking between chuckles. Really good. I bet that line is a real panty peeler. Again, not a line. I was being genuine. Flowery, but genuine. Selena stopped chuckling and sighed, some of her defenses lowering. I almost believe you. I might even want to. Then why don't you? Believe me, I mean. Because you're not my first dapper young caller to bribe or charm his way past security, she said, looking out over the ocean. I ain't no blushing virgin. Shit, you're not even my first race car driver. I gazed upon her, my heart thumping hard in my chest, and my throat growing tight. Without thinking, I spoke. Maybe I'm your last... She glanced at me sharply, a mix of fear and suspicion in her gaze. Our eyes met for a long time as I drank in the sight of her beauty. Don't say things like that, she said at last, breaking eye contact and returning her gaze to the ocean, her shoulders tensed, hands clutching the rail more tightly than necessary. Why not? I asked. Because you can't possibly mean it. We just met a couple hours ago, took a walk... And now you're hooked? Please. I extended my hand and placed it on her soft, curved shoulder. She gasped, turning her gaze back to my own. Yes, I said, not believing what came out of my own mouth, though I knew it was true to my core. Is that wrong? Some storms brew over time, but a powerful squall can spring up from seemingly blue skies. Squalls don't last long, she said. Hurricane, then. I'm a driver, not a meteorologist. She laughed, the tension flying from her again. So, she said when her laughter died down, are you married? What? No, I said, narrowing my gaze and shaking my head. Would I be on this walk with you if I were? If you were a woman, you wouldn't even ask that question, she said. So what about you? How did you wind up driving a one-ton vehicle that can explode into fiery death if something goes wrong? That doesn't happen so much any longer, I said with a chuckle. I dared to reach up and stroke a lock of ebony hair out of her eyes, and she didn't flinch away. She disarmed me so much, I told her a truncated version of the truth. I was born into a family where you're not encouraged to excel. You're expected to. I found something I was good at. And now I do it for my family all over the world. It's hard being on the road all the time, isn't it? I could tell she spoke from personal experience. Yes, it is. But there are a lot of rewards. Money? Fame? Prestige? No, I said softly, feeling my chest grow tight. Once in a while, you have a chance to meet someone who's one in a million. Selena allowed herself to smile fully for the first time, a hand reaching up to brush through her silken hair. I found myself hoping the night would never end. And I never thought, even once, that she never answered my question. Chapter 6 Selena I stopped and leaned against a short stone wall. Aiden looked at me quizzically. I tugged my boots off and squished my toes into the sand. That's better, I sighed. He chuckled. Those heels you were wearing didn't exactly look to be the most comfortable, he replied. I shook my head. They are murder. I hate heels. I could feel my guard slipping slowly around him. It seemed to be drawing him closer to me. My strategy of seductress was sliding into more of a damsel in distress. Well, I could play that part. Standing, I pretended to stumble. His arm shot out and he caught me. I looked up. Our faces were nearly touching. His blue eyes shimmered in the moonlight. 
If I were the sentimental type, I would think it romantic. But I wasn't. I was a hunter, and he the hunted. Batting my lashes slightly, I feigned embarrassment. Are you all right? He asked. His face lit with concern. I blushed. I'm fine. I think the show wiped me out more than I thought, I said, and pulled myself away from him to give him a lingering look. So, back to your family. You have a lot to prove? I drew the conversation back to him. He drew his eyebrows together and glanced over at the ocean. His entire body seemed to tense. You could say that. Failure just isn't an option. Coming in second best in anything, well, that is unheard of. He laughed without humor in his voice. I felt for him. I knew how it felt to be held to impossible standards. I placed my hand gently on his. He weaved his fingers through mine. His eyes bore into mine. A slight smile on his face. Let's just say... There are no participation trophies in my parents' eyes. I know how you feel, I murmured, surprised at the depth hiding behind his handsome face. Most men that good-looking were vapid and shallow. He had something more. Your family isn't happy you're a singer, he asked. A singer? Oh, right. Yeah, I suppose they wish I would have joined the family business. Family business. Construction in real estate. My stepmother owns the club I sing in, I quipped. I'd almost slipped up. It was too easy to relax around him. It is a nightclub. A bit gaudy. That could describe her, minus the nice, I said morosely. Well, he asked, after I was quiet for a moment. Well, what? What's your deal? Obviously, you've got the whole evil stepmother gig going. I laughed and hated how at ease I was with him. Yeah, she's a horrible bitch. Unfortunately, she's the only family I have left. My mother died when I was a baby. My father... My voice caught in my throat. He caressed my knuckles with his thumb as I stared out at the ocean, avoiding his eyes. My father was killed a year ago. What happened? I sighed. He was murdered. They never caught who did it, I said flatly. He gripped my hand tighter. Could you hire someone to find out? I shook my head once, dismissing the notion. It's been too long now. I don't really want to open that back up again. I'm sorry, he said and squeezed my hand gently, his eyes warm. Thanks. I looked away to hide the tears that were threatening to fall. I was exhausted, and Aiden had made it too easy to open up. I felt like I could tell him anything and everything. Hell, I wondered if I could just have him kill my stepmother and save me all the efforts of having to kill him. Why don't you leave? His question caught me off guard. I can't. I owe my stepmother. And until the debt is paid, I'm stuck here. That and... Well, I have a legacy to live up to. I can understand that, he replied, looking thoughtfully out at the churning waves. Although, couldn't you still live up to his legacy somewhere else? If I left here... I would want to start over. Go somewhere no one knows who my father was or who I am. A clean slate. That actually sounds really nice, he mused. I smiled up at him, feeling lighter than I had in a long time. Every moment I spent with him was going to make it harder to kill him. I noticed that the sky was beginning to lighten. We'd been walking longer than I thought. A large yawn escaped me. He echoed it, hiding his behind his fist. He glanced at his watch. Wow, it's almost morning already, he laughed. The sun etched pink and yellow streaks across the horizon. You're easy to talk to, I mentioned. 
He smiled down at me, his face open and genuine. Why don't we sit? I motioned to a small wooden bench near the boardwalk. He nodded and we nestled together. The morning air still held a bit of chill and I pushed myself against his warm body. He lifted his arm and pressed me against his side. His arm draped across my shoulder. His fingers drew lazy circles on my arm. Gently, I laid my head in the crook of his neck and felt him smile against my hair. I don't want this to end, he murmured, nuzzling me. I giggled as the chills ran down my neck. It has been an interesting night, I replied, looking up at him. His eyes were locked onto mine, and I knew he wanted to kiss me. I parted my lips and let him. His mouth was warm and softer than I had imagined. His kiss wasn't as aggressive as I had anticipated. He kissed me deeply and cupped my face in his hand. I ran my hand up to his neck and intertwined my fingers into his hair at the nape of his neck, pulling him closer to me. A slight groan escaped his lips, and he pulled me into his lap, his hands wrapped around my waist. I felt myself getting lost in the moment. We were no longer hunter and prey. We were just two people. Heart hammering against my ribs, I pulled away, my lips red and slightly swollen. He took a few ragged, deep breaths and cleared his throat. Well... That was unexpected, he laughed. I smiled and traced his jaw with the tip of my finger, savoring the roughness of his stubble. He caught my hand and kissed the palm, causing my heart to stutter. I took in a sharp gasp of air. He threw me a knowing smile. I leaned down and kissed him again, softly pressing my lips against his. The sound of a glass bottle rolling against concrete drew me from him. Glancing up, I saw Punchy and Kiki approaching. Punchy raised an eyebrow, seeing me straddling the mark. I twisted my mouth in a wry smile and then widened my eyes in fear. Some guys are coming this way. They don't look very friendly, I whispered in Aiden's ear. His demeanor shifted instantly. In one swift movement, he had me off of his lap and behind him. He placed himself defensively in front of me. I had to appreciate his chivalry. Don't kill him. I mouthed to them. They each gave me a nearly imperceptible nod. Do you know these guys? I asked him, taking a few small steps backward, my bare feet digging into the sand. I should have put my fucking boots back on. I sighed, not looking forward to the possible arduous run along the beach. No, he said, not taking his eyes off of them as they advanced. Punchy was taking the lead as always. His dark skin glistened in the morning sun. I always forgot how intimidating these guys were. I saw them every day. To me, they were just guys. But to someone seeing them for the first time, well, they were pretty intimidating. Punchy was nearly seven feet tall, an all-hard corded muscle. I saw Aiden weigh his options. I noticed his eyes rove over the scene in front of us. Punchy and Kiki were less than ten feet away now. Selena, run, he screamed at me. I stood frozen, pretending to be in shock. His face resigned to a decision when I didn't move, and he turned back to face them. I really hoped Aiden would still be alive after this encounter. I needed to be the one to kill him to get my freedom. That, and he was a really good kisser. Chapter 7 Aiden my shout split the air as I knocked over a garbage can in front of the path of the two behemoth men bearing down on us. Selena, run. She just stood there, staring fearfully between me and the two enormous thugs. I cursed silently and decided I would have to try and draw them off. I saw a beer bottle lying on the ground, 
spilled out of the garbage can. Taking a short step, I punted it right into the face of the big, dark-skinned man in the lead. It spiraled through the air and caught him right between the eyes. He stumbled back, hand clasping his bleeding face as he laid into cussing the day I was born. His friend was almost on me then, launching a stiff snap kick that I only partially blocked with my elbow. The power in his limbs was incredible, sending a tingling numbness up the length of my entire arm. I tried to discern his fighting style while I retreated from his vicious assault. Lots of sweeping, flashy strikes. Taekwondo, most likely. Showy, and normally not the most effective martial art. But his extreme seven-foot height and blinding speed made it almost impossible to launch an attack of my own. I was on the defensive, moving back into the street as he bore down on me like a dog with a piece of meat. Worse, his fellow had recovered and now rejoined the fray. He kept blinking blood out of his eyes, but that wasn't enough of a boon to give me the slightest ease. The kicky guy's blows slowed just a bit, as no one could keep up that pace forever. I saw my opening and took it, sidestepping a kick aimed at my ribcage and slamming my knee into his groin. The man howled and I dropped levels, grabbing him around the ankles and standing up rapidly. Kicky guy wound up slamming hard on the concrete, but I couldn't celebrate or use my momentary advantage because his punch-happy friend was all over my ass. Damn, I hated fighting boxers, and this guy was clearly a pro. Past, present, or future. He tagged me with a solid jab to my chin, which had me seeing stars, so much that I just barely managed to avoid the combinations of hooks and crosses that followed. His friend had regained his feet, and if looks could kill, I'd have been a goner. I knew I couldn't take both of them at once. Shit, I had doubts about being able to take them one-on-one. -on -one. My only advantage was speed. They had everything else. Strength, reach, size. Size. They had to lug all those beach muscles around every time they moved. I hit upon an idea and turned on my heel to run. I heard their feet beating the pavement behind me. I couldn't risk a look backward, but I could tell one was gaining. When I raced around the cornerstone of an ancient mosque, I risked a glance and saw that Kiki Guy was nearly upon me. Those long-ass legs really ate up the terrain, so I couldn't just flat-out retreat. I was going to have to make this a running fight. I spied a full ashtray nearby, one of those types with the long neck and a hole at the top with the butts falling into a pit of water below. I grasped the stock and swung it like a baseball bat. Kiki was running so hard he couldn't stop. He threw his arms up to block my strike, catching the bulbous end on his meaty palms. But the water inside added impetus to my blow, knocking him off his feet for a second time. I turned and ran as his fellow rejoined the pursuit. Spying a bazaar, the stands abandoned and cloaked for the night. I ran in that direction. They followed me, all of us sweaty and panting in the moonlight. Where in the hell was a cop when you needed one? My cover identity would stand up to official scrutiny. I was certain. I rushed around a corner and slid beneath the canopy of a fruit stand. Peering through a tiny slit, I strove to control my breathing, though my heart beat so rapidly I feared they would hear that as well. Punchy guy came first, followed closely by Kiki. They slowed, looking about with their heads on a swivel. They couldn't hear my footfalls any longer, I realized. So they knew I was hiding somewhere near. I watched as they began uncloaking the stalls one by one, each taking an opposite end of the street. It would only be a matter of time until they found me. Perhaps I should have brought a weapon but it would have been hard to explain to the authorities what a race car driver was doing with one. There were limits to my cover identity. All right. They were panting, tired from the run. The longer I gave them to recover, the less of an advantage I had. I waited a moment longer until Kiki Guy's back was to me before leaping out of the stall and tackling him from behind. I wrapped an arm around his neck and squeezed, not trying to go for his trachea. It's far quicker to cut off the flow of blood to the brain by compressing the big arteries in the neck. Quicker, 
but not instant. Kiki went down to one knee, letting out a strangled groan, but Punchy was upon me. I took a nasty right to the temple and rolled with it across the ground. I stood up, doffing my blazer and changing my stance. Boxers have one disadvantage, in that they don't use their feet for attacking. Punchy moved in on me, and I dropped levels into a spinning foot sweep. He tried to jump over my striking limb, failed, and toppled to the ground. I was upon him in an instant, mounting his chest and pounding his face with repeated blows. But even though I hit him so hard, so many times my hands ached, he wouldn't quit. Even with a broken nose and a swollen shut eye, he continued to try and fend me off. Kiki had recovered at that point and came at me. I was forced to abandon the mount, rolling backward off of Punchy in a somersault and coming up to my feet. He snapped a leg out and managed to hook me behind my head and then used his leg to pull me toward him. I couldn't fully deflect his forearm smashing across my face. I flipped in the air, came down hard on my face, and then scrambled to crawl under another stall to escape his repeated stumps. One of my fingers popped out of the socket, blood welling behind the nail in a garish purple blotch. I was halfway under the canopy when one of them grabbed my leg. Unable to see who it was, I rolled over onto my back and kicked out at the grasping limb. Kiki grunted and pulled me out, scraping my back across the pavement and ripping my shirt. I landed a good one on his jaw, and he stumbled backward, holding his face. That gave me the time to regain my footing. I ripped my shirt off, what was left of it anyway, and knotted the shreds around my bleeding knuckles to shield them from further harm. Come on, tough guy. I taunted as Punchy regained his feet. The boxer stumbled a bit, swaying on his feet. He still had a lot of fight left, but was blind on his left side. Kiki seemed to realize his fellow was in worse shape and tried to engage me by himself. But he'd been running and fighting for quite a while as well, and his kicks were no longer as swift as they had been. I could see them coming. When he swept his big boot up for a roundhouse, I caught his thigh on my shoulder and pulled him backward into a stall. He crashed down hard, splintering wood and ripping canvas with his bulk. Punchy caught me hard in the ribs, and I fell to the pavement, coughing. For a few seconds I was helpless, gasping for air. But Punchy made a mistake. Instead of finishing me off, he went to help Kiki out of the ruined stall. That let me get to my feet again. I came in on Punchy's blind side and smacked him hard in the kidney. It was dirty, but that was the only way I fight. I continued the rabbit punches until he gave up on helping his friend and raised his arms to defend himself. His hands were better than my own, and I got clipped by a cross on the side of my head. I grabbed a four-foot-long stick, formerly the post holding up a canopy in a demolished stall, and spun it in a circle. Enough of this hand-to-hand -hand shit. Time to show them what a Joe staff could do. I held the staff horizontally across my body. Punchy came in and grabbed the staff in a two-handed grip, just like I wanted him to. I lifted my wrists, put him off balance, and used the staff to add leverage for a shoulder throw. Punchy slammed down hard on the pavement, and I spun the staff into a hard strike to his groin. His good eye bulged out, and his hands clapped to his crotch. As Punchy rolled onto his belly and struggled to recover, Kiki rejoined the melee. He didn't try to grab my staff, attacking with his mighty legs instead. I raised the staff diagonal across my torso and caught his shin with it. Kiki howled in pain, stumbling back and grasping his injured limb. Stings like a bitch, am I right? I asked. I put the staff into a bit of a showy display, intending to intimidate Come on, I'm right here. Nothing between us but six feet and opportunity. He grinned, and I grew instantly wary. I risked a glance over my shoulder to find two strangers were approaching. Jesus Christ, where did they find these guys? Two more seven-footers, one of them armed with a... Was that a fucking machete? The other had a length of thick chain which he set to spinning around chain guy smiled, showing off the rotting remnants of his teeth. Ugh, nasty. 
I could smell his breath from a dozen feet away. I looked about for a possible escape, but found none. The four men closed in on me, and I kept the staff moving in a blur just to keep them at bay. The sound of wood on chain echoed in the alley as I blocked a blow from Nasty. His chain wrapped around my staff, and I yanked it out of his grasp with my superior leverage. I sent the chain flying into Kiki's face. He screamed and fell over, groaning and bleeding from the mouth, but he still didn't quit. I wondered if these guys were Terminators or something. One thing was certain. If I was going to win, it would take a lot more than just skill or training. It was going to take more than a little luck. Chapter 8 Selena Mired in confusion, I stood on the empty street splashed by the hazy yellow moonlight. Aiden had disappeared, but I could still hear his feet beating the pavement in flight. I knew the two attackers quite well, in fact. The big African-American man was Mike Balrog, a former heavyweight boxing champion whose career self-destructed from taking a dive. His companion went by Sage, and I never learned his first name. He was more of an enigma, but was well-trained in martial arts, particularly Mai Tai and Taekwondo. And in fact, he and I used to spar when they were part of my backup crew, the Seven. If they were in Casablanca, it could only mean that Moira no longer trusted me enough to do the job on my own. This filled me with anger and miffed my professional pride. How dare she stomp all over my work? Of course, this was all tempered by the knowledge that I was already having second thoughts about killing Aiden. Something that hadn't happened to me since the first time I took on a client for my father. Aiden proved himself to be far more than the happy-go-lucky party boy I'd been expecting. While I knew he was a famous player with a grocery list of former lovers, I couldn't help but feel his interest and compassion for me were genuine. I set my jaw hard and forced those thoughts away. I was a professional. Aiden was my client. If anyone was going to kill him, it would be me. I dug into my purse and withdrew my diamondback DB9, a compact pistol, which was both small enough to conceal and packed a decent punch. It didn't have a safety, but the zero energy firing system made the trigger do all the work. It required a nine pound pull, but I trained my trigger finger to handle much worse. Slipping off my shoes, I dashed barefoot after the trio of men, following the sound of their footfalls. No police. Actually, no one on the street at all. Myra. She must have pulled strings and told the authorities to take a powder for the night. They had gotten far ahead of me at that point, and I stopped at a cross street, sweeping my gaze about. They disappeared. I strained my ears, listening intently, but all I could hear was the yowl of a cat in heat and the buzz of the transformer overhead. I padded down the street, guessing that Aiden would try to make for his hotel. As I passed beyond the sphere of influence of the buzzing transformer, I heard a rustling, almost like a flag or banner snapping in a stiff breeze. Cautious, creeping, I walked toe to heel down the pavement, feeling the rough texture beneath my toes. Fortunately, I'd built up pretty heavy calluses on my soles by that point. Sob, one of the seven, had once declared my feet to be rather ugly for a chick. But he was a creep anyway, and his opinion didn't matter. I crept up to the edge of the alley and peered around the cornerstone of a Starbucks. <sighs> Even there, in a city rich with history... America had to spread its logo feces all over the landscape. My eyes widened when I saw a street bazaar, the stalls dark and shrouded for the night. As I watched, Bell Rock and Sauge flipped up the canopies one by one. Were they searching for Aiden? They had to be. The gun seemed excessively heavy in my hand, and it was all I could do to hold on to it, let alone raise the barrel and take aim. 
Well, I'd intended to make certain I was the one to finish Aiden off. I found that my muscles wouldn't move. My body seemed frozen. And I stood transfixed watching the two massive men move toward each other from opposite ends of the street. A flash of movement caught my eye. I turned my head to spy Aiden scurry out from under a stall and tackle Sajay from behind. He slapped on a picture-perfect Hadaka Jime, a judo chokehold that can render an average man unconscious in seconds. I was able to raise the gun at last, but couldn't risk a shot without hitting Sajay. He was sort of a friend, though certainly not a close one. Besides, Moira would probably frown upon damaging the big man. Belrock rejoined the fray, smacking Aiden so hard I could almost feel the bone-on-bone -bone impact. My free hand flew over my mouth as I looked on in horror. While Aiden was not a small man by any measure, he seemed a dwarf compared to the massive, burly assassins. To my surprise, and unexpected delight, Aiden armed himself with a short staff. He used it well, applying leverage for a shoulder throw and then cracking Sajay a good one between the legs. I knew it was wrong, and maybe I couldn't even admit it to myself at the time, but I was rooting for Aiden to escape. My heart sank when Sop and Hadern arrived. Sop was a disgusting bastard who thought brushing teeth was a scam by the dental industry. Not the most subtle of fighters, but an effective one. Hydern stood seven feet tall and relied upon a machete, and he was damn good with it. The Aryan man was allegedly the child of Nazis who had fled to Brazil after World War II, but I never learned if the rumors were true. I did know he got along just fine with Belrock, for whatever that was worth. Aiden became hard-pressed to fend all four men off, but he gave them hell. My begrudging admiration for him increased tenfold. He wasn't being an idiot. He fought defensively and used their numbers against them. The four men had to be wary or they'd strike each other, whereas Aiden could swing in any direction and make contact with an enemy. But they'd hemmed him in against a wall, closing in like a pack of wolves. With no room to maneuver, Aiden had no chance. I lifted the gun. This is it, I thought. If I don't take my shot now, I'll miss my chance. I lifted the diamond bag and aimed down the sights. Handguns were notoriously inaccurate at a distance, but I was a crack shot. I knew I could hit what I aimed at. Shoot twice, I told myself. Make sure. Double tap his dome. He's just a man, after all. No different than any other. But Aiden was different. I could see it even then, after only spending a few hours in his company. I aimed. I fired. I even had the discipline to do so twice, but my shots went to either side of Aiden's head rather than pulping it into a red mash. The gunfire caused all five combatants to die for cover. Aiden recovered his senses first and dashed out of the alley past them into the wide street. The four assassins took up the chase immediately, with only Sajay pausing long enough to look about with his one good eye in an effort to locate the shooter, i.e. me. I stepped out into his view and waved. Go on, I shouted. Don't let him escape. Sajay spun on his heel and took off like a bat out of hell. Those long legs really ate up the miles, and he soon passed the other three and swept up behind Aiden. I was beating feet as well, hampered a bit by being barefoot. We ran through the streets, six phantoms in the night. Aiden was making for his hotel. Once he crossed the threshold into the lobby, he would be safe. Even crazy bastards like Sop wouldn't dare expose themselves by going after him then. After all, he wasn't reckless like Aiden who had murdered a man in broad daylight with 10,000 witnesses. Aiden was a bold one, but he'd been restrained, even gentle when we spoke. My chest fluttered, and not just from exertion. I remember hating myself for feeling the attraction, but resolving to finish him off anyway. 
professional pride, freedom from my wicked stepmother, a chance to live my own life. And all I had to do to earn it was end the life of one privileged assassin. Fair trade. Or so I believed at the time. Aiden made the error of running into a cul-de-sac, flanked on all sides by sheer historically protected but largely unlivable buildings. He paused at the top of a short flight of steps, leading to the double doors of the largest one, and swung his staff in an arc, catching Sajay in the temple on his blind side. The big man crumpled into a groaning heap, but the others set upon him with a frenzied rush. For a moment, Aiden disappeared behind the bulk of the assassins. I feared the worst. But then I saw Belrock take a shot to his groin and fall backward down the cracked and battered concrete steps. Hydern swept his machete in a downward arc, severing Aiden's staff in twain. Aiden didn't hesitate for a moment. He used both ends like escrima staves. Aiden beat a rapid tattoo on Hadern's knees and ankles, targeting the big man's joints. Hadern collapsed to one knee, and Aiden smacked him with both staves atop his blonde head. Hadern fell onto his face, his machete falling from nerveless fingers. But Sop rushed up behind Aiden and wrapped his chain around the main scion's throat. I gasped, the gun trembling in my hand as Sop planted his knee in Aiden's back and dragged back for all he was worth. Aiden's feet came off the ground, kicking wildly. His hands were between the chain and his neck, but it was only a matter of time before he suffocated anyway. Sop's toothless sneer made him even uglier, the tendons in his arms standing out in stark relief to his otherwise flabby body. I knew Aiden was done for. He couldn't get the necessary leverage to break free. I couldn't shoot Aiden. And not just because I didn't want to hit Sop by mistake. I simply couldn't curl my finger around the trigger. Aiden let out a gurgle, his kicking feet slowing in the air. Not much longer now. All I had to do was sit back and wait while Nasty Sop finished business. All I had to do was watch. I felt the bad decision moving my limbs before I was even consciously aware I had made it. I lifted the gun, but did not aim for either man. Rather, I took aim on the padlock chaining the double doors to Aiden's would-be sanctuary shut. A spark flashed in the night, and Sop was distracted for the briefest of moments, long enough for Aiden to get his foot against the double doors and kick off mightily. Both men spilled over backward down the steps, with Aiden crashing hard onto Sop's midsection. Sop's cheeks puffed out, and he groaned in misery. Aiden scrambled to his feet and scampered up the stairs quicker than a hiccup. It really was something. Poetry in motion. A jungle cat in a man's body. He ripped the now slack chains away and plunged into the dark building. I ran past the groaning heaps of my erstwhile allies, stopping long enough to growl. Quit fucking around. He's getting away. Then I headed into the building after Aiden. The interior was nigh pitch black, so I flicked the flashlight function of my phone into working mode. I swept the beam about and saw no sign of Aiden. I did find clues as to his passage. A broken window at the end of the corridor. The night breeze stirring the stained translucent curtains. I rushed to the window and found it looked upon the street Aiden's hotel sat upon. To my immense relief, he disappeared into the lobby. As soon as the adrenaline left my body, I sagged against the wall. Not from exhaustion, but rather internal conflict. What had I done? I asked myself silently, over and over. What had I done? Chapter 9 Aiden Good evening, I said to the confused hotel clerk as I strolled through the lobby in my torn, blood-stained finery. The smile I plastered onto my face belied the myriad pains covering my body. But I'm a main, 
and mains don't show weakness. At least not to others. I was grateful when I entered the elevator lift and found myself alone. Only my own infinite reflections on the mirrored walls could see the way I leaned heavily against the safety rail. I'd been in tight spots, had some close calls before, but being assaulted by four behemoth men, all of them skilled combatants, might have been the worst. But I'd stayed alive, somehow. Those men were professional muscle, I'm certain of it. Not skilled specialists like me, though. Definitely on the thuggery level of underworld employment. Still, they'd nearly gotten the better of me. Only blind luck and an unseen assailant's errant shots had kept me from heaven's gates, or hell's gates, given my line of work. The funny thing was, I'd been close to death a hundred times before, and it never bothered me so much. I couldn't puzzle it out. I did know those jerks had ruined a perfectly good date with a woman I found utterly compelling. Yes, Selena was beautiful, but it went beyond her good looks. Something about her, a sort of world-weary sadness, spurred me to try and improve her mood. Without much success, admittedly. I knew Selena was hiding something from me, but who wasn't in this day and age? At the time... I had no reason to think she was anything other than what she said she was. A lounge singer, performing at a tourist trap dive bar with overpriced, watered-down drinks. The door slid open, and I forced myself erect and walked without limping or groaning all the way down the hall to my suite. I was rather proud of myself. But as soon as that door closed behind me, my posture sagged, and I dragged myself over to the nearest seat an ottoman with burnished leather upholstery. I'd lost my phone in the melee, but I had several burners I kept just for such an occurrence. I activated the phone with my credit card and dialed up an old acquaintance. And I do mean old in every sense of the word. Who is this? came the velvet-smooth, seasoned voice on the other line. It's Aiden, Mr. Starkey, I replied, trying and failing to keep the weariness out of my voice. Aiden? I heard the sound of a pin scratching across paper. Bide a moment, please. His voice became distant, as if he were moving the phone away from his mouth to speak to someone else in the room. Make sure Miss Bell sees this as soon as possible, he said. Then his voice returned to normal volume. What can I do for you, Aiden? You sound a bit under the weather. Well... I've always had an allergic reaction to four gigantic men trying to beat me to death, I replied flippantly. Oh my, Starkey cleared his throat. Are you in danger now? No more than usual, I said. I managed to give them the slip, as well as a few wapnots, but I'm more than a little bit curious as to who they were, and more importantly, who they were working for. Perhaps they are in the employ of your client, he asked. I don't think Mr. Epperer knows I'm going to be working on him yet, I replied. But I could be wrong. I don't want to make suppositions that could obfuscate the issue. Can you help me identify them? I'll do my best, he replied genially. I've come to expect nothing less, Mr. Starkey. First man, big African-American, Brooklyn accent, trained boxer and like six foot ten. There can't be too many fellows such as he running around. Starkey said, scribbling on a piece of paper. And the next? A seven-footer, on the thin side, eye patch, scar on his chest. Asian descent, trained in Muay Thai. Interesting. These two men assaulted you? Along with two others, yes. Man number three has a mouthful of rotting teeth and a beer belly. Caucasian, not trained, but a capable street fighter. Favors a chain. More scribbling, then. And the final attacker? A guy with a freaking machete, I said. To be honest, I didn't get a good look at his face because I was watching the blade he tried to make me several inches shorter with. Caucasian, I think, and probably in his forties. Check, Aiden, he said. I'll put it into the pipeline and see what comes back. Can I reach you at this number? Yes, it... no, I said... Better call the hotel directly instead. I've already lost one phone on this job. Very well, Aiden. Take care. Do you need a visit from the doctor? 
He is in your area. I know. I made certain he would be. But I don't need him. Not yet. Just some bumps and bruises. Then I suggest you get some sleep, he said. I'd love to, but I can't, I replied. I have to go and do some legwork on my client. Take care, Mr. Starkey, and thanks. Don't mention it, Aiden. The call ended, and I lay back on the ottoman and let out a long sigh, deflating over it like a limp balloon. I spent some time just staring at the ceiling, trying to strategize on my target, but largely failing because I couldn't stop thinking of Selena. Eventually, I gave up and stripped for the shower. I had a few dark spots, but nothing too major. I popped some Tylenol and hopped in the shower for what was supposed to be a quick rinse. But when the hot water hit my sore muscles, I wound up remaining under the powerful jets for nearly half an hour. Again, I thought relentlessly of Selena. So much so, I caught myself with my hand around my cock. What am I, thirteen? I grumbled, letting go of myself. I toweled off and plopped down naked on a chair parked near the window that looked out over the Atlantic. The blue waves crawled toward shore, smacking the sea wall and sending frothy remnants spilling over the top. Casablanca had proven to be a lot more hostile than the brochure would have indicated. Eventually, I gave up on my wave watching and stiffly rose to my feet. I dressed in a pair of designer jeans, which were made of a flexible synthetic blend so as not to bind up my legs. I might need them for kicking ass if the four freaks showed their ugly faces again. I paired this with a shirt featuring some Europop starlet I'd never heard of. The whole point was to blend in and look like a college student or young professional on vacation. Anyone worth being afraid of would see right through it, of course, but it might make me less visible to the authorities. Once I'd clad myself appropriately, I headed back out into the hot Moroccan sun. I quickly donned a pair of shades, my sleepless eyes complaining of the stinging sun almost immediately. Then I did my best to meander, not hurry, to the French ring of construction which formed a sort of belt about the city's midsection. I knew Giscard Emperor's address and intended just to walk by without being too obvious that I was scoping the place out. The pedestrians I encountered here were a mix of hijab-clad Muslims and more Western-centric professionals. I was glad no one seemed to pay me any special attention. So far, so good. The last thing an assassin wanted to do was stick out. Like the Japanese say, the nail that sticks out gets hit. I came around the corner of an older block with elegant but small by modern standards housing. Emperor's Manor squatted on the end of the block, a dull gray structure completely at odds with his vast, ill-gotten fortune. I was pleased to find that the walls surrounding his property were easily scalable. I was not so pleased to discover no one was home. Not that Emperor had gone out for the day. I meant the house was vacant, bereft of even furniture. Damn it. He'd moved. Was he still even in the city? Cursing Lucian for making me return to New York and thus wasting my opportunity... I headed down to the coast and visited a hole-in-the-wall tavern that catered mostly to locals and not tourists. As soon as I entered the door, the swarthy faces turned my way, bore expressions of disgust or even anger. White men are not normally welcome in such an establishment. I removed my shades and stared them all down one by one. I'd mastered the art of intimidation, mostly because it meant I had to waste less time fighting. I didn't like committing violence I wasn't being paid to perform. It's uncouth. I headed up to the bar and slapped a hundred dollar bill on its battered, stained surface. I'm here to see Mohinder, I said. Who the fuck are you? The gap-toothed barkeep asked. Tell him it's Aiden. He snorted, made the C-note disappear into his meaty palm, and vanished through a beaded curtain into the rear of the tavern. I waited patiently picking out a fingernail that had been cracked during last night's melee. In short order, the barkeep reappeared, thrusting his head through the curtain. Come, he said stiffly and vanished again. I rose from my stool and headed behind the bar, pushing aside the curtain amid a series of clicks as the beads ricocheted off each other in the doorframe. I followed the barkeep up a flight of steps and wound up in a cramped, musty-smelling office of sorts, 
the shelves jam-packed with more books than they could hold. I walked around a stack of hardbound volumes written in Arabic, and smiled when I met Mohinder's gaze. Aiden, he said cheerfully. Mohinder was a slight man, not more than a hundred pounds soaking wet, five foot nothing, but his dark eyes had a certain intensity that filled the entire room. If Mohinder wanted my bar stool, I'd probably give it to him. To what do I owe the pleasure? No pleasure, I said sadly. Just business. The barkeep cleared books off of a wooden chair and dusted it off with his hairy hand. I sat down carefully so as not to reveal my injuries. Mains don't show weakness. How can I assist the firm today? Mohinder asked. I just need some info, I replied. Giscard Epperer seems to have moved, as I'd like to catch up with him as quickly as possible. I was hoping you might reveal his new address. I might be able to do that, Mohinder said with a grin, displaying a gold tooth. But it will take time. How much time? I can have the information for you in two days. I would appreciate it much sooner, I said, taking a $500 bill out of my wallet and putting it on the desk. Mohinder arched an eyebrow at it, and then slid it back across his desk toward me. Keep your money, Aiden. I'll get it to you by tomorrow, and that's the soonest I can manage. Just do me a favor and inform your uncle that I was most helpful in this regard. Consider it done, I replied, standing up, though I left the bill where it was. That's my line, Mohinder said with a chuckle. Good hunting, Aiden. Thanks. I turned on my heel to leave. What was I going to do for 24 hours? First, some sleep. And then, another trip to the Blues Lounge. Hopefully Selena would be there. We had unfinished business. And business was about to pick up. Chapter 10 Selena Lying on the sofa bed in my dressing room at the lounge, Sending puffs of white vapor toward the stained and sagging ceiling, I played through the night's events in my mind over and over. I was trying to figure out just why I hadn't taken the shot on Aiden when I could have, and not liking the answers I gave myself. In my globetrotting profession, I'd met many men. I'd slept with more than a few, and I wasn't ashamed of doing so. I'd seen them all. Rich playboys, young trust fund babies... Hard-eyed, hard-edged men with a velvet touch. Sometimes it was fun. Other times it was business. But I never let myself get emotionally involved. Never. Aiden was a ghost. Somehow able to phase through the walls I'd built up around my heart for many years. I directed those defenses before my father died. And reinforced them when he passed. I'd like to think I'm as unassailable as the walls of Jericho barring divine intervention. Yet, he disarmed me with unexpected depth and vulnerability. When he spoke of the struggles of living up to a family legacy, his words rang with the tambour of truth. Even if he hadn't admitted what he did for a living, his emotion and his pain had been genuine. I knew exactly how he felt, striving to live up to my father's legacy. My father never wanted me to do work. Not in the least. My training in hand-to-hand -hand combat, firearms, and tactics had been meant to make me a less attractive target for kidnappings or leverage to manipulate him. But I'd pleaded and pleaded to be allowed to tag along with Deuce Fratkin, my father's number one cleaner at the time. Fratkin had been a quiet but effective teacher and recommended me for further training. One thing led to another... And when Fratkin took a bullet to the brain and wound up permanently damaged, I became the top cleaner. This continued on even after my father died, and I went to work for Moira instead. I didn't take pleasure in the actual killing, but I did pride myself on my work up until the point I pulled the trigger or dropped the blade. That hadn't changed. And when I'd done my research on Aiden, I believed he would be just another notch on my belt so to speak. How was I supposed to know I would feel such a powerful, profound connection with him? I'd been playing a role, of course, but like any good actor, my performance was rooted in experience, 
and my attraction to him had been murky. I couldn't decide how much of it was a performance and how much I actually felt. Looking objectively at the evidence, namely my inability to pull the trigger and end his young life on the streets of Casablanca, I decided my attraction was real, genuine, and problematic. Lying there, puffing on my vape and staring at the water-stained ceiling, I tried to remind myself that Aiden was no angel in white. Far from it, in fact. he killed nearly as many people as I had. Possibly more if I hadn't gleaned his full track record. Plus, he was a main. A last name synonymous with devil in many parts of the underworld community. If our positions had been reversed, if he had me in his crosshairs, would he have been able to pull the trigger? Would he have felt the same doubts, the same connection I did? Or would he have shot me without a moment's hesitation? There was no way to know, and I was torturing myself with what might have been and what might yet become. Fortunately, it was time for my final set of the evening, which provided a nice distraction. I was halfway through House of the Rising Sun, the original, and not that god-awful animals remake, when Aiden strutted in the front door. My voice nearly broke on the chorus when our eyes met. He seemed to be in reasonably good shape. Most people probably wouldn't have been able to tell he'd even been hurt. I'm not most people, however. Subtle clues, like the way he favored his right leg slightly, and the micro wince when he settled into a chair, gave me the gist of his injuries. He had not escaped unscathed after all. Once my set was over, I pushed through the gaudy reflective tassel curtain, my chest heaving from more than just my set. I paused in front of my dressing room mirror, staring at the woman reflected back at me. Her sleeveless, tight red gown seemed far more exposing than it had before Aiden walked in. Her painted lips parted slightly, letting out breathy pants that had little to do with exhaustion. I was not surprised when a gentle knock came at my door. Who is it? I asked, as if I didn't already know. Aiden pushed into the room, a smile flashing over his face. Aiden, I said, going over to him. Was I playing a role, or did I really want to embrace him so badly I couldn't resist? All I knew was I felt good being held in his strong arms. I'm glad you're all right. After those thugs separated us, I feared the worst. Just a couple of nobodies. He lied, but he did a good job of it. I gave them the slip, but I couldn't find you afterward. I ran back to the club to call the police, but I never heard anything back from them. I pulled away from him because his body felt a little too good against my own. What are you doing here? He seemed taken aback by the question, as if the answer should be obvious. I wanted to see you again, he said, apparently astonished by what came out of his own mouth. I thought, perhaps, he was telling the truth, or at least thought he was. We never finished our walk. The streets are dangerous tonight, I said running my eyes up and down his tapered form. Aiden looked good in spite of his brawl. Or perhaps he seemed even more attractive because of his ability to dispense mayhem. I devoured him with my gaze, a fact that was not lost upon him. Is that so? He asked softly. Then perhaps we should remain indoors, where it's safe. I laughed softly. But are you safe? Am I safe with you? In response, he moved in close and grasped me, one hand on the small of my back and the other behind my head. I didn't resist when he moved in and gently kissed me on the mouth. My eyes fluttered closed, and when he tried to pull away, I took his face in my hands and held him still. Our kiss deepened, growing more intimate. The taste of bourbon on his breath was faint but noticeable. Not drunk but a little bit buzzed, I believed. His tongue slid inside my mouth, lashing against my own. Aiden pulled his mouth away from my own and kissed my shoulder, eliciting a sigh from my lips. His hands roamed over my body, 
caressing my spine in a long stroke before firmly grasping my bottom. I could feel his growing arousal pressing against my body, his eager member hungry for delight. I found myself in a similar fix. Suddenly, I didn't care that I was supposed to kill him. No longer troubled by my trepidation, I gave myself over fully to him. Aiden backed me up, his mouth mauling my neck until my bottom touched the battered mahogany vanity. I want you, he whispered in my ear. I moaned louder than I intended. As much of an invitation as he needed. Aiden's hand slid along my thigh, exposed through the slit of the gown I wore. I shuddered at his touch. Goose pimples rising along my flesh as he ran his hands up to my waist. With a surge, he lifted my feet off the floor and seated me carefully, but firmly, on the vanity. I gazed at him through half-lidded eyes as he slowly knelt on the floor in front of me. His gaze flashed to mine for a moment before he mashed his face into my breasts. Aiden's lips felt warm and wonderful leaving butterfly kisses on my pliant flesh before he moved inexorably downward. Where is he going? I wondered. Aiden looked up at me pointedly, while his hands slid under my skirt, up my thighs to the waistband of my panties. I arched my spine, lifting my bottom off the vanity to facilitate their removal. Aiden dragged them off my body and then held them carefully to his nose and inhaled deeply. His pupils dilated, gaze growing with the intensity of an aroused male. My heart pounded, a rapid tattoo that seemed to grow all the more powerful until it was all I could hear. Aiden tossed the panties over his shoulder, finished with the appetizer. He was then ready for the main course. I gasped as he pushed my thighs apart and gazed longingly at the musky cradle therein. His gaze lifted to meet my own for a moment, and then he closed his eyes and tenderly kissed the inside of my thigh. I gasped, my hands clenching onto the edge of the vanity as I threw my head back to see the stained ceiling again. Aiden left a trail of kisses up my inner thigh, growing inexorably closer to my pussy. I parted my legs wider, thrusting my pelvis lewdly in anticipation of feeling his lips caress on my nether region. But then he teasingly switched to kissing my opposite leg. I groaned with need, hands going to the back of his head in a vain attempt to push his face between my legs. Aiden grasped my wrists and forced them off his scalp and back to the vanity. He lifted his gaze to me and spoke in a throaty whisper. Be a good girl, Selena. I shuddered, a deep pang throbbing through my groin and passing throughout my body. Aiden went back to kissing my thighs, getting within a centimeter of my labia before moving over to the other side. It's so mean, I gasped, luxuriating in his dominance. Aiden's sharp teeth nibbled slightly on my skin. Not enough to hurt, but sufficient that I felt the pressure. Then he plunged his face into my pussy, lips masticating and tongue seeking out every sensitive spot. I cried out when he took one of my outer labia in his lips and sucked with increasing pressure. My hands curled into claws on the vanity, yearning to touch him, but I didn't dare. His mouth felt so good between my legs, I didn't wish to do anything to make him stop. Aiden lifted his face for a moment panting hard, his face glistening with sweat mingled with my own juices. Your pussy tastes so good, Selena, he said in a husky tone. I cried out, wide open and sloppy wet under his touch. Aiden's tongue slid through my pink gash, causing my abdomen to clench. He ran the tip in slow circles around my clitoral mound never quite touching it, but circling ever closer like a shark hunting prey. Just when I thought I couldn't stand his teasing for another moment, he lashed the tip of his tongue against my swollen clit. I shrieked, my body shivering with ecstasy. A spurt of fluid shot out from my wide open snatch to deluge Aiden, but he didn't seem to mind. If anything, it spurred him on to more enthusiastic licking. 
A bottle of nail polish rolled off the jostling vanity and hit the floor, breaking with a crisp snap. Red fluid spilled out onto the dingy dressing room tiles, forming an abstract pattern I was only dimly aware of as I came down from my climax. Aiden stood up, wiping his mouth with the back of his sleeve. Then he reached out and took me by the back of my head, fingers tangling into my hair. Your turn, he commanded. I nearly came again just hearing him say it. Yes, Ian, I replied in a whisper. I was going to be a good girl for him, at least for tonight. Chapter 11 Aiden Selena's skin glistened with sweat as she slid off the vanity and onto unsteady legs. I guided her away from the mirrored vanity with a handful of her lustrous ebony hair, moving her several steps away. Then I applied pressure downward until her legs bent into a kneel. I watched as she descended to the floor, her eyes still swimming with ecstasy. My fingers knotted into her hair, made a convenient handle to thrust her face into my crotch. Selena gasped, but didn't resist as I rubbed her face all over the growing bulge in my jeans. Feel that? I asked in a rough voice. That's what you've done to me. What are you going to do about it? In response, she reached up and picked at my belt with shaking fingers until she released the clasp. Selena flung the leather ends aside with a jingle of metal. Her hands stroked across my crotch and up to the button fly which she undid one by one with agonizing slowness. She pulled and tugged until my cock sprang free of my underwear, throbbing hard and dripping a thick, creamy dollop of pre-cum. Selena stared at it as if in wonder, her eyes wide and shining. Selena opened her mouth and ran her tongue over the crown, lapping up the bit of pearlescent goo. I tugged my jeans down to my thighs so she could have easier access and she used that access with great aplomb. Selena ran her tongue from the base of my balls to the tip of my rod with one long lick, mashing her face into my shaft and seeming to exult in the sensation. Any thoughts of the men who assaulted me, or Giscard Epperer, drifted away on a golden cloud of ecstasy. Selena eagerly licked my rod until it grew shiny with her saliva, stemming me to new levels of hardness, it felt amazing, but even more so, I enjoyed the sound she made. Little coos and sighs, as if she were devouring the most delicious lollipop in the world, one lick at a time. Put your mouth around it, I said in a strained voice. I was on the verge of shooting sticky seed into her face already. Selena looked up at me with those ice blue eyes, and then opened her mouth to take my entire crown inside. I groaned, my hand tightening on her hair as she applied vigorous and expert suction. Her lips massaged my flesh, and her tongue played about, until she ran it through the slit at the end of my cock. Growling, I pushed her head onto me, forcing her to take my full length. Selena swallowed my rod, gurgling as the spongy head smashed into the back of her throat. Still, she didn't come off of me but continued to try and fit as much of it inside of her as possible. I used my handhold to force Selena to pump up and down on my member, enjoying the slick glide of her lips over my sensitive skin. Selena choked, came off of my rod for just a moment and gasped for air. But when I went to guide her back onto my cock, she eagerly opened her lips and took even more of me than she had before. I was overcome, figuratively and literally, releasing a hot load of spunk into her mouth and down her throat. Selena choked and gagged, but kept my crown inside her mouth as I continued to squirt my seed inside of her. She pulled off of me with a gasp, panting as she looked up to my eyes for approval. I smiled back, happy to let her know she'd done a fine job. You've made a mess, I said as cum dripped from my member. Clean it up. Selena bit her lower lip, eyeing me through a half-lidded gaze, and then extended her tongue and licked the sticky seed from my flesh. She moved all over my rod, gleaning every dollop of white she could find. Soon my cock gleamed with her saliva, 
Not a trace of stringy secretions left behind by her talented and predatory tongue. Was I a good girl, Aiden? She asked in a husky voice. I stared down into her dewy, azure eyes and realized I could just plunge into their depths and drown in ecstatic oblivion. If she'd asked me to cut off my right testicle and hand it to her in a doggy bag at that moment, I'd have seriously considered it. Yes, I said in a voice barely above a whisper. You were a very good girl. Do I get a reward? She asked eagerly, a goddess on her knees with snow-white flesh and hair as black as midnight. Of course, I said, unsure of where she was going, but certain I would like the destination. Fuck me, she hissed through gritted teeth. Fuck me hard, Aiden. Her wish was my command. I grabbed hold of her hair and dragged Selena to her feet. She quickly rose, more from eagerness than to avoid pain. I turned her about to face away from me and marched her by the hair over to the vanity. Our panting and sweat-glistened reflections heaved together. I thought we made a cute couple. A cute, dirty couple. Put your hands on the desk, I said. Yes, I know it wasn't a desk, but a vanity. But all the blood in my body was rushing somewhere other than my brain. Anyway, Selena got the gist. She placed her palms on the vanity and thrust her ass out, grinding it into my swollen member. The soft, satiny sheen of her dress felt good on my rod, but I knew her pussy would feel even better. I knelt down behind her and took the bottom hem of her ankle-length skirt. Carefully, I hiked it up to expose her naked rear, perfectly round and just the right mix of softness and steel. I couldn't resist kissing her buttock and then sinking my teeth in hard enough to leave indentations behind. Selena gasped, her body shaking like the surface of a pond disturbed by a tossed stone. Selena moaned when I spread her ass cheeks out wide and exposed her gash and her dark star. I ran a finger down her crack, tracing a circle around her anus before moving further down to her hot pink gash. Selena let out a sharp cry when I thrust my index and middle fingers inside of her leaking hole. I slid my fingers in deep and then widened them apart stretching out her dirty pussy and preparing it for the main event. Oh, God, she groaned through gritted teeth. Do it, Aiden. Do what? I teased, still tormenting her with strokes and swirls of my embedded fingers. My digits were slick and warm from her hungry pink tunnel. Put it in me, she gasped. Not good enough, I murmured into her sumptuous ass, nibbling again on her cheek. Tell me what you want me to do. Selena let out a long, undulating wail. Panting, she lowered her head, concealing her reflection behind a mantle of ebony hair. Fuck me, she said. Give me your cock. I will, but you'll have to beg first. Her fingers clutched the edge of the vanity, a deep, throaty moan escaping her lips. What did you say? She asked in a quivering voice. I grinned, knowing full well she had heard me the first time. Selena just wanted to hear me say it again. Beg for my cock, you dirty little slut, I hissed. Oh, God. Please, Aiden. I cut her off with a firm slap to her bottom, making it dance about in a most pleasing way. As the red mark on her skin faded, I spoke again. No, I said, not like that. Lift your head. Look at yourself in the mirror. She raised her gaze, whimpering when she beheld her wanton reflection. I grinned ear to ear with genuine pleasure. Now beg me. Please, Aiden, she gasped in a voice barely above a whisper. Please stuff me full of your hard cock. What was that? I asked. Louder. Selena's chest heaved as she sucked in a great breath of air. Then she let it out with a near scream. Please, Aiden, fuck me hard. Please. Good girl, I said, rising to loom behind her reflection. I spread my feet wide for stability and gripped my shaft, guiding my rod between her wide open, dripping wet pussy lips. Selena cried out as I glided inside, 
her voice sharp enough to ring my ears. There was a moment when I entered her fully, the head of my cock pressing into her cervix, where she let out a tight gasp of pain. But it faded quickly, and she sighed as if in long-awaited relief. I grabbed her hips, nodding up my fingers in her silken gown, and drove into her with a powerful thrust of my hips. Both of us cried out at the sensation. Her pussy fit my cock like a velvet glove intended solely for that purpose. Your pussy is so sweet and tight, I said. Selena moaned, dropping her head between her shoulders and masking her face with her hair once more. But I wanted to see her face while I fucked her from behind. I reached between her shoulders and grabbed a handful of her lustrous midnight mane. Selena moaned as I drew her head back hard, forcing her to see herself in the mirror and giving myself a convenient handle. Unable to hold myself back any longer, I slapped my pelvis into her ass with a series of hard thrusts. Her talented little cunny squeezed around my shaft, making each withdrawal a battle not to pop off my seed too early. I wanted this ravishment to last as long as possible, and I certainly wanted to make her come again. Selena was so beautiful when she came. I resolved to make her do so as much as was humanly possible. Holding fast to her hair, I murdered her pussy with jackhammer thrusts, going harder and deeper than I ever had before. She cried out, letting her feelings be known to me. Oh God, yes, 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 yes. Selena ground her ass into me striving to stuff me as far into her greedy snatch as she could possibly get me. I responded in kind, the air filled with the sound of our bodies slapping against one another. I blinked sweat out of my eyes, focusing my gaze on her lovely face in the mirror. My knuckles had turned white where they knotted in her hair. Selena's cunny clamped down on me tightly as a vice, as she let out a scream so piercing I feared it would break the mirror. Certainly any of the cleanup crew out in the lobby had to have heard it. I finally allowed myself to release, filling her with my hot, sticky seed. I released her hair at last so I could grasp her hips with both hands. I feared if I did not, I would keel over backward, which would result in taking my cock out of her. And that, I did not want. If I could, I would have remained inside of her forever. But my hamstrings were aching, and I'm sure she was in a similar predicament. Reluctantly, I pulled my rod out of her with a wet, lewd sound. I did lose my footing, falling back onto my rump and pulling her onto my lap in the process. We both laughed as we collapsed onto the floor, before she arched her body against me and sighed like a contented lap cat. We remained that way for a time, until my burner cell vibrated in my pocket. Starkey was calling. I made a graceful exit promising to see her again the next night. We lingered at the door for what seemed a long time, holding each other, kissing, and just enjoying the feel of our bodies pressed together. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I was prepared to enjoy the ride. I just hoped it wouldn't end in a spectacular and bloody crash. Chapter 12 Selena Though the sun had barely peaked a tiny sliver of its cheerful countenance above the horizon, the air seethed with heat. Sweat dripped off my face as I jogged along the beach in my long-sleeved yoga suit. Though female tourists could get away with exposing more skin than the local women, I was striving not to stand out in anyone's mind. As I dug furrows through the gritty sand with my feet, my mind drifted back to the evening I'd spent with Aiden. No matter how hard I tried to avoid it, I committed a cardinal sin. Not by sleeping with him. That sort of move was expected in my line of work. Even if, or especially if, it was a client. My sin was not in the physical realm, but the emotional, spiritual even. I'd allowed Aiden inside my walls, let him see more of the real me than anyone ever had before. Why I had done so was still unclear to me at that point. It went beyond the obvious and intense sexual chemistry between us. There was something intriguing about the main family bad boy. 
and it went beyond his superficial charm. He had more depth of character than I'd been expecting. But really, should I have expected him to be a one-dimensional stereotype? We were both in the same line of work, after all. My side began aching when I passed the two-mile mark. By the third, my breath came in ragged puffs. I had but a hundred yards to go, according to my Fitbit, to achieve a fourth mile, when I had to listen to what my body told me and slow to a walk. I dug into my fanny pack. Don't laugh. They're just the right size to stash a pistol, and fished out my phone. I noted a missed call, and when I saw who it was from, my knees grew weak, and not in a good way. Trembling, I lifted the phone to my ear after pushing the call button. It only rang twice before I heard Moira's voice on the other end. The evil queen was not amused. I do hope you have a good reason for not taking care of the main brat as ordered, she said by way of greeting. Moira, I... I mean, when the Seven had him distracted, it should have been simplicity itself to finish him off. I wasn't prepared for them to do that, I said. Perhaps if I'd been informed. Stow it, Moira snapped, and I closed my mouth. The cry of the gulls... The roar of the surf and the emerging sun lent a cheer to the scene I did not feel in the least. I will decide what information is necessary to you, and what is not. Besides, you're a bright, talented young woman. You should have seized the opportunity when it was presented to you. Moira, all I had was a diamondback DB-9. You ever tried distance shooting with a DB-9? No. I'm on the management end of things, she said. I've never even fired a gun. That I did not believe, but she was too powerful for me to call her on it. Well, take my word for it, then. I'm having difficulty taking your word for anything, Selena, Moira replied dryly. My sources say the main brat entered the club around midnight and wasn't seen again until four hours later. Whatever were you up to during that interval? My cheeks flushed red, my belly roiling with a sudden queasiness. I actually sank to one knee, trying to avoid a panic attack right there on the beach in broad daylight. Moira terrified me to the core. Your sources? I blurted at length. Are you spying on me, Moira? Spying? More like supervising which obviously you are sorely in need of. I stood up and began pacing back and forth across the sand, gesticulating wildly with my free hand to burn up nervous energy. Since when? Haven't I always gotten my man or woman? That's beside the point. No, it really isn't. I've worked 69 times, Moira. 69 successes, zero failures, zero. Haven't I earned the benefit of the doubt? Silence for an agonizing several seconds. Then, if that's true, why is Aiden Maine still alive? Oh shit, I thought. What can I possibly say? What excuse is she going to accept? My mind raised, thoughts jumbling up on top of one another. Well, she prompted. It's simple, Moira. I said to stall for more time. Why did you dispatch me to go after him in the first place? Another stalling tactic. Thankfully, Moira took the bait, though she sighed heavily before speaking. I told you. Because the snot-nosed punk polished off one of my good friends and business associates on my turf in broad daylight. Such a brazen challenge to my authority and reputation cannot be tolerated. Exactly. I said, an exultant joy spreading through my chest. I'd figured out an excuse at last. And why is Aiden Maine in Morocco? He's working, obviously, Moira said with a disdainful sniff. I could just picture the world-weary arrogance on her features. We've already established that. Yes, and who is his client? Moira grew silent. I could almost hear the wheels turning in her head. After a moment, she grunted. 
Hmm. All right. You raise an excellent point. He could be targeting another one of our people. We have several operations in that area. Exactly, I said. Exactly. But if you had killed him, we wouldn't have to worry about who his client was at all. Did you not consider that? Ouch. She had me there. But fortunately, I've always been able to think on my feet. There was almost no delay before my reply. Because then we would have no way of knowing which of our operations the mains had become aware of. I decided to twist the knife a little, hoping she would take it as a righteous indignation. Did you ever consider that? Moira laughed, and I immediately relaxed. It was filled with genuine mirth rather than mockery. I see, she said, still chuckling. Very well. Do find out who his client is. In fact, make it a priority. But do so within 48 hours. 48 hours? I blurted. Why the time limit? Because, my dear stepdaughter, I'm worried that you might be vis a -vis, Emotionally compromised by the young main scion. I'm not, I said firmly. Why should I believe you? She asked. Three words. I'm a professional. I let that sink in for a moment, and then I went for her throat, metaphorically speaking. Besides that, Aiden Main will be the 70th client I've worked on. That means I'm done. My obligations to the family complete. If you think I'm going to let some spoiled, rich brat playing at the job I've done with pride for as long as I could shoot keep me from my well-earned freedom... Well, you need to reconsider some things. Moira grunted. Fair enough, I suppose. But I still don't see why you need more than two days to get this done. You've already entertained Aiden on at least one occasion. Men like him get loose lips under the right circumstances. I remembered how Aiden's lips had felt between my legs and blushed. But I kept my disarray out of my tone. Very well, I said. I'll get it done. See that you do, because otherwise... You'll sick the seven on him again? I interjected. No, she said coldly. The seven are a bit of an inexact instrument for a crucial assignment like this one. No, I'll have no recourse but to send in the mirror. I shuddered. My old teacher, Deuce Fratkin... Now a madman due to his brain injury, but still brutally effective at his job. Very well. You didn't let me finish, Moira said icily. If you can't complete your assignment within 48 hours, the mirror won't just be coming after the Aiden brat. My blood ran cold, and my voice trembled when I spoke. What's that supposed to mean? What I mean, my dear, sweet stepdaughter, is that if you can't complete the task at hand in the time frame given, I'll have to assume that you've been compromised. Anger flashed through my system and bubbled forth from my lips. You're threatening me now? I blurted. If my father were alive... Well, he isn't now, is he? Moira snapped. And I don't make threats, little girl. I make promises. Promises I always keep. Always. 48 hours. No excuses. Moira, I said just before she could end the call. Yes. After this one, I'm done. Out. Understand? She chuckled softly. We'll renegotiate your contract upon completion of your current assignment. My dear stepdaughter, be well. The call ended, and I retreated behind a curve in the sea wall so I could have a little nervous breakdown. The mirror. After me. That thought would make hardened, seasoned criminals break down whimpering in a puddle of their own urine. And he would be coming after me if I didn't kill Aiden first. I scowled, attempting to armor my heart and mind. Well, well, if it was a choice between Aiden dying or both of us dying... I knew which decision I preferred. 
I had known from the start that getting involved with Aiden was a mistake. Thank God, I thought. Thank God it was all going to end before I had gotten too deeply involved with him. I convinced myself I could still pull it off. I could still put an end to him without regrets or looking back. Once I'd calmed down enough that I was no longer panting and seething with rage, I dialed a particular number I knew intimately and well. Hello, came a voice on the other end. Professor, I said, in as civil a tone as I could. Ah, Selena, to what do I owe the pleasure? Don't be obtuse, Professor, I said. We both know I know you're in Casablanca, trying to steal my thunder. He sighed and then spoke in a most respectful tone. My dear Selena, I do what I am told, as do you, as do we all. Yes. Well, I have a proposition. Silence. And then, I'm listening. Instead of stumbling around and getting in each other's way, I propose we work together. Selena and the Seven, just like the old days. He chuckled softly. I do miss the old days, not to mention your father. Likewise, I wish he were still with us. As do I, dear Selena, he said. As do I. Very well. Let's parlay. Where and when? First, I need you to use your expertise and extensive contacts list, I said. Find out who Aiden is here to work on. Then set him up. I see. It can be done. But what bait shall I use to entice him into our trap? I'm sure you'll think of something, Professor. You're a genius, after all. Oh, pish posh. I'm just an average man of average intelligence. Your modesty is unbecoming, Professor. But I'll play along with it, as usual. See if you can get him up to the Hilton parking garage. In the off-season, the upper levels should be all but deserted. Indeed. And then? And then, I said, as a tear slipped down my cheek. We take care of Aiden Maine once and for all. The call ended, and I fell to my knees in the sand and wept. Chapter 13 Aiden The easy chair in my hotel room cradled my body with exquisite comfort as I gazed out over the Casablanca skyline. Domed mosques and squarish modern office buildings created a broken line of black against the yellow-pink vestiges of daylight while Helios piloted his chariot away. A glass of scotch sat on the end table beside the chair, largely untouched by my lips. The melting ice clicked further into the dark amber depths as it melted, a metaphor for the time I frittered away. Turmoil boiled in my mind, most of it unrelated to my task at hand. Instead, I found my mind continuously drifting back to Selena, my sad, enigmatic princess. Her scent filled my nostrils, and when I sipped the scotch, I tasted nothing but her lips. The sensation I felt, a sort of tumbling in my gut, was entirely unfamiliar to me. I'd known a lot of women, both in the biblical and casual sense, but never felt anything akin to the want. No, not want. Need. The need I felt to be near Selena again. To see her sad-eyed smile. To hear her genuine laugh when I managed to pierce the cloudy veil obscuring her happiness for brief moments. Only when our skin had lain bare against each other were we truly honest. I missed that feeling. Craved it. I was consumed by the need to feel it again. But I had a job to do. The delay in going home to the Big Apple had cost me some legwork. In the interim of that two-day layover, my target Giscard Epperer had chosen to move from his mistress's villa to a nigh-impregnable fortress on its own peninsula ten miles down the coast from Casablanca. There, with no sea break to hold the powerful waves back, the ancient mission had but one approach. Down the narrow strip of rocky terrain connecting it to the mainland. I'd cracked nuts almost as tough before, but only when the proper legwork had been done first. To that end, 
I was to meet that evening with a man who worked as a low-level cleric in the Casablanca city planning office. He would be providing me, for an exorbitant amount of money, with a floor plan of the remodeled mission. Giscard had redesigned the ancient fortress into his new home. I'd known of his plans, which was why I'd been so keen to fly directly from Spain to Morocco. But Lucian was the boss, unequivocally. I counted myself lucky that he'd allowed me to continue on this task at all. Giscard Epperer wasn't a child peddler like Galagos had been. His game was arms dealing, mostly funneled from former Soviet bloc states. That wasn't enough to get him on our shit list, but then he went and stiffed Lucian in a deal. We were supposed to receive AR-15 rifles and wound up with cheap knockoffs which jammed frequently if they fired at all. Lucian had tried to reach out to him through less extreme methods than sending me, but those had failed. Epperer felt as if so long as he remained in the Eastern Hemisphere, he was out of Lucian's reach. He even said as much, though not in those exact words. When you work beyond the narrow margins of the law, your reputation is vital. More important than resources, manpower, or anything else you care to mention. It's not like Lucian could sue Epperer or call the authorities for the reneged deal. But so long as you had a reputation for ruthlessly dealing with those foolish enough to try your patience, you could do business. Every day that Epperer drew breath into his lungs, the main family business suffered. Already some people in New York were late on repayment of loans. Word got around, and the word on the street was Lucian had gone soft. Why else would Galagos have thought he could get away with flaunting our rules? I'd slammed the coffin lid down on that notion in Spain. Now, in Morocco, I intended to nail it shut. That meant Epperer had to die. Yet every time I tried to strategize in my mind about how I would do the deed, Selena's image sprang unbidden into my mental eye. I never thought I'd be one of those men who pined and whined about a woman, of all things. But then again, Selena was no ordinary woman. Not by a long shot. When the sun had just sunk out of view, I finished my scotch and headed out. I made sure to check my 9mm semi-automatic pistol, popping out the magazine and checking the function. Everything was precisely in order. No surprise, since I clean and maintain my own arsenal personally. I eschewed a cab since I was running a little early. I just couldn't continue to sit there waiting because my thoughts inevitably returned to Selena's warm, smooth-limbed embrace. A group of locals harassed a sub-Saharan immigrant, calling him slave and throwing stones. I wanted to intervene, but I was undercover. Aidan Miller, ace driver, wouldn't concern himself with the plight of an immigrant. Still, my gut twisted in knots, and I tried to memorize the faces of the young Turks harassing the poor man. I wouldn't go looking for them. But if we happened to cross paths, well, that was another story. Soon the Hilton Hotel loomed before me, a modern cylindrical tower that seemed intent upon forcing whiteness into the African locale. Some hotels, like the Marriott I stayed in, took pains to try and appear in sync with the city's old-school architecture. Not here. The Hilton was a bastion of Western culture. But it didn't matter. The Hilton wasn't my goal. Rather, I made for the parking garage adjacent. The entrance and exit featured a guard station, so I didn't use that method for ingress. I headed around the side, down a narrow alley separating the garage from an apartment complex, and to the rear, where the sea breeze brought the tang of salt and the cry of seafaring birds. I vaulted up over the retaining wall and onto the first floor of the garage. Then I made my way up to the second to the topmost level as instructed. The parked cars seemed sparse on that level, lending an abandoned feel. The hair on the back of my neck prickled up. I didn't know why, but I felt anxious. I looked about but saw no one. I reached up and smoothed down my hair, a motion that allowed me to check the pistol concealed beneath my blazer without being obvious about it. Feeling more secure, I chalked it up to nerves, or perhaps lingering anxiety about Selena and my burgeoning emotions. I reached the easternmost edge where I'd been instructed to meet with the cleric. Footsteps echoed off the low ceiling and concrete pillars. 
I stood with my body slightly pivoted to the side, presenting a smaller target just in case it was a trick. My heart rate increased when I saw an unfamiliar man approaching me. A white man. Could this possibly be the cleric I'd spoken with before? You're not Hassan, I said as he drew near. A well-dressed man on the cusp of middle and advanced age, his wire-rimmed glasses, cheerful smile, and white beard created the illusion of a kind grandfather. But his eyes, blue and icy, held the type of cold resolve I'd come to recognize in fellow professionals. No, I am not, he said, his grin softening. That's close enough, I said, drawing my pistol in a flash and aiming it in a two-handed grip. Where's Hassan? I'm afraid he won't be joining us, the man said. Who are you? They call me the Professor, he said, bowing his head. It's so nice to meet you, Aiden. My heart quickened even further, though I didn't let my nerves waver my aim one iota. So you know me, I said. Then you also know I'm the last person in the world you want to fuck with. Oh, yes. I do realize that. He moved a bit to the side, holding his arms out and well away from his body. Professor looked out over the astonishingly, unsafely low railing at the crawling sea. The sea breeze stirred his beard. I just wanted to meet with you personally, a sign of professional respect. Is that so? I asked, squeezing the trigger ever so slightly. You'll forgive me if I'm not much relieved. Nor should you be, he said with a soft chuckle. Tell me, Aiden, that girl you've been seeing, the blues singer, have you slept with her yet? I don't see how that's any of your business, I said. He chuckled softly and looked back over his shoulder. Ah, my dear boy, you are so very young. Much younger than I expected. Such a shame that your life's journey must end here. You talk as if you don't have a gun pointed right at your dome, I snapped. Enough games. What do you want? Why, to kill you, of course, he said with a soft chuckle. I planted my feet wide and nearly pulled the trigger. What's your game? I walked toward him, intent upon beating the answers out of him, old man or no. But I caught the slightest bit of white in the darkness of the apartment building adjacent to the garage. I threw myself to the ground, a split nanosecond later, before I even touched the concrete with my chest. The sound of a round ricocheting off of a concrete column echoed through the garage. Sniper. And I'd let the professor draw me right into his crosshairs. I rolled under a nearby van and struggled to draw my pistol in the cramped environs. By the time I did so, the professor had disappeared. The van shifted above me, and the sound of the door sliding open reached my ears. I scrambled back out, rolling up to my feet on the opposite side as booted feet hit the ground. I came around the side aiming my pistol, but another shot rang out. The gun flew from my grasp as I cried out in pain, clutching my numb hand. Had I taken a round? No. No blood. The sniper had shot to disarm. Show off. He should have gotten me in the head. But then I saw why he had done so. Hey, guys, I said with a cheerful confidence I did not feel. How's tricks? Kicky guy, punchy guy, nasty guy, and choppy guy. And they weren't alone. Two more men climbed out, also giant mounds of muscle. What is that? A clown car? I blurted, glancing over at where my pistol lay on the concrete. I moved toward it, but Machete Guy blocked me. Something like that, he said with a grin. This can go down easy, or it can go down hard. But either way, it's going down, Aiden. You say my name, but you don't fucking know me, I said, backing away as they attempted to circle around me. I had to be careful not to expose myself to the shooty guy on the other roof, which limited my options. If you did... You'd know that if I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. Hold up, growled Punchy Guy. Let me have him. I can take this fool. Like you did last time. 
Nasty guy snorted, wafting his revolting breath in my direction. Now we go according to the plan. Fight as a team. He's a slippery little fuck. Six on one was terrible odds. I know we'd all seen the movies where one man took on an entire army by himself, but those were movies. If they rushed me, I was a dead man. They knew it, and I knew it. Only their respect for my prowess kept them from doing so immediately. Then I saw my chance. Their encircling motion had put them between me and the sniper on the apartment roof. I bolted for the declining ramp, hoping I could outrun all of them except for Kiki Guy. They pounded pavement after me, nearly drowning out the sound of the van's engine turning over. I had no time to worry about it, however. I had to concentrate on evade and escape. I wondered who in the hell these guys were anyway. Did they work for Emperor? It didn't matter if I wound up dead. I ran down to the next level, the six men hot on my heels. The engine gunned louder, the driver pounding the horn with angry warning blasts. I turned around to see the six men barely dodge out of its path. Confusion and anger writ large on their faces. With shock, I realized the driver was trying to run me over. I had no time to dodge. All I could see was grill and headlights. Time seemed to slow down, and with agonizing slowness, I looked up into the blue eyes of the driver. Selena. I turned my back and pulled in my limbs so as to spread the impact out as much as possible. Pain exploded across my form as my breath flew from my lungs in a gashing gasp. With horror, I realized I had plunged right over the edge of the garage. But Selena had miscalculated. She struck me so hard I flew right across the gap between the garage and apartment building. I don't remember the flight or crashing through a plate glass window on the other side. I blacked out for a moment, I believe. When I came to, I lay in a field of broken glass. I struggled to rise. The sniper was already in this building somewhere, but it took precious seconds to recover enough to stand. I staggered into the stairwell and fell down a flight of steps, groaning with renewed pain. Somehow I managed to get to the street level in one piece, amazed nothing had been broken. My formerly dislocated finger had swollen up again, and I hurt like death. But I made it. Taking refuge in the maintenance closet, I did my best to bar the door with a mop handle and then sank to the floor and groaned. Not just from physical pain, either. Selena. Now I knew what she'd been hiding all along. She wasn't a blues singer down on her luck. She was an assassin, and I was her target. Chapter 14 Selena I cringed at the awful, sickening lump as the van's grill slammed into Aiden. My gaze remained locked on him as he sailed across the empty air and smashed into an apartment window two stories below us. I desperately, fervently prayed he had survived. It was my only option. If I hadn't done so, he would have surely been killed. But had I done the Seven's job for them, or provided Aiden with salvation? Truth to tell, I hadn't planned to interfere with the Seven. I had intended to let them do the actual deed. As if it would somehow exonerate me not to get my hands dirty personally. Yet, I was just passing the buck, and I knew it. When I'd seen them circling him like a pack of wild dogs, I knew Aiden was in the last moments of his life. As good as he was, and Aiden was very, very good. No man can hope to take on the Six, especially ones as large and skilled as the Seven. Not to mention Shooty being on the roof of the apartment complex and just waiting for his shot. Almost as if I'd been watching someone else do the deed, I lifted my foot off the brake and slammed it down onto the accelerator. I could still see Aiden's surprised grimace right before impact. It reverberated in the halls of my mind like an echo, tormenting me with guilt. Professor hobbled up to the driver's side door as quickly as his rotund, aging body would allow. I rolled the window down as he glared at me. What in God's name were you thinking, Selena? He asked hotly. We had him dead to rights. I... I wanted to finish him off myself, I said. He'd already escaped from the Seven once. 
I didn't want there to be a second time. Professor sighed and rubbed a hand down his tired face. Let's just hope you killed him. That was the plan. I lied. Professor tilted his chin down and spoke into the gold lapel pin on his coat, which functioned as a shortwave radio. Miles, you read me? Yes, came the reply. What happened? Our erstwhile ally, Selena, took it upon herself to engage in a little bit of vehicular manslaughter. Professor grimaced as he peered across the alley through the sundered window. Make that attempted vehicular manslaughter. I don't see the target. Where is he? He's in the same structure upon which you are so capriciously perched, Professor replied. Find him. Don't let him escape. No. I said, extracting my Walther PPK, the most accurate handgun in the world, and checking the chamber for a round. I'll go. Tell Miles to stay right where he is, and keep watch in case Maine tries to flee out one of the exits. Professor glared at me from over his thin rimmed glasses. He used a finger to push them up to the bridge of his nose, his eyes vanishing behind a glare for a moment. When they returned, his blue orbs glittered with menace. Do pardon my French, Miss Selena, but have you lost your fucking mind? Miles is already in the building. Miles is already on that building, I snapped, which makes him an ideal lookout. I've got this, Professor. Let me do my job. Funny. We could say the same to you, Mike Bellrock said his face still swollen from the fisticuffs with Aiden the other night. I turned an ice-cold stare on him. Remember the last time you and I had a disagreement, Mike? I asked bluntly. His hand went up to a gold tooth in his maw, and his gaze narrowed. That's what I thought, I said with a sneer. Fact. My father stopped using you as my backup and support squad because your egos got in the way of hitting the target. Fact, I became even more successful without your help. Professor opened his mouth in an attempt at a rebuttal, but I cut him off. And finally, fact, I pointed the pistol right between Professor's eyes. If you get in the way of me and my target, I'll put you down like a dog. Professor's lips twitched a smile. So delightfully cold-hearted, he said. Reminds me of your father. Very well. We'll do it your way. Damn right you're doing it my way. I glared at each of them in turn. Only sop Nick Olbermann dared to return my gaze. I arched my brows and put my hands on my hips. And he wisely turned away. You clowns need to get this van out of here. And get it cleaned up just in case I did finish off Maine already. It won't take all six of us to do that. Professor said. Obviously not. Professor, you remain here to coordinate between me and Miles. Sajay, Balrock, since you have a personal grudge against Aiden, being as he kicked your asses, you can hang around outside the apartment complex. If you see him trying to escape, he's all yours. My dear, by the time you get all the way down to the bottom level, Maine could be long gone. Professor said. I sneered at him. You want to make a wager on that? Then I turned and ran toward the retaining wall full tilt. Professor gasped as I planted my foot on the concrete and then leaped over the expanse. For a moment, I was in flight. An exhilarating rush of cheating gravity. Then I tucked my body in tightly and sailed through the window Aiden had broken with his body. I hit feet first then tucked and rolled, absorbing the impact from my plunge. I came up to my feet with the gun drawn, eyes alert for trouble. Aiden was nowhere in sight. All I could see were the shattered fragments of the window and drops of blood. Only after I was certain I'd gone down the hall far enough that Professor or the other seven wouldn't possibly see me, did I call out. Aiden? I said softly. No answer. Aiden... I called out again, a bit louder. Still, no response. I moved down the corridor, looking all around. 
a man came out of an apartment door, his face contorted in confusion. No doubt he was investigating the crash. He took one look at me with my drawn weapon and yelped, retreating back inside. I heard the sound of his door locking. I truly hoped he wouldn't call the authorities, but I had a sinking feeling he was about to do just that. That limited my time severely. I crouched down, examining the blood splatter, and tracked Aiden's movements to a stairwell. He'd eschewed the elevator. Smart boy. I walked carefully down the steps, eyes alert for signs of his passing. I came upon a landing where I found a small pool of blood. Apparently, he'd fallen here and bled for a bit before continuing. My belly twisted up in knots. What if I'd hit him too hard? And he was curled up in a ball in some dark corner, dying. I shook my head to clear it and continued down the steps. Why had I even saved him in the first place? It was the same as signing my own death warrant, wasn't it? Yet, I found I could not deny my feelings for Aiden. I didn't want him dead. I wanted him alive and in my arms. My face twisted into a grim mask as I continued my descent. I found more drops of blood here and there, and a crimson palm print on the lever-style handle leading to the first floor. How was I going to explain to Moira, the evil queen, that I'd botched the job yet again? Would she sick the seven on me right then and there? Or would she give me more time to prove my loyalty? I opened the door and crept cautiously down the corridor. Outside, I could hear the wail of an approaching siren. Shithead did call the cops, after all. Swell. Turning the corner, I elected to stow the pistol for the time being, placing it in my fanny pack. I didn't want to be caught holding it if I happened to run into the police, or another denizen of the apartment for that matter. I paused next to the heavy stained door marked maintenance. There on the floor before it, a pool of blood cooled. There were no further signs of Aiden's passage. He had to be inside the closet. There was no doubt about it. I inhaled, prepared to call his name when I heard the sound of footsteps coming down the stairs. Any denizen of this complex would use the elevator. Miles? It seemed likely. I panicked, unsure of what to do. Aiden was obviously injured. If Miles caught him in such a state, he would kill Aiden for certain. Thinking quickly, I placed my shoe over the blood stain and leaned against the wall as if I were out of breath. A curly-haired, blunt-featured man came around the corner, a long rifle held in his hand. It was Mick Shooty himself, Miles. His face wrinkled in confusion as he spotted me. Miss Selina, he said in a lilting Irish accent. How did you get down here faster than me? Aren't you in the garage? I was, I said, panting to sell my bedraggled state. I jumped over. He whistled, eyes glittering with an impressed light. Ah, oh, you've got bigger balls than me. Any sign of the client? I shook my head. No, I think he made it onto the street. I glared at him as if angry. You were supposed to be keeping watch. Professor told me otherwise, Miles said. I just bet he did, I sneered. Well... Thanks to him not being able to obey orders, our target has given us the slip, and the cops are on their way. We've got to rob it. Miles snorted. I was just following orders, Selena. God damn it. He can't have gotten far. I agree. We'll spread out in a grid, search street by street if we have to. But it would behoove us to get out of this building before we get fingered for having highly illegal weapons on Moroccan soil. Agreed, he said, nodding his head. Come on, are you good to go? I'm good, just give me a second, I said. Are you sure? He asked, brows knitted in concern. God damn it, Miles, I thought fervently. Stop being chivalrous and just go. I couldn't take my foot off the blood patch without alerting him to Aiden's presence in the closet. 
He finally moved on and I followed after. We hit the street just as the cops came around the corner. We ducked into the alley while they screeched to a halt and officers rushed inside. The Seven and I began our grid search, giving the apartment building a wide berth. I knew we wouldn't find him, but I kept up the search for almost two hours before Professor called it off, feeling there was too much heat in the area. You get to explain this to your mother, he said stiffly. Stepmother, I corrected. I called her, and predictably she wasn't pleased. You have 24 hours left, Selena, Moira said coldly. 24 hours, and not one second more. She hung up before I could reply. Professor moved up to me stiffly, removing his glasses and pointedly cleaning them. The Seven will be working solo on this matter, he said grimly. I suggest you keep out of our way, for your sake and for ours. I nodded, grateful when he accepted my submission and wandered off to join his crew. Twenty-four hours. How was I going to get out of this mess? Chapter 15 Haven the hours passed with agonizing slowness inside of the cramped, musty closet, and not just because of the pain I felt from my injuries. My heartbreak and sense of betrayal were the greater cause of agony. That, and a sense of self-loathing. I'd done the one thing I was never supposed to do. I let myself get emotionally involved with a stranger I knew next to nothing about. And I'd paid for it, dearly. Selena. How could I have been so stupid, so blind? I thought we had something, that we were honest, at least with our bodies, if not with our lips. Now, however, I knew she'd been manipulating me from the start. I now realized the man who'd recommended that blues bar to me had likely been in her employ. Selena must have been on to me from the very start, before I ever set foot on Moroccan soil. My teeth clenched tightly when I realized Uncle Lucy had been right all along, again, compounding my folly tenfold. Well, not any longer. Sitting there on my bottom, body aching from a dozen different wounds, I formulated a plan. I figured Selena had no way of knowing I had been able to see her in the driver's seat, or at least she couldn't be sure I had. I was going to pay another visit to the club. But this time, I would be the one laying a trap. When the sounds of morning bustle reached me inside the closet, I finally dared to crack it open and take a peep. No sign of seven-foot men trying to kill me. No Selena. I guessed they'd given up when the authorities had arrived to find out who had broken the window on the upper levels. I headed out into the streets, moving with far less grace than normal. I thrust my hands in my pockets and tried to pretend I was another hungover drunk taking the walk of shame. I'd left my cell at the hotel the previous night, so it couldn't be used to pin down my location via GPS in case I needed an alibi. That meant I had to walk all the way back to my hotel. The front desk clerk arched a brow at my bedraggled state, but asked no questions, which was good, as I was in no mood to answer them. One of the things I'd done to set up the Morocco job had been to make certain a particular individual would be present in Casablanca. Hacksaw Ritchie, affectionately referred to as Doc. His job was to patch us up when things went bad, as they had last night. I called him as soon as I staggered into my room. I knew I probably should have checked to make sure I was alone first, but I was in a state, both mentally and physically. Maybe part of me wanted them to finish the job, so I didn't have to deal with the awful pain in my heart. It was a physical thing, profound and pervasive. I kept trying to run through scenarios in my mind where I thought it couldn't have been Selena, but I rejected them all eventually. As much as I wanted to believe there had been a mistake, I knew better. After an hour or so of attempting and failing to nap because of the pain, a gentle rap came at my door. Three short knocks, followed by two hard ones, followed by scratching. Doc, unless Selena had gotten to him, too. I peered through the peephole 
and saw the fish-eyed, distorted face of a bald, smooth-featured man in a tailored suit, accompanied by a buxom woman half his age. The doctor and his nurse come to fix me up so I could go back to doing what I did best, killing. As soon as I opened the door, Doc tisked and shook his head. Aiden, 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 he said, dragging out each syllable of my name in his lilting Swedish accent. You look terrible, my boy. I feel terrible, I admitted. There was no point trying to act tough in front of Doc. He needed to know the facts if he was going to fix me up proper. Come on in. The nurse wheeled a cart into the room with considerable difficulty. I eyed the long cart dubiously. Portable x-ray? I asked. No. Portable MRI, Doc corrected. No danger of radiation. Sit down and take off your clothes. I stripped, forgetting modesty for the moment. I had been dreading looking at my body, and the numerous dark blotches and red abrasions made me cringe. While the nurse took my vitals, Doc set up the MRI. A metal hoop on an armature allowed it to move over my entire body with relatively little noise, though the lights dimmed when he switched it on. Doc stared at his laptop screen, going through the images uploaded there. When I could hold my patience no longer, I prompted him to break his silence. What's the good word, Doc? I asked with some trepidation. You have the devil's own luck, Aiden, Doc said, nodding to himself. No breaks, no concussion that I can detect. I'd say with a few days rest, you'll be back on your feet again. I don't have a few days, Doc, I said, struggling to rise. The nurse planted her hand on my forehead and firmly pushed me back into the seat. I thought you might say that, Doc said. He prepared a syringe, flicking it with his fingers to ensure no air bubbles were present. This is a booster shot with distilled bull adrenaline. It should kickstart your system and speed up the healing process. Bull adrenaline? I chuckled. Only you, Doc. I'm not going to grow horns. No, but your pee-pee might shrink, he said. I caught his wrist and glanced up in alarm, and he chuckled. Relax. I'm kidding. He gave me the shot, and I felt instantly better. Doc left me some painkillers, which I gratefully took, careful not to exceed the recommended dose. Then I clambered into my bed and slept for nearly twelve hours straight while Doc and his nurse kept watch over me. When I awakened, he took my vitals again and then took his leave. My first thought as soon as the door closed behind him was revenge. Selena had played me for a fool and the pain had given way to anger. Even though I nearly trembled with rage, I managed to calm down enough to formulate a good plan. I had to get Selena out by herself, away from her hulking crew of misfits. Far away. I had another thing arranged during my legwork. The Nautilus, our hydrofoil convertible yacht, bobbed up and down at the docks not far from the club where Selena worked. It would have to do, since I couldn't count on my other safe house having been uncompromised. Would she even be in the club any longer, I wondered. I decided she would be. People in our line of work have to be careful to maintain cover. A sudden absence from work would seem suspicious if it occurred right after the rooftop fight. I dressed in a long-sleeved button-up shirt to hide my wounds and dark green slacks with a brown belt. The slacks were pleated. Slightly out of style, but it made hiding my pistol all the easier. Good thing I packed it too. I always double up on the essentials. When I pushed into the smoky club, Selena was finishing up her set. Our eyes met, and she nearly dropped a note before powering through. I smiled to put her at ease and met her backstage after her set. Aiden, she said, patting her sweat-glistened neck and face with a towel. I was hoping you would come by tonight. Yeah, I thought. I just bet you did. We embraced, and as I held her to me, my face over her shoulder twisted into a grimace. The scent of her hair, the contours of her body. I wanted to enjoy them, but I could not. I felt as if the universe were mocking me with what I could not have. What's wrong? She asked when I groaned. I wrecked during a practice lap. I lied. Oh no, 
Are you all right? I'm fine. A couple of bruises, I said, waving off her concerns. Can we take a walk? I have something to tell you, and I don't want to do it around prying eyes and ears. Uh, certainly, she said. Let me get changed. I didn't want that. Not that I was a creep who wanted to leer at her in the sequined evening gown, sexy as it was. I didn't want to give her a chance to arm herself or call in backup. There's no time, I said, grabbing a coat off the back of a chair in her dressing room and throwing it over her shoulders. It's important. I think you and I might be in a lot of danger, and it's all my fault. She nodded gravely, and we exited the club through the rear entrance. I kept my head on a swivel, refusing to be distracted by Selena. Not this time. Aiden, what's wrong? You're scaring me. I doubted that very highly. Like I said, we might be in danger. Come on, let's take a walk. During our journey to the docks where the main family yacht awaited, I decided to blind her with the truth. Selena, I've been lying to you from the start, I said. I figured, she said with a sigh. You're married, aren't you? Oh, she's good, I thought. I almost believed she was genuine. I wish it was something like that, I said as we strolled past the sea break. I kept my eyes peeled for any sign of her cronies. But it's not. Selena, I'm here to do a job, and it has nothing to do with racing. What kind of job? The highly illegal and dangerous kind. I'm a cleaner. I clean up messes. The human kind. She gasped, throwing a hand over her mouth. I took her other in my grasp and tugged her along. I know. Shocking. Right? I asked, barely keeping the bitterness out of my tone. But there you have it. Unfortunately, the people guarding my target got to me first. And now I fear you're in danger. I see, she said, heels clicking along the pavement. Where are you taking me? Someplace safe, I said. Or at least I hope it's safe. If anything happened to you, I don't know what I'd do. I blinked away a tear. A genuine one. In that moment, her betrayal and my aching need for her were too much to bear. Oh, Aiden, she gasped, putting her hands on my cheeks and kissing the tear away softly. God, how I wanted to believe she was genuine. How I ached to take her in my arms and let the rest of the world and its problems slip away. It was a greater torture than I'd ever known. No time for that, I said stiffly, shoving her away from me. Come on. When we walked the timbers to the bobbing yacht, Selena grew suspicious at last. Aiden, I don't think I want to be here any longer, she said, trying to extricate her hand from my grasp. Come on, not much further, I said. No, she said, tugging her arm back hard. Instead of fighting her, I used the momentum to pull myself in close. With a pivot to the left... I stepped fully behind her and dragged her wrist up behind her back in a hammerlock. Aiden, you're hurting me, she said, and the pathos in her plea nearly broke my heart anew. Good, I said, with conviction. Part of me wanted her to hurt, and badly, but I pulled my punch, so to speak, and didn't break her arm outright. Aiden, if you don't let me go, I'm going to scream, she said. In response, I clamped a hand over her mouth and nose and forced her to walk up the gangplank onto the yacht. She struggled, but not over much. I thought she was still trying to pretend she was just a blues singer. I threw her onto the deck like a sack of potatoes. Selena scrambled on hands and knees away from me, but I planted my foot in her rump and shoved her tumbling below decks. Now she revealed her celerity, turning the headlong tumble into a somersault and coming to her feet in a fighting stance facing me. Her eyes were wild, chest heaving as she drew in air. I pointed the gun at her and shook my head. End of the line, Selena, I said sadly. You're mine now, and the only way you're getting off this boat alive is if I say so. She lowered her hands, face contorting into a scowl. You won't hurt me, she said bitterly. I wish you were right, 
I said, my heart breaking. But you're not. I'd caught the Black Widow in her own web. Now it was time to glean the truth from her. And if I had to hurt her to get it, then so be it. Chapter 16 Selena. Staring down the barrel of Aiden's gun, a real one rather than a metaphorical reference to his member, was definitely not the position I'd wanted to be put in. But then again, I had no one but myself to blame. I could have taken the shot that first night and gone for the kill. Or I could have just sat back and let the Seven do their jobs. But I hadn't done so. When Aiden walked into the club, looking like death warmed over, the first thing I felt was a palpable mantle of guilt settling over my shoulders. So heavy I missed a note. And I never miss a note. Then, when he'd seemed ignorant of my involvement, I'd grown hopeful. Not that he and I could live happily ever after, or any other such fairy tale nonsense. No, I'd been hopeful I could figure out a way to get him out of Morocco, and keep him alive while doing it. So, I'd let my guard down, believed him because I wanted to more than any good sense would have dictated. Not until we'd reached the docks where the fancy yacht awaited had I developed reservations. I sensed the noose tightening around my neck at that exact moment. But I'd acted too late, and now he had me cornered. I measured the distance between us. Ten feet. No way I could cross it in time to disarm him, or even disrupt his aim. Aiden was a crack shot. I knew as much because I'd studied him so intensely. So I stood there and fumed, unwilling to believe the tenderness he'd shown me earlier was an act, but fearing in my gut that it was. He's a killer, Selena. I reminded myself silently. A killer. And now you're trapped in his jaws. What are you going to do, Aiden? I asked softly, my body trembling. Torture me? His face contorted into a severe, grim mask of disgust. You think I won't? He blurted, the barrel of his gun wavering ever so slightly. I licked my lips and didn't answer, because I couldn't be sure one way or the other what his intentions were. I had hoped you wouldn't be capable of such a thing, I said, reaching up to clasp the coat around my elegantly clad but somewhat exposed form. Please, Selena he said, squeezing his eyes shut tightly and shaking his head. Enough of the lies. I took a half step forward while his eyes remained closed, hoping to close the gap. His eyes snapped open and the gun stopped wavering. Another step and I'll pull the goddamn trigger, he said, his voice trembling. I paused, a sickening nausea slipping through my body. This was all wrong. All wrong. Not the way I wanted us to be at all. Will you really shoot me, Aiden? I asked, my voice breaking a little. Yes. No. He shook his head. I don't know. Please don't make me find out, Selena. Please. I lifted my hands in the air and sighed. All right, Aiden. All right. You're in charge. I'll do whatever you say. Fuck out of here with that act. Aiden snapped. Do you think I'm stupid? I'm not going to let you put me off my guard. You're much too dangerous. A swell of professional pride caused my chest to puff out a bit. You don't know the half of it, I growled. Do yourself a favor, Aiden. Stand aside. Let me pass and then point this yacht toward Europe and don't look back. We're far beyond that, Selena he said, his face a mask of torment. I trusted you. I wanted to believe in you, in us. But you lied to me the whole time. Not the whole time, I said. Some of the things I told you were true. Some of the things I felt were real. No, he said, stubbornly shaking his head. I don't believe you. Take off the coat and turn around, face the wall. I slipped out of the coat, 
Wondering if I could possibly go for the switchblade in the breast pocket without him finding out before it was too late. Given the state of mind he was in, I didn't want to risk it. I still had hope I could get out of this alive, but it would require subtlety and more than a little luck. Once the coat lay crumpled on the floor, I turned around. He moved in close, jamming the barrel of the gun into the back of my head. He patted me down roughly, checking to make sure I wasn't armed. Satisfied, he shoved me down the corridor into the living area with a flat-screen satellite television and comfortable-looking furniture anchored to the floor. The posh environs clashed with my dire plight. You're wasting your time, Aiden, I said, as he pushed me face first onto the sofa. I'll never talk. You'll talk, he growled, jamming the barrel into the back of my head so hard it hurt. You'll fucking talk. Stay. If you move a muscle, I'll pump you full of lead and feed you to the sharks. I remained where I was while he rummaged about the cabin. Once... I dared to raise my gaze up enough to check his position, and his face turned red with rage. Don't look at me, he snapped. You don't need to know what I'm doing. Soon he knelt with a knee in the small of my back. I cried out in pain as the smell of rope reached my nostrils. Give me your hands, he said, grinding the knee into my spine. Gasping, barely able to breathe, I obeyed. Aiden folded my arms at right angles behind my back and cinched a length of cord around my wrists. I didn't know you were kinky, Aiden, I said, my voice strained but mocking. We'll see how long that smart mouth lasts, he growled. What you're thinking of is Shibari. This is Hojujutsu. The difference is... He yanked hard on my bound wrists, and I cried out in agony. Comfort. There's very little metal to be had in Japan, you see. They couldn't afford to create manacles for their prisoners, many of whom were trained professional fighters, a lot like you. So, they developed an ingenious, inescapable way of binding. Aiden dragged me into a kneeling position on the sofa. I gasped, mostly in relief now that his knee was no longer digging into my back. He wrapped twin lines of cord around my torso, further binding my arms to my sides. He wasn't kidding about the lack of comfort. My arms arched already from the stringent binding. He finished tying off the line and then grabbed a handful of my hair. I grimaced, but refused to give him the satisfaction of making a sound. Aiden glared into my eyes, and I glared right back. Cross your legs, he said. Indian style. Don't you mean Native American? His hand darted out faster than a striking snake. I saw it coming, my shoulders tensing on instinct to try and block the blow, but my bindings held. My face snapped to the side, my cheeks stinging from the impact of his slap. Don't be cute, he snarled. Trembling more from rage than fear, I crossed my legs under me in the manner he described. He ran more cord under my ankles, securing them tightly before running the slack over my shoulder and attaching it to the rigging behind my back. I was drawn into a painful fold, crying out in spite of my earlier vow not to. Hurts, he asked, crouching down into my field of vision. The Yutoju Jutsu is much for torture as for restraint. Thanks for the history lesson, I gasped out through gritted teeth. Still acting tough? Aiden brandished a knife in front of my face. I trembled, afraid of sweat stinking up the cabin. He ran the flat of the cold blade along my hot skin, up under the hem of my skirt. I feared he would just keep going until he cut something precious, but he abruptly reversed the blade and cut through the skirt. Sequins rained down on the sofa as he ripped and shredded the dress off of my body. I see what kind of man you are, I growled. Go ahead, get your rocks off. I still won't talk. Don't you wish, he sneered. Clothes get in the way of connectivity. I arched an eyebrow at that, 
but he turned and abruptly left. As soon as he was out of sight, I began twisting my arms in an attempt to escape. The cords pinched my skin, eliciting a gasp from my lips. Aiden was no novice at this Japanese binding shtick. That was obvious. The engine roared to life. I rocked on my sofa perch as he trolled it out into deeper waters. I watched the coastline dwindle to faint lights over the aft deck, my belly twisting with apprehension. He was taking me out to where no one could hear me scream. Or maybe he would just grasp the ropes binding me and toss me right overboard. Aiden's footsteps returned, and my gaze was inexorably drawn to the black case in his grasp. Nothing good ever came out of those. I should know. I had several. Sometimes my orders were to make death take as long as possible. He snapped open the case, and I recognized the battery pack and alligator clamps of a device designed to administer electric shocks. Ostensibly for medical reasons, but I didn't think that was what Aiden had in mind at all. I yelped as he snapped the red and black clamps to my pinky toes, the metal jaws digging into my flesh. Aiden sneered at me as if to say, See? I don't mind hurting you. Then he flicked on the box with an electric squeak. Aiden brandished a foot-long metal stem with a rubber grip, capped by a metal ball. Last chance, he said. Tell me what I want to know. Who are you really? And who hired you to kill me? Bert. He was mad at you for making time with his husband, Ernie. So he had Big Bird drop a dime on you. I expected rage at my insolence. But his face twisted into a confused frown. I didn't think he expected me to continue resistance. Aiden licked his lips nervously. I called his bluff. Was he going to do it? Shock me? You're asking for it. He snapped. I'm begging for it. Who's going to give it to me? He pressed the metal ball into the meaty part of my shoulder, just between the ropes. My mouth flew open in a scream, cutting off my speech. It felt like a thousand rubber bands were snapping against my skin in a line from my shoulders down through my legs to my toes. My muscles cramped, and I shivered as if freezing to death my teeth chattering so hard I bit my tongue. Aiden removed the globe, and I panted, sweating profusely. I lifted my gaze to meet his own. Guilt gleamed in Aiden's eyes. He hadn't expected me to scream. I didn't believe. But again, I called his bluff, pushed him until he had no choice but to go through with it. Tell me, he demanded. God damn it, woman, talk! Giscard Epur is a piece of shit. You don't need to go through this for him. Giscard who? I said in a ragged voice. My wrists twisted behind me in their bonds, hands clenched into fists. Bald of you to assume I give one shit about Frenchie. He paused, head cocked to the side like a confused dog. You don't work for him? I work for Hakim at the lounge. You know that... I cried out again as he smashed the globe into the opposite shoulder. This time, he kept it pressed for an eternity. Maybe a whole minute. When he drew it away, I drew in air in shuddering gasps. Blinking away tears, though I refused to break down into sobs. I tried to hold on to a boiling cauldron of anger in my belly. Selena, he said. The wand dangling limply in his grasp. His eyes in tone pleading. Tell me, please, don't, please don't make me hurt you again, please. I'll never break, I said with a confidence I no longer felt. You'll have to kill me first. His face twisted up into a mask of rage. Aiden dialed up the intensity on the box until it buzzed like a nest of angry hornets. Then he brandished the wand toward me. I'll, I'll do it, he said more as if he were trying to convince himself rather than me. Maybe, I said grudgingly. Maybe. But then you wouldn't find out what you wanted to know, would you? I might be inclined to give you a hint. 
You think you're in the position to play games? He snapped. I squirmed a bit in my bonds and laughed. I think given my position, playing games is all I can do, I said. If you'll make love to me again, I'll give you a hint. Aiden dropped the wand and hastily picked it back up. You're trying to trick me, he snarled. No, I'm not, I said, shaking my head. Come on, Aiden. I know you had fun. I sure as hell did. You can still brag about how you broke me to your brothers at Main LLC. His gaze narrowed. My knowing more about him than he knew about me was pure torture. And we both knew it. Lies, he spat. No lies. You can keep me tied up if you want, I purred. In fact, I might prefer it that way. Aiden stared at me for a long time, and then removed the clamps from my toes. I gasped as blood rushed back to the tortured digits. Then his hand dropped down to his belt. Oh, Aiden, I thought. Now I have you right where I want you. Chapter 17 Aiden I loosened my belt and let my pants drop to the floor before stepping out of them. Selena sat on the sofa, contorted by my bindings. The sly smile on her ruby-red lips seemed to belie her circumstances as my prisoner. Whoever she was, whatever she was, Selena had more going on than just singing in a lounge. She'd been trained to resist pain or was just a natural at it. In either event, I didn't believe she was a stranger to hardship. Neither was she a stranger to hard cock, at the least my own. As I drew down my underwear, her gaze dropped to my astonishingly hard member. It was so erect, I was almost in pain. Once I disrobed, I stood there glaring at her, unsure of what to do next. I'd acted on impulse when Selena made her offer, but now my mind roiled with conflict. Did I want to do this and potentially play right into her hands? I knew she was playing me. Her gamesmanship was second to none. Selena certainly had me fooled right from the start. What are you waiting for? Selena taunted. I'm right here. Obviously, I can't come to you at the moment, unless you're going to untie me. My face contorted in a sneer. Not a chance, I growled. I'll play your game, but only by my rules. Of course, Aiden, she said sweetly. You're in charge. She chuckled, an almost giddy edge to it. Selena's cheeks flushed plump and red. God, she was beautiful. Almost like a vision from a storybook. In fact, she continued, unmindful of my enamored state. It's hard to imagine a scenario where you could be more in charge of me. I'm so helpless. You can just do any old thing you want to me. Growling, I clamped a hand over her mouth and crouched down until we were on eye level. You think this is a game? I asked hotly. My heart thudded in my chest and my blood rushed through my body like fire. All I wanted to do was take Selena right then and there, take her heart. I removed my hand and she licked her lips, red gloss smeared on the edge of her mouth and on my fingers. Yes, she said. Of course it's a game, Aiden. A game I've already won, I snapped. Yes, of course, she said nodding as much as she was able. Are you going to glare at me all night? Or are you going to fuck me? I drew my hand back as if to slap her. Selena didn't flinch. She just stared up at me with her soulful blue eyes that held an eager light of her impending ravishment. I knew I was being played. I knew she was up to something. And I was playing right into her hands. Yet I straightened up from my crouch and grasped her hair near the scalp. Selena winced, but didn't make a sound. I took hold of the rope encircling her torso and flipped her onto her back, legs helplessly in the air like an inverted turtle in the sun. The new position left her glistening wet gash vulnerable to my sight. 
I licked my lips as I stared directly at her pussy. Swollen. Wide open. Inviting. The smell of her arousal hit my nostrils and spurred me on. I reached down, placing my fingers on top of her engorged labia. Selena's eyes fluttered closed, and a gasp escaped her lips. Oh god, yes, she hissed. That feels so good, Aiden. Encouraged more than I cared to admit, I stroked my fingers through her gash in a long, slow motion. Selena's feet wriggled in their bonds as I repeated the gesture. My fingers were warm and slippery from her oozing, shaven cunny. I lifted my hand away. Oh, she said with a little pout. Selena squirmed around as if trying to press her body into my retreating fingers. Come back. I lifted my fingers to my nose and inhaled deeply. A surge of wild passion shot through my body. I could not resist another taste of her sweet cradle of love. I knelt down before the sofa, my face at a level with her glistening mons. Oh, you're such a bad boy, Aiden, she said as I pried her lips apart and moved my face in so close I could feel her body heat. Then I dove in, fitting my nose and lips into her bubblegum pink flesh. Selena cried out as I suckled on her labia, stretching it out taut with my lips. The wet, lewd sound only encouraged her to open up even wider, and I found myself forgetting all about her supposed end. I was fully in the zone now, intent upon my meal, intent upon making her come as hard as I possibly could. Selena cooed as I ran my tongue about her clitoral mound, deforming the engorged center mass and peeling it up nearly flush against her body. I added more careful, intense strokes of my tongue, relishing the taste of her sweet little pussy. Yes, Aiden, she cried. Yes, right there. Lick my clit, please. Please, Aiden. What am I doing? I wondered silently. She's my enemy. She tried to kill me. She ran me over with a fucking van. Ran over me with a van. And here I was making love to her as surely as I had before. It wasn't fucking, not anything so banal and purely physical. We connected on a deep, profound level, and for a time, our identities outside of that cabin ceased to exist. She was my captive, but no longer a prisoner. I had to wonder, however, which of us was really in control. I grabbed the rope cinched about her thighs and pulled her more tightly into my lips' embrace. Selena cried out, her voice sharp and hard in my ears. I moved my mouth up to encompass her entire clitoris, hood and all, and sucked hard. Oh, God, Selena wailed. Oh, God, Aiden, yes, it feels so good. I lifted my glistening face from her musky cradle and she positively whimpered. No, no, please, she said in the little girl voice. Don't stop. I'm so close. I'm right there, Aiden. Suddenly, I didn't care if she was playing me or not. Nor did I care if her act was wholly or partially authentic. All I knew was I wanted to play her body like an instrument and hear the symphony of climactic screams. I plunged back into my work, sucking noisily, wetly on her clit. Selena screamed, a sound having nothing to do with fear or pain. I felt the sudden deluge of her juices flooding over my face, into my mouth, even up my nostrils, and I didn't stop. I continued to dine on her tasty cunny with gusto. Selena came again, harder than the last time. My face, hair, and chest gleamed and dripped with her pussy juice when I pulled away. Selena panted in her bonds, head tossed back and black hair spread out in a nimbus around her head. A dark halo for a girl with dark desires. Oh, Aiden, she gasped. Oh, God. I love that so much. You really know the combination to my safety. I wiped my mouth and stared at her. My bound, naked, and helpless prisoner. Feeling a surge of both guilt and shame at having played into her hands, I tried to stand firm. All right. You got what you wanted. 
I growled. Now let's hear what I want to know. Her eyes widened, and a slight smile tugged at the corners of her full red lips. Oh no, Aiden. That wasn't the deal at all. I snarled and slapped my hand right across her bare, gleaming pussy. Hard enough, the impact echoed through the cabin. Selena cried out, though from pain or pleasure, I wasn't certain. I think it was the latter, though. You lied to me, I snarled. No, she said, shaking her head and speaking with a tight voice. No, I didn't. First of all, I never said I was going to give you anything more than a hint. Second, I said you had to fuck me. I just did, I said in exasperation. No, you didn't, she said with a schoolyard cadence. You ate my pussy, yes, and it was fucking amazing. But you haven't fucked me yet. No cock, no hint. I tried to stand firm to my convictions, but the only firm thing about me flopped between my legs. Growling, I grabbed the ropes around her thighs and dragged her closer to the edge of the sofa. She gasped when I stuck my fingers inside of her well-greased cunny, moving them around in slow circles. But I wasn't trying to stimulate her. Well, not entirely. I was lubricating my fingers for another purpose. What are you doing? She asked, seemingly aghast as I traced a circle Seemingly aghast as I traced a circle around her dark star with my dripping wet fingers. You said I had to stuff you with cock, I growled. That I had to fuck you for a hint. Well, you never specified where I was going to fuck you. Selena's mouth formed an O, and a spurt of juice flew out of her wide-open orifice to splatter noisily on the cabin floor. Have it your way, she said with far more eagerness than I expected. That's right, I said, aware of how banal I sounded. No matter how hard I tried to pretend, I knew I was caught in her web. I was her prisoner, her captive, and we both knew it, even if I would never have acknowledged such. My way. I inserted my index finger into her ass. Selena moaned, eyes squeezing shut as I slid it into the last knuckle. Slowly, I worked a second inside of her. Then a third. You're a nasty boy, Aiden, she gasped. Oh, God, that feels so nice. I'm a nasty man, I corrected, slipping my fingers out. I pressed the head of my swollen cock against her dark star. Selena arched her back, trying to force her body around my cock like a sheath. Bit by bit, I inched my way inside of her gliding in until my balls slapped against her body. Oh, God, she groaned as I thrust in and out with a slow, steady rhythm. Oh, God, Aiden, I love having you in my ass. I growled, unable to speak, lost in the ecstasy of the moment. My lips curled back, my teeth bared, and I cried out as if in pain as I released inside of her. Selena moaned when I slid back out. Her ring of muscle distended lewdly. She looked up at me with a still hungry light in her liquid blue eyes. Your hint, I panted. Oh, but don't you want to do me in the twat now? She asked, batting her lashes at me like a jazz club seductress, which I guess is what she was. Come on, Aiden. I know you want to feel me from the inside, everywhere. I gasped in astonishment and more than a little delight as the ring of her inner labia twitched with precise contractions of her talented vaginal walls. She was right. I couldn't resist doing her everywhere. Where are you going? She cried as I stood up and headed toward the lavatory. To wash off my rod, I said. Then I'm going to fuck you until you scream for me to stop. Don't threaten me with a good time, she called after me. I glowered ruefully into the mirror as I rinsed my member with soap and water. Who was really in charge here? I was no longer certain it was me. I was no longer certain at all. Chapter 18 Selena The yacht rocked gently upon the calm sea as I lay on the leather sofa, 
packaged and vulnerable, awaiting Aiden's return. I yearn to feel him inside of me again, in spite of my captivity. Or perhaps because of it. Somehow, even when he was shocking me, I knew Aiden would never be able to cause me true harm. I had no evidence of this, of course. It was just a feeling, an instinct, one as deeply held as the need for that first gasp of air after being submerged too long beneath cold water. My ordeal at his hands had been more of a game I played with myself. How much could I take? How much was I willing to take? The fact was, I didn't know, and he hadn't reached my limits. Yet. How could I tell him how I felt, how I really felt under those circumstances? Aiden would never know if I was telling the truth, or just trying to gain leniency in my captivity. He'd suspect it was a ruse, a means of throwing him off guard so I could escape, or perhaps even finish my contract. Even when I'd been tormented by the electro-stim machine, I felt a strange sense of being in control. It seems odd to think that, considering my vulnerable state, trapped in yards of rope without a shred of clothing to protect my dignity. But that's the sensation I experienced. I knew that at any time I could end the torment, if only I gave in. Then I'd hit upon a new way to remain in control. My offer of a hint as to who I worked for. Aiden had done exactly what I wanted. Mostly. And that felt good. Even under duress. Even as his prisoner. I felt somehow safer than I had in my entire life. Life wasn't easy when you were born into the flip side of polite, civilized society. My father hadn't sheltered me from the ugliness of his business. Either illicit or otherwise. I had a clear memory of being about eight years old and coming in to see him dangling a man off a high ledge by his legs. My father was so powerful politically in that era that he could have dropped the man onto the street below, turning him into a red ruin erupting with gore onto the pavement. On occasion, he had chosen to show mercy. Not because I was there, either. When I was ten... He shot a man right in front of me and then turned and made certain I was paying attention. When I tried to flinch away, he roughly grabbed my chin and turned my head toward the horror, telling me I had to get used to it, become injured by it, because a lack of mercy would become a hallmark of my existence. There, on the sofa, I hit upon a revelation, an epiphany, if you will. I had been scared my entire life, all of it. My skills, the way I applied them, the way I carried myself. It all had been designed to make me feel powerful. But I knew no matter what I did, no matter how many unarmed combat techniques I mastered, no matter how many firearms I learned to operate, I would never really be in control of my destiny. And that terrified me so much I couldn't bear to face it. I just buried it. Bound and naked on Aiden's yacht was ironically the safest I'd ever felt up to that point. No one I truly feared knew where I was. Not my stepmother, not Professor and the rest of the seven. No one. It was just Aiden and me, floating on the ocean like the last survivors of the end of the world. The odd sense of contentment I felt seemed utterly incongruous with my circumstances. But I was so very tired of lying to myself. I stirred out of my reverie when Aiden returned, his naked member glistening with moisture and smelling of soap. He stood there on the threshold of the living area, staring at me with eyes unable to hide his hunger. His member stood at half-mast, growing more rigid with each moment he stared at my exposed body. I'm still waiting for you to fulfill your end of the bargain, I said. I flexed my pelvic floor muscles and caused my glistening, swollen mound to dance. Sweat broke out on Aiden's brow. His tongue darted over his lips, and he moved toward me as if in a trance. Aiden reached behind my folded legs and fondled my left nipple. I gasped, the electric surge of stimulus darting throughout my body and making my brain glow with desire. I looked up at him with half-lidded eyes and a coy smile. 
You know, if you just untied me, just enough so I'm not folded in half, you could see the girls while you played with them. Aiden seemed startled, as if he had forgotten my bound and helpless state. His hands moved onto the knots behind my shoulders until the ropes grew loose and slack. I gratefully stretched out as my legs came free from my torso, though my arms remained anchored behind me. I was about to say thank you when my mouth flew open as he suddenly groped my pussy. A soft hiss issued out of my wide open lips, hard throbs rippling from my nether region to spread through my abdomen. Aiden gripped his long veined rod in his hand and moved it into position. He stroked the crimson head through my wide open slit. A yearning moan forced its way out of my throat. Aiden inserted the tip inside and then kept going. A short-lived but very sharp pain lanced through me, but then faded before a wave of contented bliss. I believe I sighed in that moment, clutching at Aiden with my legs, though I yearned to touch his perfectly chiseled body with my hands. They remained frustratingly trapped behind me, however. Aiden leaned into me, his body crushing me into the sofa. His hands reached up and roughly clenched my breasts, deforming the flesh and causing it to bubble out between his fingers. It felt amazing, despite the slight pain and discomfort. I wanted him to enjoy my body. I wanted him to take pleasure in violating me. His pleasure became my pleasure, and I endured even when his fingers sought out my stiffly aroused nipples and pinched harder than the clamps had imprisoned my toes. Our eyes met, and I let out a little growl. Are you going to lie there with your cock inside me all night, or are you going to work for it? I taunted. You fucked me like a goddamn porn star in my dressing room. Why are you holding back now? His head tilted to the side. Confusion washed over his face. I laughed and wriggled prettily beneath his lithe form. Seriously, why be tentative now? What am I going to do? Slap your hands away? You've already thoroughly inspected my body. You know I don't have teeth down there. Aiden's face twisted with conflict. I could see it in his eyes. He was about to withdraw, unable to deal with the realization that he truly had me at his mercy, and perhaps less able to understand why I was not only okay with it, but having the time of my life. His wishy-washy response spurred me to anger. My eyes narrowed and I spoke through gritted teeth. Come on. I know you want to do it. Do it. Do it. His hand clamped down over my mouth, cutting off my speech. Then he slammed his pelvis into me with an audible slap, driving his member into my core. I cried out, muffled behind his hand as he drilled me with slow but intense thrusts. His hand slipped off of my mouth and went to the side of my head, gripping the back of the sofa to hold himself in place while he rocked and bucked atop of me. I strove to give as good as I got, wrapping my ankles around the small of his back and pulling him tightly into me. I wanted to feel him deep, deeper than I'd ever felt anything in my life. My well-trained love tunnel gripped him as tightly as my legs, squeezing his rod, and showing him levels of ecstasy I'd like to think he didn't know were possible. Oh, I guess. I cried as sweat flung off of both our wildly rocking bodies. Now you're owning that pussy. Aiden growled, and his eyes narrowed to slits as he drove himself into me even harder. I saw it in his eyes, that moment when he stopped fighting me and gave in fully to his lust. It was the look I desired to see in his eyes all along, but hadn't been able to put into words. And how would I explain it if I could? But I didn't have to. Did I? No. My sweet captor, the man in full possession of my body and my soul, had no more barriers between him and me. They came crashing down amid the cries, slaps, and grunts of our intense bout of passion. Oh, God... I groaned. I'm coming. My abdomen clenched and released, fluttering as waves of ecstasy rolled over me like the sea at storm. The first was intense, 
But as he built me up toward a second, and then a third, I found I only wanted more, more, more of what he gave. Fortunately for me, Aiden was not only willing, but eager. He jackhammered me from above, his face turning red as he strove not to release. I could feel his member grow more rigid, as impossible as it seemed, taut with the strain of holding back. Aiden, I cried. Come inside of me, please. Come inside of me. With a guttural, helpless cry of wild abandon, Aiden allowed himself the long-awaited release. His body shivered and heaved atop of me, back arching, neck and head thrown back as the muscles and tendons stood out in stark relief through his skin. Selena, he wailed. So much was tied up in that simple one-word utterance. It was a declaration, a confession, and a plea all rolled into one. Then Aiden collapsed on top of me as our bodies heaved with heavy pants. I could feel his heartbeat thudding against my own, and for a time, I swore the two rhythms were perfectly in sync. I couldn't resist kissing him, first on the cheek and then on the lips when he turned his face toward mine. We broke the contact and stared into each other's eyes for a long time. Wordlessly, he reared up off of me, leaving a curious sensation of absence as his semi-flaccid member slid out of me. Aiden gently pulled me into a sitting position and untied me, gradually loosening ropes and knots until my limbs fell free. I was covered in deep red indentations, which I wore like a badge of pride. I didn't mind being his prisoner, not in the least, but the sudden sensation of freedom mingled with my post-climactic glow to create a kind of strange bliss I'd never experienced before. I looked at Aiden. Aiden gazed back. It was time to give my hint, but I wanted to linger in that place as long as possible. Whatever else transpired between us, at least our bodies were honest, even if our words were not. Chapter 19 Aiden Selena sat on the sofa, rubbing a finger over the red indentations left in her snow-white skin by the tight bindings. I stood several paces away, still wary of her prowess, coiling up the rope since I'd probably have to use it again soon. I didn't want it to get tangled. She looked up at me and smiled. A smugness lay in her gaze, tempered by post-coital relaxed energy. That was fun, she said. We should have tried it earlier. I shook my head, feeling more than a little duped. But given how much fun we'd had, I just couldn't get angry. Yeah, I said lamely, because I didn't know how else to respond. Now tell me what I want to know. Oh no, she said, shaking her dark locks. Lipstick smudged by my mouth onto her cheek. That wasn't the deal. I just have to give you a hint. Then out with the hint, I snapped. I've played your games. Now I'm done. Selena laughed, not out of mockery, but sincere mirth. Aiden, 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 she said in a sigh. We're still playing my game. We have been since the moment you stepped off the plane. She wasn't wrong, I realized. I sat down opposite her on the adjacent easy chair, the gun in my hand, but not pointed at her. I didn't even have the safety off. Fair enough, Selena. If that is your real name. What if I told you it is? She taunted, a hint of a smile stretching her full, sumptuous lips. I ached to feel them pressed into my own again, but my resolve held. Fine, Selena. Tell me your hint, and it had better be a good one, or... My voice trailed off. Or what? I would hit her again? Shock her? What would it take to break this woman? And if I figure out how, would I be able to bring myself to do so? My employer is an evil queen, she said in a lilting tone. She has many palaces, but currently resides in the palace near a tower made of cold iron. I heard the capital letter on the second palace. Obviously it was someplace important. And the Tower of Iron? The Eiffel Tower? Could be, unless she meant Tokyo Tower. 
It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. But there was an element of Euro regality to Selena that made me believe Paris was a safe bet. What palace? Don't tell me you work for the French government. She shrugged. I agreed to give you a hint. I have done so. If you want another hint, it's going to cost you. I burst into laughter, shaking my head at the absurdity. Woman, after what we just did, I don't think I'd be able to... Uh, measure up at the moment. Are you sure? Selena looked pointedly between my legs. Damn it. My traitor cock stood at full mast. For some reason, this made me angrier than it should have. I'm tired of your games, I said. Roll over onto your stomach. I need sleep thanks to you running me over with a van, and I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. She eyed the rope in my hands and arched an eyebrow. Technically, I didn't run you over. I blasted you off the roof. I snarled and stood up in a flash to loom over her. Quit playing games. You should have run me over. You made a mistake by accelerating at the last moment. Did I? She asked, brows arching innocently over her crystal blue eyes. I was so smitten with her beauty, it was all I could do not to climb atop her again. But that would be playing into her hands. Again. Whatever. On your stomach now. Wait, she said, holding a palm out toward me. Can't the girl get a bite to eat first? I didn't have a chance to eat dinner after my set. I growled low in my throat. For a moment, I thought I might strike her. My hand even twitched, but then I relaxed my fingers and nodded. Fair enough. I tossed the coat to her. Cover yourself. She let it fall to the floor and shrugged. Why? You've already become more familiar with my body than any doctor. Suit yourself, I said, slipping into my trousers. There was no way I was going to run around in front of her with my dork hanging out and invite further mockery. I led her at gunpoint to the galley and allowed her to make tuna salad sandwiches for us both. I caught her eyeing one of the butcher knives magnetically adhered to the block on the wall. Don't even think about it, I said. Too late, she replied. I've already fantasized a dozen ways I could reach that knife and stick it through your eye. Don't try it, I snapped warily. I... I don't want to shoot you, Selena, but I will if I have to. Will you? She asked sweetly. She cut the sandwiches into triangles, setting a half on its side like a fancy restaurant might do. Then she presented the plate to me with her head bowed. Your sandwich, oh great sahib. I snatched a half off the plate and stepped back, gun still pointing her way. I wasn't comfortable with the knives so close at hand. Only when she moved away did I relax. We dined in relative silence, me with my hand still on the gun finger curled about the trigger. Selena licked mayo off her finger suggestively, closing her eyes and moaning. Mm, not the best meal I've had, but far from the worst. Now what does a girl have to do in order to be served dessert? I had to laugh, my resolve weakening. I even thrust the pistol back in my pocket, though I was careful to watch her every move. I've got to rest, I said honestly. I hurt all over, and I forgot to bring any pain pills with me. Sounds like a you problem, Selena said with a snort. I turned on her, trembling with anger and sputtering incoherently. You hit me with a van, I growled when I could finally speak. And I'd do it again, she said stubbornly. Would you? Yes, she said firmly. I would. Only this time you'd slow down a little and squish me into the safety rail instead of knocking me over, right? She laughed. You think I wanted to kill you, Aiden? She asked. I've had a dozen chances to, you know, and I haven't taken any of them. Why not? I demanded. She fell silent, looking out the back of the yacht toward the darkly crawling sea. No reason, she said with a shrug of her naked shoulders. Maybe I'm like a cat. I play with my food before I finish it off. Well, this time you played too long, didn't you? I said with a fierce, grim smile. This time the food played back. Now it's my turn to eat you. Selena hissed, biting her lower lip. She looked up at me with wide blue eyes. 
Promise? She asked with a grin. I sputtered again, my member straining against my trousers. I wanted nothing more than to throw the gun overboard and just take her again, sailing the yacht toward the horizon of here there be monsters for all eternity. But I couldn't do so. I had a duty to fulfill, a job to do. Giscard Epperer still lived. Finding out who Selina worked for possibly had nothing to do with it. Or maybe it did. Maybe her hint about an evil queen and iron towers was all bullshit just to send me on a wild goose chase. Just get back downstairs, I said, drawing the gun and pointing it at her. Selina sighed. I'm getting really tired of you pointing that thing at me, she said. Too fucking bad, I snapped. Now get moving. I shoved her roughly, and she took a few stumbling, barefooted steps before regaining her balance. She returned to the sofa, pointedly staring at me as she sat down on it. Then she turned her back to me, still gazing over her shoulder, and folded her arms behind her back. I moved forward to bind her again, not as severely this time since she would have to sleep that way. It was still a risk, but what choice did I have? Why not use chains? She asked as I wound the cord about her nude body. Because locks can be picked. And anyway, rope is superior. It conforms to the body quite... I cinched the rope tightly and she gasped. Tightly. So I see. What are you going to do now, Aiden? She teased, turning around and batting her lashes at me. Now that I'm all tied up and helpless. Sleep, I answered crossing her ankles and binding them to the sofa's armrest. I suggest you do the same. I'm not tired, she said. Good for you, I replied, staggering over to the chair and plopping down heavily. I took the gun and placed it on my lap, making sure the safety was on. Then I leaned back and closed my eyes. You don't look very comfortable, Aiden, she taunted. Why don't you come over here and sleep on the sofa? So you can bite through my jugular while I sleep? I asked, opening one eyelid. Besides, in our line of work, you have to learn to sleep anywhere you can. That's certainly true, she said. But I think you'd be a lot more comfortable over here. I sighed and rubbed my palms into my eye sockets. I felt so weary. Do I have to gag you? I asked. Oh, yes, please, she said eagerly. I like being your toy on a string. Jesus Christ, I said, leaping to my feet and heading out onto the deck. You drive me crazy, you know that? Selena leaned back on the sofa, an action that caused her breasts to dance enticingly. You know where to find me if you change your mind, she called after me as I left in a huff. I'm not going anywhere. I stood on the deck letting the wind cool my sweat and staring at the dark water. Casablanca's lights disappeared behind the low swells, only to reappear a moment later. I might have to put in if the wind didn't let up. The yacht wasn't designed to deal with a squall. Even though I wasn't in Selena's presence any longer, I still felt as if she'd cast a spell over me. I couldn't stop thinking about her, about us. It had felt so real, so right with her in my arms. Even when she had been my prisoner, our bodies had been honest with one another. I was tired of fighting the way I felt for her. Even though a voice screamed in the back of my mind not to go back, not to speak with her, I was compelled to return. She looked up at me as if she'd expected my return all along. Selena, I said, wiping a hand over my eyes. Did you ever have any feelings for me at all? Or was it just a mirage? A hallucination I only saw because I wanted to. I felt the rush, a cold tingle go through me at laying myself vulnerable and bare before her. Selena's grin vanished, replaced by a tormented frown. She shook her head slowly, voice breaking when she tried to speak. Aiden, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. You can't answer? I blurted. What do you mean you can't answer? It's a simple fucking question, Selena. Do you have feelings for me or not? Yes or no? She hung her head, glossy black hair hiding her features. I stood there for a moment, trembling like a leaf in the wind before I had to turn away. Fine. 
the hell with her anyway, I thought. I told myself the tears on my cheeks were from the stinging salt from the sea. I knew I was lying. Chapter 20 Selena. The constant slap of waves against the yacht's hull had an annoying cadence that synced itself with the throbbing pain in my arms. Aiden lay back on the chair, a washcloth over his eyes, pretending to sleep, but I knew better. I sat up, the leather upholstery creaking with the motion. The sofa remained glazed with sweat in the shape of my body. I glared over at Aiden and called to him. Aiden? Aiden? Maybe, I thought, he was still asleep. But then he twitched, a sound between a sigh and an annoyed groan escaping his lips. What? If you have to pee, I left your legs untied for a reason. You know where the bathroom is. It's not that. My fingers are numb. He pulled the rag off of his face and glared at me. I could see the healing bruises on his temple where Mike Belrock had nailed him with a right cross. Normally, people don't survive the Seven at all. So he was actually quite lucky. I still felt a surge of guilt upon seeing the blemish anew, though. I'm tired of your tricks, he said. I heaved an exasperated sigh. I'm not trying to trick you. My fingers are numb. Unless you want them to turn black and fall off, you need to do something about it. He sat up quickly, anger spurring his haste, but I didn't so much as flinch. I feared him, but not nearly as much as my stepmother. More so, I didn't fear him nearly as much as the thought that he believed I had been playing him about everything. The truth was, I'd fallen hard for the main assassin. I'd been wanting to tell him, desperately, but then he'd abducted me. Now, as his prisoner, how would he ever believe me? It would be just another trick, a way to get him to lower his guard so I could escape or finish him off. Aiden loomed over me and then reached down and grabbed my hair. I gasped in sudden agony, but didn't resist as he shoved my face between my knees. I felt him untying the knots, much to my surprise. He unwound the rope from my body and stood back, eyeing me warily. I gratefully rubbed my wrists, trying to work circulation back into my blood-starved digits. His manner softened, anxiety replaced in his gaze by sympathy and perhaps a little guilt. I can't just keep you tied up all the time, he said, more to himself than me. Aiden sagged to the chair and rubbed his eyes. So tired. You should sleep. You've been going through the ringer. And whose fault is that? He asked, lips peeled back around clenched teeth. You've been trying to kill me from the first moment we met. Don't try and act like you're concerned for my well-being now. I fell silent, because what could I really say to that? I had been trying to kill him. Just because I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger, metaphorically speaking, didn't change that fact. Aiden. I heaved a sigh and steepled my hands atop my bare knees. I wish things were different. Yeah, he said. Me too. That night on the pier, before your goon squad attacked, I thought... His voice trailed off, and he walked to the end of the aft deck, staring out over the undulating sea. It occurred to me that I had his back. Two quick steps and a shove, and he'd be overboard. I could then pilot the yacht away and leave him for the sharks. But I didn't do that. I couldn't. Once again, I had a chance to end his young life, and I didn't take it. I was trying to figure out if I were a cowardly fool, or just a lovesick one, when he spoke again. I thought we had a real connection, he said in a soft voice. I've never... I've never talked to a woman like that before. His muscled shoulders shook as he laughed bitterly, though I assumed the sardonic edge of his mirth was directed solely at himself. I've never talked to anyone like that before. Never let myself be vulnerable, I prompted. His head hung, 
Shoulders slumped as he nodded. My family will let you get away with a lot. Murder, extortion. Just so long as you don't show weakness. When they descend upon you like a pack of wild dogs. Surely you exaggerate, I said. Aiden turned back to face me again. His jaw set hard. No, he said. I don't. Not at all. Unless you're my whiny goth cousin, Derek, who gets away with literally everything. Derek is Lucian Maine's youngest son, yes? I asked. Aiden scowled. Find that out when you researched me? Yes, I said flatly. What else do you know about me? He stalked over to me, all muscle and sinew and angst-ridden anger. Come on, let's hear it. What's my favorite food? Favorite color? Preferred method of hanging the toilet paper roll. I arched my brows at him. Cannelloni, cyan green, and always draped forward. You gave your cousin William a black eye for doing the opposite. Aiden laughed miserably and plopped back down in the chair. The gun's handle was visibly bulging out of his pocket. He saw me staring at it and sneered. Go ahead. Take it. Shoot me in the head. I kind of don't give a damn right at the moment. Probably your best chance. If I wanted you dead, you'd be dead. Aiden lifted his gaze to mine. His eyes pierced me to my soul with accusation. You keep saying that. But if it's true, why am I still alive? Why didn't you take the shot? I closed my mouth and glared at him. This again. I wasn't going to let him pry it out of me under these circumstances. I knew he wouldn't believe me, no matter how much he wanted to. And anyway, you could ask anyone. I was one stubborn bitch. That's what I thought, he said. You still aren't talking. I decided to turn it around on him. Then you tell me, Aiden, I said stiffly. Why do you think I left you alive? Aiden sprang to his feet and paced away from me. He went to the aft deck again, but kept his stance angled, so he could see me out of his peripheral vision. I guessed I wouldn't be getting a second chance to push him overboard. That's what I can't figure out, he said, with a grim stoicism I doubted went beyond the surface. I guess. Maybe you need something from me. Something I can only provide while alive. His eyes widened, and he pointed a finger at me. When he spoke, his voice was filled with joyous revelation, like a freshly converted fundamentalist. Giscar Apurr, whoever you work for, the evil queen or whoever, wants him dead just as much as me. No, more than me, or you wouldn't have bothered keeping me alive. I burst into laughter unable to contain my mirth despite the gravity of my situation. Believe me, my st The evil queen doesn't give two shits about a small-time arms dealer like a purr. He's not even on her radar. Aiden laughed as well, a cold sound that caused my stomach to bottom out. Not bad. Not bad at all. A slip of the tongue. Please. A nice princess like you would never make a rookie error like that. Unless she's not a nice princess at all, but just a woman trying to get by as best she can. I didn't have any more choice than you as to which family I was born into, you know. You don't have a monopoly on suffering or struggling to live up to a parent's ideas. My father is dead, he snapped, face growing red. So is mine, I shouted back. My voice reverberated in the air for a split second, echoing off the cabin walls. Aiden's gaze softened, and he reached out as if to touch me. I lifted my head, struggling not to press my face into his palm. His hand hovered for a moment, and then his fingers clenched into a fist. How can I believe anything you say? He muttered. As long as I'm your prisoner, you can't, I replied. He glanced over at me sharply. The fuck is that supposed to mean? That I should just, what, let you go? If you want to hear the truth, yes, I said. 
Bullshit, he growled. The dark circles under his eyes made him seem all the graver. This is another one of your clever little tricks. Like planting the guy at the airport to tell me about your blues club. Actually, he followed you all the way from New York, I said. Sat two rows behind you on the flight across the pond. Eden laughed, and this time I think with genuine mirth. I'm not as observant as I thought, he said, sighing. But the point is moot, Selena. I couldn't believe you when you weren't my prisoner either. He shook his head before wiping a palm down his weary face. I can't believe you when you are my prisoner. I can't believe you if I set you free. I can't believe you. That's what it comes down to. You lie to me too, I growled, my belly filled with the hot boiling lead of anger. So don't act so fucking offended. Have you even been behind the wheel of a Formula One racer? A bunch of times, he said. I always prepare for every role I need to play, both on the job and not. I sighed, feeling a stab of sympathy for this man who is so much like me in so many ways. I know, Aiden. I know the life. I've lived it. It's easy to forget who you really are. I know who I am, he blurted. Do you? I asked sincerely. I think my frankness really took him aback because the anger drained from his face. What have you ever done for yourself? What decision have you ever made that wasn't dictated by Uncle Lucy? Don't call him that, he snapped, seething once more. You don't have the right. Fine. Lucian Maine. What does Aiden Maine do for himself? What choices does he make? I chose, he said coldly, to spend time with you. That had nothing to do with the job. Or so I thought. And look where that got me. Alone on a million dollar yacht with a hot, mostly naked chick? I asked with a grin. But he wasn't in the mood for jests, and my smile quickly faded. Stop it, he said. Just stop it. I'm going to get the truth out of you. Was it all a game? Or did you... Did you ever, even for a second, feel something genuine for me? So, it's all about your ego now? I leaned forward on the sofa and met his glare spark for spark. You don't even care about who I work for? His gaze dropped to the floor, and I could see the shame wash over his face. Then he snapped his eyes upward to bore into mine. Answer the question, he snarled. Did you ever have feelings for me? I didn't answer, which enraged him further. Aiden crossed the distance between us like a pouncing jungle cat. I was wholly unprepared. I'd fought off men much larger than me many times before but none of them were the expert fighter Aiden had proven himself to be. I was also taken off my guard, disarmed by my own emotions. He wound up sitting astride my chest, pinning my arms to my sides, and covering my mouth and nose with his hands. It's a technique called burking, an assassination method that has the advantage of leaving no marks, and the disadvantage of taking a very, very long time to work. Aiden's eyes were full of rage as his face leered an inch from my own. A line of spittle escaped his wide-open mouth and slid down my cheek. Answer me, he spat through gritted teeth. He released my face and I sucked in ragged gasps of air. Never, I said in a raspy voice. He went to burk me again, but I bit his finger. Cursing, he cuffed me across the cheek before smothering me again. My instincts kicked in, and I struggled for all I was worth, to no avail. I was pinned, the back of the sofa further restricting my movements. Aiden had one leg braced on the deck, adding leverage I couldn't hope to overcome. At some point, I lost consciousness. When I came to, it was to the sensation of cold seawater poured over my face. Selena, he called, his voice filled with panic. Selena, wake up. I opened my eyes, sputtering and drenched. 
I glared up at him, his face a mask of concern, and laughed. I knew you couldn't do it, I said with triumph. I knew you couldn't kill me. I'll damn sure kill you if you don't answer me, Aiden said, though he made no move toward me. I coughed and hacked out some seawater, and then looked back up at him. All right, I said. I'll tell you what you want to know, but it's going to cost you. He shook his head in disbelief. This again? Serve me a glass of chilled crystal and a nice lobster bisque, and I'll answer your question. Are you fucking serious? He blurted. As a heart attack, I said. I promise. Do this for me, and I'll stop playing games with you. You'll hear nothing but the God's honest truth from my lips. And while I put into port and go shopping, he'll just escape. Not if I go with you. He let out a sharp bark of laughter. Not going to happen, he said, shaking his head. I sighed and turned around to put my back to him. I crossed my arms behind my back and then glanced over my shoulder. Then do what you must. Chapter 21. Aiden. Wait, Selena said as I reached for the rope. Can I put on the coat first? I don't want to get chilly while you're gone. It's 80 degrees, I said. Now, I can deal with being hot, but being cold is deadly. She was obviously up to something. I checked the coat pockets thoroughly, and for the hundredth time found nothing in them but lint. I tossed it over to her and she donned the garment. I figured she must be trying to avoid rope burn. I guessed I could give her that much courtesy. Turn around, I snapped. She did so, her expression utterly inscrutable. Back to being an enigma. So be it, I thought. I was a bit kinder this time. I used a hitch around her waist to pin her wrists at the small of her back so as not to restrict her breathing. As I crossed and bound her ankles, she spoke. Thank you, she said. This is much more comfortable. I glanced sharply up at her face as I finished cinching the rope tightly. There are caveats, I said. Aren't there always, she asked. You may not like this much, I said, going to the kitchen area. I opened drawers, fighting the magnetic seals that kept them from banging open and shut during high seas. I found a clean washcloth with the main family crest embroidered upon it. I returned to the den, folding it up in my hands. Selena's blue-eyed gaze darted to the cloth in my hands. Then she looked up at me without a trace of fear and opened her mouth. In fact, I think I detected amusement in her gaze. What about this woman made me feel like a prisoner even when she was clearly my captive? Carefully, I stuffed the rag into her mouth. I'd folded it thickly enough that it wouldn't be able to slide down her throat and choke her in my absence. I used my necktie to secure the rag in place, double knotting it behind her head. While she'd been amused by my gagging her, she straight up laughed when I blindfolded her with the belt from her coat. Then I left her there on the sofa and went to the bridge. I knew a place not far from Casablanca where I could find the requested items, Agadir. It was a tourist trap. A place for rich Euros to go lounge on the beach without having to experience any local culture, even by accident. But being a tourist trap, I knew there was a goddamn bottle of Cristal somewhere in the city limits, not to mention lobster. I put the yacht into a dock where the firm held sway. The dockmaster would ask no questions, charge no fees, and most importantly, file no paperwork pertaining to the Nautilus or me. After I tied up, I thumped back down the steps to the main deck as the morning sun rose cheerful and fat above Agadir's low skyline. I knelt down next to Selena and nested my hand on her shoulder. Do you need to use the bathroom? She shook her head, mouth working around the rag stuffed inside of it. I want you to know I believe there's a 75% chance you won't be here when I get back, I said. She said something, muffled by the washcloth. I think it was along the lines of how she wasn't going to go anywhere in her current condition. You're very clever, I replied with a sigh. 
I found it a bit easier to be vulnerable with her when she couldn't see me. Selena, in case you're not here when I get back, I just wanted to... I just wanted to say that, well, I'm glad to have known you. In another life, maybe we could have had something together. But not this one. Not this life. I moved in and kissed her on the top of the head. In sudden relief, she pressed her face against mine, making cooing sounds behind the gag. I took her in my arms and kissed her lips as best I could. Farewell, I said, pulling away before I lost my nerve. It took everything I had to go up to the dock and step onto the sun-warmed wood. All I wanted to do was return to her and confess my true feelings. I blinked away bitter tears as I passed the stoically silent dockmaster. He didn't even look my way, so strong was his discipline. I had to be the same way. It would never work out between me and Selena. Even if she didn't work for Emperor, she definitely didn't work for the firm. Uncle Lucy was indulgent at times, but only to a point. On the way to get her bottle of champagne, I ran a number of fantasy scenarios in my mind. I found myself growing increasingly anxious to hear her answer. What if she said no? She'd never had feelings for me at all. Was I prepared to deal with that? I decided that I was, in fact. In many ways, that would be the preferable outcome. Far worse would be if she said yes. That would leave me as bound and helpless in a figurative sense as she was in the literal. Because I knew if Selena told me she did care for me, I'd never be able to leave her behind. I'd throw it all away. My position at the firm, my money, all the trappings and accoutrements of my station. Just to be with her. Schrodinger's question. Right now, Selena both loved and didn't love me. What would my world look like once I knew the answer? I stopped in a little street bistro, the smell of crawler and coffee strong in the morning wind. They weren't serving alcohol yet, but a $500 bill U.S. loosened their morals nicely. I soon left the bistro carrying a bottle of Cristal, which had cost me much more than it was worth, in addition to the 500 in a cold bag, along with a paper sack full of the deep-fried, sugar-coated confections that were the house specialty. With a heavy heart and light wallet, I made for a seafood restaurant on the coast. Hopefully they would have lobster. It wasn't out of season, but I had no idea if it would be available at such a tiny, hole-in-the-wall restaurant. I found the establishment to be far more accommodating than the bistro. They were willing to make the dish, even though it wasn't their policy for such cuisine during the breakfast hours, and even gave me a nice little steamer basket to keep it warm. Since I was already on the coast, I elected to walk down the beach rather than go back into town. The docks were only a half mile away, just visible through the haze spawned by late morning heat. I walked past a gaggle of sunbathers, most of them foreign, splayed like well-oiled slugs in the sun. It was hard not to feel contempt for them. With the history and rich culture of Casablanca not far away, they chose to come to Agadir instead for just the right milk toast experience. The beach terminated in a rocky slope that spilled toward the sea, creating a natural barrier. I walked over the narrow strip of wet sand that separated it from the water. My pace quickened as I dashed away from the encroaching surf and made it to the safety of another, coarser beachhead. The rocky slope grew steeper there, more severe, effectively cutting me off from the sight of the popular sandy beach and the village proper. I wasn't worried. After all, no one was around. No one except for the professor, sitting under an umbrella dressed like a Republican on vacation with a loud Hawaiian shirt and cargo shorts, his fat hairy feet stuffed into designer sandals. He waved cheerfully at me. I strode toward him, reaching into my shirt for my holstered pistol. I wouldn't do that, professor said, holding up a cautionary hand. Why not? I asked, pausing mid-move. A gout of sand shot up near my feet, followed by another on the opposite side. The shots continued until I'd been surrounded by a ring of disturbed sand. The damned cowardly sniper was back. I tried to guess where he was shooting from while Professor laughed. Why the stupid games? You could just shoot me. Yes, we could. 
Witten we wouldn't find our friend. What have you done with her, please? I remained silent and Professor sighed. Unfortunate. I had hoped you could be civil about this and die with some dignity. Not to mention painlessly. But now your demise will be slow, brutal, and agonizing. I reached for the gun, but another spout of sand popped up much closer than the last ones had. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Professor said, waggling his finger as if addressing a naughty child. Use your left hand and extract the gun, and if your finger touches the trigger, we'll have to find our friend the old-fashioned way. I reached in as directed, awkwardly reaching across my body. Truth to tell, I'm almost as good a shot with my left hand as my right. Uncle Lucy had insisted I train to shoot with both hands, but I knew that my only chance of getting out alive was to play the professor's game. I tossed the gun into the sand at his feet, and he eagerly picked it up, stowing it in his cooler. Did you just put my gun on top of your baloney? I asked incredulously. So says the hitman carrying wine, donuts, and lobster soup, Professor said. It's champagne, actually, I said, setting my bundles down. How are we going to do this? We? I'm not lifting another finger, my boy. It seems that two of our number have developed a certain grudge against you. The sound of a rock tumbling down the slope drew my gaze a short distance up the beach. Oh, come on, I said with a grin as Punchy and Kiki picked their way down the slope. Aren't you guys tired of getting your asses kicked? Punchy sneered, kicking off his sandals and moving toward me. His muscled chest gleamed with sweat in the sun and I realized where I'd seen him before. Hey, I know you. Mike Bellrock, right? Former WBVA heavyweight champion? You got me confused with someone else, white boy, he said, grinning with a mouth full of white teeth. Kicky guy frowned, looking between us, pretty much confirming my suspicions. No, I don't, I said. You know I'll never talk. Might as well have your shooty sniper friend finish me off. Nah, Punchy said. This is personal. Be careful, you two, Professor called while popping the top off of the champagne. The prick. Aiden Maine is a wellspring of information. Be sure not to dry him up with excessive brutality. Yeah, we got you, wordy man, Kiki Guy said in heavily accented English. His face had yet to fully heal, adding pathos to his menacing gaze. Bellrock held his hands up in a traditional boxer stance and moved in. Kiki was more cautious, trying to circle around and flank me. I backed away, wondering if I could make a run for it. The sniper was good, highly skilled. I'd be signing my own death warrant. I decided he was probably on a boat out to sea. Many bobbed upon the water. If he'd been stationed on the rocky cliff, his shots would have angled down. That didn't bode well for me. I couldn't rely on the natural terrain for cover. Kiki guy managed to clip me behind the knee with a shin kick. It forced me to one knee, where I scooped up a handful of the gritty sand as I somersaulted back to my feet. I cast the sand into Belrock's eyes and caught Kiki guy's leg under my armpit, taking a shuddering impact to my ribcage. The fight was on, and I knew this time I wouldn't get lucky. As battered and weary as I was, I didn't stand a chance. My thoughts weren't of my own safety. Instead, the only thing going through my mind was I would never see Selena again. Chapter 22 Selena I waited for several minutes after the sound of Aiden's footfalls dwindled into the distance before springing into action. My heart had been pounding when he had checked the coat but hadn't found the hidden switchblade sewn into the lining. I had to reach it, but first I needed to be able to see it. Leaning back on the sofa, I rubbed my face and head against the leather upholstery until the blindfold slipped down to hang slack about my neck. Blinking in the suddenly bright light, I grunted behind my gag as I flopped onto the deck so I'd have more room to maneuver. 
I soon found that even though I'd been bound in a more comfortable tie, that didn't mean escape would be easy. It took a great deal of straining, pushing my aching muscle and sinew to the limit, in order to get my fingers onto the hidden blade. Then I had to extract it. The minutes wore on and on, sweat breaking out on my body as I strained to get free. How long would Aiden be gone? Could I hope for an entire hour? Would that be enough time? It didn't seem like it, which filled me with panic. I decided that even if I did really love Aiden, a romance between us would never work. The evil queen Moira would never relent in her pursuit of vengeance and the restoration of her slighted reputation. I'd just get both of us killed. And I wasn't ready to die. Not yet. Like it or not, I had to finish the job, even if it broke my heart. And it did break my heart, no question of it. But in the back of my mind, I considered it somehow better if I were the one to do the deed personally. It would bring a kind of closure to our association not possible if one of the Seven polished him off before I got the chance. Speaking of the Seven, where the hell were they when I got kidnapped by Aiden? That's loyalty for you, I suppose. Not that they were really loyal to me, despite our having worked together nearly 70 times in the past. Their loyalty belonged solely to Moira. At last, I got the switchblade out of the hidden pocket to bounce off the deck, a short distance away. Scooting on my butt, nostrils flaring as I drew in inadequate breaths, I scraped it into my grasp. The blade snicked free, and I used it to sever the bindings on my wrists. I groaned in relief as my hands came free at last. Jesus Christ, what an ordeal. I used the knife, pressing the cold flat of the blade against my cheek to sever the necktie holding the rag in. Then I extracted the saliva-sodden mass and spat it onto the floor. Staggering to my feet, I went directly to the kitchen and drank water directly from the tap. Then I let it spill all over my face and head, washing the salt out of my hair as best I could. A grin spread over my cracked lips. Time to see what kind of weapons he had on the yacht. Of course, he didn't just have guns hanging on the walls. It took a bit of searching, and the whole time I peeked under shelves and checked walls for hidden compartments, I wondered if I would really be able to kill him if it came to that. I hoped I would be able to, given that our association had been doomed from the start. I crouched down beside a low compartment filled with fishing rods secured with zip ties to the wall. Tapping with my knuckles, I felt a surge of elation when a hollow sound answered back. I pried the boards up with my fingernails, finding a hidden compartment. Oh, come to mama, I said in a hushed whisper, extracting an Italian-made sniper rifle. One of the fancy ones, with a computer-assisted scope, night vision, and all of the tricks and trappings. A gun like this went for half a mil on the black market if you were lucky enough to find one in the first place. I found ammo in the hold as well, jamming it into my coat pockets. Rummaging around, I found a six-shot revolver. Not the most accurate of pistols, but it wasn't like I could be choosy. I also found a burner cell phone, with an activation card taped around it. I claimed this as well, just in case I lost my nerve and couldn't finish Aiden off and had to call for help. Then I vaulted off the yacht, feeling mixed emotions as I left it behind. On one hand, I had feared I'd never get off of it alive. But on the other, it meant leaving Aiden behind symbolically. As a testament to how hidebound I felt to my stepmother. I kept walking and didn't look back. It will be better this way, I thought. A lot less pain. Kind of like ripping a bandage off a seeping wound quickly rather than slowly. The dried blood cracking and peeling away living tissue as it went. The rifle represented a problem. I couldn't just walk around with it over my shoulder, but I had no way to conceal it. I decided I would head down the beach a bit, find a good spot, and snipe out Aiden when he returned with the champagne and lobster bisque. My pace slowed. 
But if I did this, then I'd never give Aiden his answer. Why was it so important that he know my true feelings anyway? If one or both of us was going to die. Madness. I forced myself to keep walking. Past the Dockmaster, who stared in open-mouthed shock at the gun over my shoulder. Shh, I said. Uncle Lucy appreciates your continued silence. I wasn't sure if it would work or not. My heart hammering in my chest as I continued on down the dock and stepped onto the beach. But as my toes dug through the gritty sand, no shots tore through my vulnerable back. Apparently, my bluff had worked. My way was soon blocked by a rocky, ancient landslide, long since worn down by the waves. I picked my way up and over, cursing my bare feet when I stubbed a toe. But I ignored the pain, intent upon reaching the top. It had the right elevation to get a clear shot at the docks. Aiden would be a sitting duck. But would I be able to pull the trigger this time? I honestly didn't know. As I looked for a place to set up shop, so to speak, I became aware of a sound which reached above the din of crashing surf and calling seabirds. A sort of distant grunt of exertion or pain. Whipping my head around, I soon found the source. A group of blurry figures engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Too large and one small. It had to be Aiden, harried by Balrog and Sajay from the looks of it. A peek through my scope confirmed it, and I also spotted Professor lounging on the beach, drinking my bottle of Crystal. What a prick. Well, this was it. When Aiden was distracted, I could take my time lining up a shot. If I wished it, Aiden was as good as dead. I settled in, lying painfully on my belly across hard, uneven stones, bracing the rifle in a convenient niche studded with fossilized coral. I took aim once again, adjusting the zoom until I could make out Aiden's features. His face bore an expression equal parts fear and determination. Despite his injuries, and the two massive men swarming all over him, he managed to give better than he got. Balrock and Sajay were tough customers, and highly trained, but they just weren't as fast. Plus, Aiden didn't have to lug around all that extra muscle weight. In order to be sure, I would have to shoot Aiden myself. He'd already escaped from the Seven twice now, albeit with some help from me on the second occasion. I had to take the shot. I curled my finger around the trigger, putting my crosshairs right between his eyes. All I had to do was squeeze. The wind was at a mere two knots, requiring only a slight adjustment in my aim. All I had to do was squeeze, and Aiden Maine would be a memory, washed away by the tide like a sandcastle. But I couldn't make myself do it. Aiden and I had a connection. A rare kind of chemistry I'd never experienced before, and couldn't hope to again. I was never naive enough to believe in the concept of soulmates, but I did know Aiden had cast a spell on me. Would it be broken by his death? Or would I meander for the rest of my life, a prisoner of what might have been and regrets? I spied Miles, my sniper, out on a skiff maybe a thousand yards offshore. I swung my aim around to him, and then moved my crosshairs from his head to the longest gun braced against his shoulder. Yes, Miles was a good sniper. I should know. I taught him everything he knew. I took aim and fired. The gun flew from his grasp, spiraling into the water and disappearing beneath the waves. Then I turned back to the fight on the beach. Aiden had felled Sajay somehow, and had Balrock on the ropes, metaphorically speaking, as they were on a beach. I felt a surge of pride and hope when Aiden managed to slide an uppercut through Balrock's defenses and knock him senseless and sprawling in the sand. Professor stood in alarm, talking on his cell phone as Aiden approached. No doubt he was calling Miles, I thought with a grin. But to my horror, I found that he wasn't. A man reared up out of the sand, his nerve-damaged face contorted into a grim mask. 
The mirror. My blood ran cold. That bitch, Moira. She sent the mirror. Remember how I taught Miles everything that he knew? Well, the mirror taught me. And not just about shooting. He was the top assassin in the game in his heyday. Until he took a round in the noggin and it scrambled his neurology. Now, he had a condition where he mimicked the facial expressions of those he encountered. It's more than a little unsettling, and pure torment for him. He responded to the tragedy by becoming more ruthless than ever before. Aiden didn't stand a chance against him, and I knew it. As Aiden backhanded Professor to the sand, the mirror pointed his pistol. I didn't think. Just took aim and fired. The round took the mirror in his chest, knocking him prone, but his shot still fired. Aiden cried out silently in my scope, falling to the sand with a bleeding blotch on his abdomen. The mirror lay prone and still. It was too much to hope he was dead. But now, I just betrayed Moira, betrayed my whole team. In a panic, I threw the rifle in the scene and ran hard back to the yacht. Aiden was hurt, but he was still moving. The bullet took him in the left side of his abdomen, nowhere near the aorta. He would probably make it back. Probably. I waited on the docks until I just saw him coming around the bend, staggering with his face contorted in pain. Then I rushed to the yacht and dove onto the sofa. Hastily, I stuffed the rag back into my mouth, tied it in place with his necktie, and wound the cord around my waist. Then I leaned back against the sofa, with my hands tucked behind my back, and waited. I clutched a gun in my right hand, the six-shot revolver. When Aiden returned, I would have a choice. Finish him off and live, or condemn us both to death. I was terrified to realize I didn't know which decision I would make. Chapter 23. Aiden. Confused, scared, and bleeding, I stumbled along the beach with one hand clasped to my side. I could feel the bullet wedged between my ribs. I'd gotten lucky. Damn lucky. I was going to die on that beach. I knew it as soon as I saw the professor. But there I was, very much alive and in unspeakable pain. I cast glances offshore, wondering why the shooty sniper hadn't finished me off yet. Maybe the sea got too rough and he couldn't get a clear shot. Or more likely, he had chosen to vacate the area because bystanders had laid eyes on him. Whatever the case, I had to keep moving. My body ached and bled from half a dozen new wounds earned in my brutal fight with Bell Rock and Kiki. But I dragged myself through the sand. Each aching, throbbing step brought me closer to Selena. I had to reach the yacht and untie her before I lost consciousness. She would die a lingering, horrid death if I did not, dehydrating in the Moroccan sun. When my feet touched the wooden planks, the dockmaster rushed out to help me, but I waved him off. There's three men unconscious on the beach. Take care of them. The old salt's eyes went wide. Trey, eh? Good thing you had backup. I glared at him in confusion. You? I blurted weakly. My vision grew hazy and I swayed on my feet. Steady now, he said, bracing me with a hand on my bicep. You need a doctor. I need you to obey, I hissed, grabbing his shirt in my sweating grasp and dragging his face close enough our noses touched. Take care of those three, now. He nodded, taking a shotgun out of his guard station and plodding down the beach. He cast several glances over his shoulder, but I made certain to stare him down until I was convinced he would obey. Then I staggered to the yacht. My legs gave out, and I collapsed onto the sun-drenched timbers, groaning in agony. If not for Selena, I'd have lain there until I bled out. I was that hopeless, that far gone into the shadowy realm between life and death. But the thought of her, trussed up like a pig in the dark cabin, gave me the strength to rise again. I stumbled up the gangplank, falling again halfway. I couldn't rise any longer. My strength was gone. 
so I crawled up the rest of the gangplank and onto the deck. I dragged myself to the aft deck and entered the cabin from the rear. My vision was sketchy, darkness closing in on the edges until I could only see out of a pinprick in the middle. I felt more than saw Selena on the sofa. She managed to get her ankles free, but still sat with her hands bound behind her. I struggled up onto the sofa next to her with the intent of untying her hands, but I blacked out. I must have finished the job somehow, because when I came to a bit later, she was free, kneeling on the floor and cradling my head on her lap. I looked up at her lovely snow-white face, marked by red indentations from the tight gag. I reached up and brushed my fingers over the marks, gasping out an apology. Sorry. Aiden, don't try to talk. You've lost a lot of blood. Have to... have to go, I said. Take the yacht. Don't need it anymore. Aiden, she said, tears rolling down her cheeks. They dripped warm onto my own face. I couldn't help but smile. Don't die. No choice, I rasped. Just had to get back. Set you loose. You idiot, she said, shaking her head. Just shut up. I grimaced with pain, summoning up the strength to talk unbroken for the last time. Answer my question. Did you ever care for me at all? She sobbed heavily, but sort of laughed, too. Really? Now? She shook her head. I'm not going to answer that. Dying, I said, the darkness encroaching on my vision again. Well, if you want my answer, you're going to have to live, she said firmly. Rest now. I've got you, Aiden. I've got you. Her fingers brushed softly through my hair, and then all went black. I wasn't scared, just disappointed. I really wanted to know if she felt the same way for me as I did for her. But the darkness proved not to be final. I became aware again some time later, much later, judging from the twinkling stars viewed out the porthole. I stirred, finding myself on the sofa, my clothes removed and my wounds bandaged. I hissed at the pain in my side, struggling to sit up. I failed, flopping back down. My gaze snapped over to the IV sticking out of my arm, the rubber tube snaking up to a bag of mostly empty plasma. I stared at the red fluid, the bag sucked in by vacuum above the blot. Who had saved me? Doc? It had to have been. Who else? But how did he know where to find me? Selena. She must have told him. But why? I was more confused than ever. Selena had the perfect chance to kill me while I lay there on the deck, bleeding out. Shit. All she had to do was watch and wait. You're awake. I snapped my gaze over to see Selena, wearing a black dress left behind by one of my dates two years ago, her hands at her ample hips. She tisked as I tried to sit up again. Take it easy, she said, pushing me back down. You lost a lot of blood, and I wouldn't trust my stitches that much. I looked down at my side and saw the bandage. Then I lifted my gaze to her face. The bullet? She grinned and dug in her pocket holding it out in the palm of her hand. I gingerly took it with trembling fingers. A small caliber round, but that didn't mean it wasn't lethal. A small round would bounce around inside your body, causing all kinds of havoc. I was lucky it had lodged in my ribs. Took me a while to dig it out. I'm no surgeon, but I did the best I could. You're going to have an ugly scar, I'm afraid. I leaned back down onto the sofa and stared at her. From the slap of the waves against the yacht's hull, I figured we were out at sea again. Why? Because you're going to have a bad scar? No. Not why are you afraid. Why did you do all of this? Save me. Selena sighed and cast her blue-eyed gaze to the deck. I... I don't know if I'm ready to answer that right now, she said. But what really matters is that I did save you. Not to me. I want to know why. You're so fucking stubborn, she said, leaping to her feet. Now it was her turn to walk to the aft deck and stare out at the Atlantic. 
We've been doing this dance for a day and a night, Aiden. Let it rest for now. She turned back to me and crossed her arms over her chest. Are you thirsty? She asked. Yes, I admitted. She went to the kitchen and retrieved a bottle of water from the magnetically secured fridge. Shaking it up to break loose the clumps of ice that had formed within, she returned to my side and unscrewed the cap. Selena held the nozzle to my lips, and I gratefully drank the ice-cold water, feeling it slide down my throat and cool me from the inside. Thank you, I said. You won't answer why you saved me, so I'll ask you something more practical. Are we safe? No, she said flatly. I mean, yes, we are, for now, but I've missed my deadline. What deadline? Selena arched an eyebrow and looked at me as if I were an idiot. Oh, I said, laying my head back down. By refusing to kill me, you've signed my death warrant, she said with a chuckle. Yeah, or maybe it got signed a long time ago and it's just now come down the pike. I don't know. Who do you work for? I blurted. Who paid you to kill me? Selena soaked a rag in the ice water and then laid it over my forehead. Then she rose to her feet and resettled at the end of the sofa. Moira Yeltsin, she said without much emotion. Moira Yeltsin? I sputtered. You weren't kidding when you said you worked for an evil queen. Even we won't do business with that psychopath. Which was enough for her to hold a grudge as it was, Selena said. But then you went and killed a good friend of hers. A lover. I gasped with sudden realization. Galagos. She nodded grimly. Selena drew her knees up and rested her chin on them, rocking back and forth softly. She's as ruthless as you've heard. If anything, the stories downplay her cruelty. How'd you wind up working for her in the first place? Selena looked away over the aft deck at the sea. Selena... The time for secrets was about 12 hours ago. Talk to me, please. I think the pleading note in my tone stirred her to speak again. She's my... my stepmother, she said. Holy shit, I blurted, sitting bolt upright. You're Vladimir Yeltsin's kid. My voice trailed off as pain exploded in my side. Selena glared at me as I lowered myself back to the sofa. Stop being an idiot, she said. If you bust the stitches I worked so hard on, you'll what? Kill me? I asked. We stared at each other for a moment and then shared a laugh. Mine was more of a chuckle because it hurt to expand my ribs, but we shared it just the same. So what's your plan? I asked. What makes you think I have a plan? She replied. Well, I'm still alive and so are you. I assume your intention is to keep us that way. She nodded. If we work together, we might be able to take Moira down before she can do the same to us. Or we could just run, I said suddenly. You and me, leave all of this behind. I was dead serious. She looked at me, a grave expression on her lovely countenance. I think you might mean that, she said in awe. I do. Well, lucky for us, I'm more sensible. There's nowhere we can run far enough or fast enough to escape her wrath. Besides, I don't want to live the rest of my life looking over my shoulder. That's not living at all. I had to agree. All right, I said. So we take her out, permanently. You're sure you can bring yourself to kill your own mother, though? Stepmother. And I've been dreaming of putting a bullet in that cunt for years. I flinched, she smiled, and for a moment I had a sensation everything would work out, but I had to press on. Selena, I said softly. Yes, Aiden, she replied in a voice barely above a whisper. What happens if we do kill her? I mean, where will you go? What will you do? Selena smiled sadly and tousled my hair. Her lips were soft against my forehead as she removed the rag and kissed me. Sleep. Recover. I need you at full strength if we're going to have a snowball's chance in hell of succeeding. I don't want to sleep, I said groggily, falling asleep. The last thing I heard before I fell unconscious was her sweet voice saying, 
When she's cold in the ground, I'll give you my answer. I think I smiled at the last moment, but I can't be sure. Chapter 24 Selena Aiden slept for almost 15 hours straight, only rising once to use the lavatory before stumbling back into the goose-down mattress in the yacht's captain cabin. I stood guard over him, piloting the yacht further north along the African coastline, until I reached Tanger Med. It was the largest port city on the African Mediterranean coast, and its sprawling nature made it a good place to hide out. I put into a small dock I would, under normal circumstances, not be caught dead at. That's because it was owned, albeit via proxy, by the Main Brothers LLC. It was essentially Aiden's turf, which I believed would keep the Seven and the Mirror at bay, at least temporarily. Aiden stirred, coming up to the bridge in just his boxers as I shut down the engines. Where are we? He asked, standing straighter than I'd seen in days. I darted my gaze over to him and reached up to check his bandage. He grimaced, but made no sound as I peeled the nonstick pad away from the bullet wound. Hang her mad, I said. He peered out the window and nodded. I thought it seemed familiar, he said. How long have I been out? Most of the day, I replied. The sun sat low and fat on the horizon, preparing to sink into the depths of the sea. How do you feel? Better, he replied. Aiden's lips twitched. We were still navigating this new territory where we were no longer enemies, but not yet... What? Friends? Lovers? Something more? When the silence grew unbearable, I took the plunge and shattered it. Are you hungry? I asked. Starving, he replied. Good. My lips stretched into a grin. Because you still owe me lobster beesk and cristal. He arched a brow, and then a fluttering chuckle escaped his lips. Aiden winced, his side troubling him, though he made no verbal acknowledgement of his pain. So, the deal is still on? He asked with a sudden intense light in his eyes. The deal? I asked coyly. I feed you and give you $3,000 a bottle of champagne, and you answer my question. Which one? Selena, he sighed. You know the one. Don't play games. Oh, Aiden, I said, shaking my head sadly. It's all a game. His eyes narrowed, and he turned away to look over the aft deck and the sea. Now, for me, it isn't. I looked at his broad back his muscles playing beneath his skin as he battled tension and his own desires. Taking pity, I stood up and embraced him from behind. His body stiffened taut as a bowstring, as I stroked my fingers over the hard knots of muscle in his abdomen. Not for me either, I said. I'll break the deal. I'll give you what you want. Yes, I had feelings for you. Genuine feelings directly in conflict with what my duties demanded. Is that what you wanted to hear? His back swelled against my face as he inhaled deeply. Is it the truth? He asked, his voice trembling with trepidation. Yes, I said without hesitation. It's the truth. Then it's what I wanted to hear, and what I'd hoped to hear all in one. He clasped his hand over one I held over his belly. Our fingers intertwined. I like it when you touch me. Aiden, I said with a sigh. Don't. Don't what? He asked. He gently turned around in my embrace, taking me in his own arms as well. Aiden's hand lifted and stroked across my cheek, gently this time. Don't what? Don't make me... I don't know. Feel... Feel what? I broke loose of his grasp angrily and stared out over the docks. It seemed too cheerful, too tranquil a setting for such a heavy subject. 
feel things that I'm not supposed to feel, I said in a soft voice. That I'm not allowed to feel. He came up behind me, standing so close I could feel his breath, but eschewed physical contact for the moment. Maybe, he said softly and then cleared his throat. Maybe we both should stop worrying about what other people think and say we're allowed or supposed to feel. And what do you feel, Aiden? I replied, unable to turn and face him as I blinked rapidly, trying to will my eyes not to tear up. I feel as if I've known you my whole life, instead of merely a week, he replied. I feel as if our connection goes beyond physical pleasure, or even the joy of conversation. There's a connection here, isn't there? Or am I imagining it? You'll have to be more specific, I replied stiffly. I, we both have a connection to all of our clients, don't we? Yes, he said softly. But not like this. Not this profound. I think... No. Aiden's voice grew firm with conviction. I know I love you. A tear slipped down my cheek and I held onto the rail so I wouldn't collapse. Don't say things like that unless... I sniffed. Unless... My voice broke again. Unless what? He asked, very close to me, his lips a few inches from my ears. Unless you really mean it, I said in a rush. I mean it, he said, as simply as if he'd said the sky was blue and the ocean wet. I love you, Selena. I've never felt this way before, but I know what it is. You've climbed into my soul and made a nest of it. I couldn't evict you if I tried. And I don't want to try. His hands were on my arms, softly squeezing, comforting, soothing. I sighed, arching my head back. His lips brushed my ear with the motion, and goose pimples rose on my skin. I love you, I said. I don't have any right to, considering I was trying to kill you. But I do. Well, Selena, he said with a light chuckle. You weren't trying very hard, or I wouldn't still be alive. I laughed and reached back over my chest to caress his cheek. Yes, I suppose I've been behaving like a very poor assassin. The worst in the world. I felt the smooth contours of his face, the light stubble that had sprouted during his long slumber. And you, quite frankly, are the world's worst interrogator. I mean... Electrostim? I got stung by a tarantula hawk wasp in the Mojave Desert once. After that, nothing else seems as bad. Yes, well, he sighed. I didn't really want to hurt you. I'm sorry I did. I'm not, I said. I could see it in your eyes then, that you cared for me. Loved me. He kissed me tenderly on my neck and I melted into him. Aiden's hand slipped around my waist, and I giggled. What? he asked, pausing in his ministrations. You really need a shower, I said. He chuckled softly. So do you. Well, I had been sitting on a sofa sweating for two days, I supposed. We headed down to the lower deck and into the small but elegant shower. Fresh water. Soft water which is kind of hard to get clean in, sprayed over our naked bodies. I took a pink loofah, squirted a dollop of foamy body wash onto it, and rubbed it across his muscled torso. Aiden smiled gently, his hand on my shoulder as I swished and swirled froth over his abdomen, and then moved further down to lather up his crotch. I washed his cock and balls with exquisite attention to detail peeling back the circumcised remnants of foreskin to reach every nook and cranny. Once he was clean, I figured I was already on my knees, so why not? I opened my mouth and took the head of his semi-flaccid member inside. My tongue swished around the underside, my lips enveloping the warmth. Aiden gasped, a hand reflexively going to the top of my head. I reached up and caressed his balls with my free hand as I gently stroked his shaft. 
I moaned around his member, a tingle arcing through my clitoris just at the thought and act of pleasing him. I so wanted to please him, now that we'd been honest about our feelings. I wanted to give him some pleasure of the peaceful bliss I felt in his arms, even when I'd been restrained, his ostensible captive. Through my attentions, he swiftly grew erect, his pulsing rod firmer and firmer in my grip and my mouth. As the water sluiced down over our bodies, washing away the stain of sweat and guilt, shame and regret, I popped his member out of my mouth. Instantly, I kissed the underside of his shaft, tongue tracing over the big, pulsating veins I found there, seeking to learn his anatomy as intimately as I knew my own. Selena, he gasped, my name loaded with emotion brimming from his lips. I pressed my face against his weapon, rubbing all over it, worshipping his body. Moving down further, I licked his soap-smelling testicles with eager aplomb, encouraged by his moans and grunts of pleasure. Now he was my prisoner, a prisoner of passion. I controlled him, pushed him further to the edge of a climax while letting him linger on the precipice. My eyes flashed up to his face, to find Aiden with his eyes squeezed shut, mouth drawn open, chest heaving as he rode the waves of my attentions. I took his head inside my mouth, sucking hard. The sudden intensity caused Aiden to stiffen, his hand gripping the back of my head, fingers entangled with my wet hair. I opened my jaw wide and gobbled down his entire length, feeling the bulbous head slide against the back of my throat. I gagged a bit but didn't stop, nor even slow down. Aiden braced his back against the shower wall, feet sliding on the slick, tiled surface as I pumped my head up and down on him. My hand continued to toy with his balls, fondling them, stretching them, exulting in the sensation of holding such an intimate body part literally in my palm. Figuratively, I held Aiden's entirety in my hand. His body, his heart, his soul. I felt more connected to him in that exact moment than I had ever felt connected to anyone ever. It was as if we were two bodies sharing one mingled soul, two candles placed wick to wick to join into a single pure flame. Selena, he gasped. I'm... I'm about to... If he expected to warn me so I could remove my mouth from his body, he was mistaken. I redoubled my efforts, gurgling and gagging on his cock until he cried out and pulsed a stream of sticky seed into me. Aiden moved as if to withdraw himself from my mouth, but I wrapped my arms around his body and clutched his firm, sexy ass, holding him in place as he drained down my throat. I'm proud that I swallowed every drop, wasting none of what he gave to me. Our eyes met, Aiden's blue gaze filled with a mix of love, adoration, and more than a little fear. I don't think he feared me, but rather that we would be driven apart by time or circumstance. I smiled and squeezed his butt again before giving it a playful spank. But when I rose and made as if to shut off the water, he grasped my wrist in his hand. Not so fast, he said with a smile. You're still dirty. Such a dirty, dirty girl. Yes, I am, Aiden. I thought happily. Yes, I am. Chapter 25 Aiden Selena's red lips parted in a light smile as I took her other wrist in my grasp. Then I shoved her arms over her head, pinning them against the tiled wall behind her back. I moved in and kissed her lips deeply, not minding one bit that she just swallowed my hot load. I'd never deigned to kiss a woman who had just gone down on me before, but with Selena, it didn't seem gross or unnatural. We should share everything, I decided. Love, hope, fear, and things more physical, primal. I released my love's wrists and pulled away. Selena reached out as if to grasp me, perhaps to pull me back into her embrace, but I snapped my hands back around her wrists and firmly pinned them back to the wall. 
Stay put, I growled. You're in serious need of a cleaning, dirty girl. Ooh, she said, biting her lower lip. Are you going to wash me, Aiden? Yes, I said, retrieving the loofah and refreshing its payload of floral-smelling suds. I ran it across her breasts, gently, so as not to irritate her lovely skin with the textured surface. Her breasts deformed and quivered under my attentions, delightfully supple and pliant. I enjoyed the sight of the film of clingy foam, which did little to hide her flesh from my eyes. In fact, it seemed less a barrier and more an invitation to explore, to see what lay beneath. Selena's eyes fluttered closed. She arched her spine, thrusting her bottom and shoulder blades against the shower wall, tilting her head back and exulting in my attention. I soaked up her breasts one final time before sweeping the loofah over her abdomen. I swirled patterns about her cute navel, her belly pure and white as the driven snow. Down further I went, pressing on the insides of her thighs until she willingly parted them without being told. Still, I needed more access. Spread your legs, I growled. Selena moaned softly and did as she was told. Her lovely twat revealed itself to me between the ivory pillars of her thighs. Selena's outer lips had swollen, engorged with desire, parting enough that I could see the pinkness contained within their sensual embrace. Her clitoris quivered like a pinkish-purple leaf on a vine, enticing me to pay it the most careful and exquisite attention. Selena moaned as I rubbed the loofah between her legs, sliding along on a slick layer of froth. I pulled it up between her legs and over her abdomen, and then did so again, enjoying the coos and cries I pulled from her ruby lips. Oh, she said, pouting as I moved from her pussy to clean her legs. I chuckled softly as I soaked up her toned, glorious gams. Selena's legs were just perfection, honed by a top-tier fitness regime, yet still graceful and feminine. I deposited the loofah on its little shelf molded into the shower wall and used my hand to sluice away the frothy layer of soap, rinsing her beneath the stream of warm water. Her hands gripped the towel bar over her head as I dove face first between her legs. I lapped eagerly at her dripping wet, hot pussy. Oh, Aiden, she moaned as I lifted one of her legs and threw it over my shoulder for easier ingress. I wanted to devour her, to consume her, and spit her back out as a quivering, orgasmic bowl of jelly. She was mine now. She had said as much. Selena loved me. No other woman had ever said that to me before. Just as I'd never said it to anyone else. Not in this context. Not when I really meant it. My finger slid inside her wide-open pink shaft with ease, swishing and swirling within the cozy confines as I mouthed her clitoris, hood and all. My lips isolated the little lady in the boat, drawing it within their embrace. Then I suckled with intense, pulsating pressure, my cock growing harder just from the flavor and aroma of her lady parts. I drilled my fingers in deeper, adding a third within her well-greased tunnel. Selena cried out sharply, pressing her body into my face as I suckled at her clit and drove my fingers in and out with a steady, firm rhythm. I felt as if I could have dined down there all night, but my belly rumbled. I had to deal with our mutual need before we could, well, deal with our other mutual need for sustenance. Selena's cries grew sharper, closer together as I mouthed her pussy. I suckled on her labia individually, enjoying the quivering mass in my lips, exulting in my expert control of her reactions. She was mine now. Mine. All mine. I controlled her, and I intended to use that control to push her into new realms of bliss, just as she had done for me. Selena screamed, squirting me in the face with a deluge of her natural juices. I lapped and swallowed, eager to engorge myself upon the sudden feast. It was nothing short of majestic the way she squirmed and writhed, her wet, naked body sliding all over my own. I rose to my feet carefully, dragging my face against her wonderful, soft breasts. I took one of her nipples in my mouth, suckling, licking, nibbling as I maneuvered my rigid cock between her glistening lips. 
Selena arched her spine and tilted her pelvis to allow me inside of her. When I slid in all the way, we cried out in unison. Her hands released the towel bar and clutched at me, pulling me in tightly. I spread my legs out wide, bracing my feet against the edges of the basin so as not to slip. Then I pumped my hips, thrusting myself deep inside of her pussy as she raked her nails down my back. Not the first time she'd made me bleed, but I didn't mind. Not one bit. I took it as a sign that I was some sort of mega stud. Every man wants to feel that way once in a while. Okay, pretty much all the time. But with Selena, it was different. More profound. I supposed it was because I truly cared about her. Selena's opinion of me, the way she looked at me, was intensely important. Because she was important. In that moment, our bodies intertwined beneath the pulsing stream of water. I forgot all about the main firm, the evil queen, and Giscard Emperor. Even the pain of my barely scabbed over bullet wound seemed to fade from a dull ache to non-existence. Nothing mattered except the woman in my arms. Nothing. She loved me. I loved her. No matter what happened to us, no one could take this moment away from me. No one. We cried out with mutual ecstasy, her love tunnel gripping me tight as a vice and quivering like mad. I came inside of her, and then we clutched at each other as drowning people might cling to a life preserver in a storm-tossed ocean. Aiden, she sighed, mumbling into my shoulder. Selena, I replied softly. I could stay like this forever, she said. I know the feeling. But the water is getting cold. She said with a chuckle. I squeezed her buttocks firmly, and then we broke apart, my softening member sliding out of her pussy to dangle between my legs once more. We exited the shower and had some fun toweling each other off. Selena spent a lot of time drying off my cock and gave it a little kiss when she finished. I dressed and found a sundress left behind by one of my brother's women, and I wasn't sure which one, that fit Selena well enough. She slipped the soft material over her body and it cascaded down to fit her torso snugly. The skirt flared out, terminating a full foot above her knees. I think I'm a bit taller than the original owner of this dress, she said with a helpless laugh. Yes, but I like looking at your legs. I like you liking looking at my legs, she replied with a chuckle. Say that five times fast. I quipped as I pulled a polo shirt over my body gingerly as it slid over my wound. No, she said, thrusting out her tongue. I don't suppose you have any underwear that would fit me? I'm afraid not, I replied. I was lucky to find the sundress. Oh well, I'll have to be very careful when I bend over then, Selena said, sliding her feet into the same heels she'd worn the night I took her captive. Sorry, I said. Don't be, she replied with a coy smile. I like the idea of being, shall we say, at your service whenever you want me? Selena flounced up her skirt, flashing me a view of her bare pussy. My eyes widened and I grinned with genuine pleasure. Do that again, I commanded. Selena arched an eyebrow and then reached down and crossed her arms, grabbing the hem of her skirt slowly while keeping intent watch on my reaction the whole time she lifted it up to her waist she spread her legs more widely exposing herself to me i chuckled at the little clear drip of fluid leaking out of her pussy glistening in the light of the cabin you're enjoying this entirely too much i said reaching out to stroke my fingers softly along her wet pussy lips selena gasped shuddering as I collected some of the fluid on my index finger. While I locked gazes with her, I pointedly brought my soiled finger up to my mouth and sucked it clean. Now who's enjoying it too much, she said, pulling her skirt down. Aiden, God knows I want to climb on top of you again, but I'm starving. Right, I said. We headed out of the door, onto the gently swaying deck, down the gangplank and onto the dock. Selena and I locked arms, as if we couldn't bear to be separated more than was absolutely necessary. I took her to a seafood restaurant, which was about an hour away from closing. 
Their barely hidden contempt at our late arrival disappeared when I gave my name to the hostess. Soon their best table, which overlooked the gently crawling sea, became instantly available. We sipped on Cristal and munched on Melba toast while awaiting our first course. Selena, being practical-minded, moved on to the subject at hand. Namely, how were we going to stay alive to enjoy our newly blossomed love? Before we can even contemplate going after Moira, she said, buttering up her third thin slice of the hard toast, we need to deal with the Seven and the Mirror. The Mirror? I asked with a frown. The man who shot you, she said. Deuce Fratkin. Fratkin? I blurted. I heard he was the best, also that he was dead. Believe me, he's not that easy to kill, she replied with a sigh. You're afraid of him, I said. Not a question, but a statement of fact. Yes, she replied without hesitation. He taught me most of what I know. I know exactly how depraved and ruthless he can be. I grunted as our first course arrived, a fresh salad with bits of shrimp, served with a raspberry vinaigrette more sour than sweet. As we dined, I satisfied my curiosity. Why did you call him the mirror? Because he got shot in the head, and while he lived, he wasn't quite the same. She sighed, poking a mound of lettuce and shrimp with her fork and bringing it delicately to her ruby red lips. Now he compulsively mimics the facial expressions of people around him, mirroring them as it were. He's only a man, I replied, and men can be killed. Do you have any ideas as to how we can take him and the others down? She grinned and took a sip of champagne. I do, she said. Now listen closely. Chapter 26 Selena A strong salty breeze off the Mediterranean Sea stirred my hair as I stood on the upper deck of Aiden's yacht. The late afternoon sun glinted golden off the choppy surface, belying the grim nature of my task. Aiden lurked nearby, his fretful gaze focused on the device in my hand. He shook his head warily and spoke in a clear voice that carried over the roar of the surf. Are you certain you don't want to use a burner? He asked. Yes, I said. I'm certain. Acquiring my own phone again had been harrowing, requiring a trip back to the lounge. Fortunately, no one had attacked me, nor had I picked up a tale to my knowledge. However, I am certain that someone, somewhere, had made Moira aware of my revisit to Casablanca. You know, they can track your position as soon as you turn it on, right? He said. I know that, I replied with a sigh. Aiden, we've been over this a dozen times. If Moira doesn't recognize the number, as she would not if I used a burner phone, she won't answer, period. She knows this number. I powered up my phone as he continued to huff and puff. He wasn't angry. Not exactly. Just very tense like a toddler sped up on energy drinks. It had been several days, and he was healing, though nowhere near 100%. My finger tapped the call button on Moira's contact, and I held it to my ear. The wind created some feedback across the line, so I turned away from it to minimize the impact. One ring. No answer. My heart rate climbed. Was I going to fall apart as soon as I heard Moira's voice over the line? She terrified me to the core. She always had, but now more so than ever. I knew my life was worthless at the moment. All I could do was hope she would take the bait, which I intended to dangle in front of her. Two rings. Aiden was right. This was stupid. I should have used a burner. Three rings. Maybe she'd choose not to answer at all. What else could I do? Leave a message? One, I would be unable to check unless I turned the phone and the potential for tracking back on. On the fourth ring, I heard her pick up. Moira's voice seemed oddly relaxed and not surprised, as if she were expecting it all along. Hello, Selena, she said. How are you doing? Moira, I said stiffly. 
You know why I'm calling you. So, let's not shadow box around the issue. Moira chuckled darkly. You've called to beg for mercy then? You must know I cannot possibly provide it. Between Galagos's death and your betrayal, my reputation has taken some serious hits of late. My only option is to prove I'm still ruthless. You know what that will entail. I can deliver Aiden Main to you on a silver platter, I replied. Oh, stop, Moira said. Please don't insult my intelligence, Selina. I know you've been on his yacht. And you even stopped back at that little dive in Casablanca to get your phone back. Yes, I was on his yacht, I said. Because he abducted me. Lies. Not lies, I snapped. He dragged me onto his yacht, tied me up and tortured me with electricity for days. A slight exaggeration, but it had enough seasoning of truth in it to give Moira pause. Yet... You were able to leave his boat and retrieve your phone. And you're calling me now. Yes, I said, letting a little quiver come into my voice. It wasn't hard to summon, considering I was legit terrified of her. He... he broke me, Moira. I thought I was strong, but he broke me. I told him everything. I see, Moira said. So now he knows I ordered his death. It will be an all-out war with the main family. Yes, he knows it was you, I replied. And armed with this knowledge, he still allowed you to leave his custody? I find that hard to believe. You don't know Aiden Main very well, then, I replied. I looked at Aiden and tried not to grin. He's a sadist. A man who revels in torturing and breaking young women to his will. I... Let him believe he'd done so to me. I've been serving him for days. A long silence, then. Very well. Let's say I believe you. How are you going to deliver him to me? I have a plan. So do I. Leave your phone turned on. And I'll send the mirror and the seven to take care of him. No, I blurted. That will never do. He doesn't know I even have this phone. I have to toss it in the ocean as soon as I finish this call. How naive do you think I am, Selina? Moira asked. I don't think you're naive at all, I replied. Trust me, I want him dead as much as you. And I want to live. I'll, I'll keep working for you, forever if I must. But please, please help me. You don't know what he's like. Such a perverted sadist. Aiden covered his mouth to stifle a laugh, and even though I grinned and waved him off further away. Is that so? My back is covered with whip marks, and I've not tasted anything but a ball gag for days, I replied. I managed to wriggle loose from where he'd tied me to his bed to make this call, and I don't have long before his return. Please, Moira, please help me. Very well, she said. I believe your plight is your just punishment for such utter incompetence, however. I mean, if you'd have killed him that first night, you wouldn't be in this situation now. Don't you think I know that? Don't you think I hate myself just as much as I hate him? I put enough venom in my tone to be convincing. Why don't you just run away right now? For the same reason I'm calling you... The main's reach extends all over the globe, just as your own does. Where will I run? Where could I possibly hide? Besides, I don't want to live in a hovel in some third world country. I want my old life back. I want to be treated as I deserve to be treated. And most of all, I want Aiden Main to die as painful a death as possible. Myra sucked in a deep breath and then let it out slowly. Where and when, she replied. The fireworks storage warehouse in Versailles. Moira laughed. You're afraid of being shot? She knew, as well as I, that no one would dare fire a gun near so much volatile material. I'm afraid Aiden will never believe it's a legit negotiation unless it takes place somewhere he thinks he won't be shot. Moira sighed. It's rather inconvenient. While I own that warehouse, 
It's through a number of proxies, but I'll arrange it. However, I'm curious to know how you're going to lure him there. Because he's going to call this number in a couple of hours and make you an offer. A ransom of ten million dollars for my life. She laughed, almost a matronly edge to it. <laughs> I see. He thinks you're worth that much, eh? Ouch. Yes. Do we have a deal? Very well. So, I swallowed hard, playing my role to the hilt. Are we square? I mean, will we be square after this is done? Of course, Selena. Moira replied with a sweet tone. You know I love you as much as my own blood. You're right. You're so full of shit, your eyes are turning brown. Out loud, I said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moira. I have to go. He could be back any moment. Be strong, Selena. I'll see you soon. I turned off the phone and smiled at Aiden. He clapped his hands, a broad grin on his face. Bravo, he said. An excellent performance. Thank you, I replied. We came together and he took me in his arms. Our lips met, and I sighed, melting into him. He pulled away enough to look me in the eye. Perverted sadist, am I? I chuckled, tracing my finger over his broad shoulder. I meant it as a compliment. Tortured you for days, he continued. Wow, you made me out to be a real monster. Haven't even tasted anything but a ball gag? I shrugged, smiling up at him. You know I don't now, nor have I ever even owned a ball gag. Well... We can take care of that with a shopping trip once this matter is concluded, I said. Suddenly my smile faded as I was taken with a frightening thought. Aiden, what if your Uncle Lucian doesn't accept me? He'll accept you, Aiden said firmly. Unlike my brothers and my cousin, I've never caused him any headaches. I've never asked for anything extreme, other than to be allowed to continue to work for him. Besides... My brother Pete proposed to a woman who worked in direct opposition to the firm for years. This should be a cakewalk. I've never understood that phrase, I replied. Cakewalk? I mean, it implies an easy task, but I can't imagine walking on a cake. I think it's a child's game. Something like hot potato, he laughed. I don't understand it either, I guess. We really missed out on a lot, I said. Being born into the families we were born into, didn't we? Yes, he said with a solemn frown. Both of us were deprived of a normal life. But if we'd been raised in nice pedestrian families, we might never have met. And I can't imagine that. Don't even want to try. I kissed him again as the waves slapped into the hull of his yacht. A sensation spread through my chest, an uplifting feeling. I was surprised to discover it was hope. Hope had always been in short supply through the course of my life. But now I felt it, pulsing as brightly as the late afternoon sun. We headed below decks to plan. I wrote down the names of the seven one by one and listed their strengths, weaknesses, and fighting styles. You sure it's going to be hand to hand? He asked. I nodded. That's why we're doing it in a fireworks storage center. You're smart, but crazy, he said with a laugh. Just because they can't use guns doesn't mean we stand a chance. We're stacking the deck in our favor as much as possible. Besides, Professor isn't much use without a gun in his hand. That lowers our active enemy combatants by one. He laughed and shook his head. Well, I feel better already. This is going to be a cakewalk. Shooting fish in a barrel. Is that even a thing? I quipped. We shared another laugh, and then a kiss, and then a bed. In that order. Soon I would be free, or I would be dead. Anything other than living as Moira's slave. Chapter 27 Aiden Versailles is an oft-overlooked gem in France, overshadowed by gay Paris and its myriad of lights, 
Yet it's always been one of my favorite places in the world. The people lack the smug superiority exhibited by Parisians, yet they have all of the culture and refinement tempered by a rustic charm. It's a city rich in history and tradition, yet becoming more and more modern. Traditional cafes and Baroque structures boast free Wi-Fi. A Franciscan monk in his simple black robes can be seen texting on a smartphone. Pedal cabs mingle with electrically powered vehicles on the narrow, history-drenched streets. I'd always wanted to bring a woman here. The right woman. I was finally getting that chance. But our purpose was not romance. Our purpose was far more dire than that. Unfortunately, the warehouse in question turned out to be in one of Versailles' less appealing districts. Ugly factories, some of them dating back to the Second World War, pumped out thick plumes of black smoke into the evening sky, obscuring the stars and casting an intangible pall over the city. Those few residences we encountered on the way seemed abandoned or occupied by squatters. An elderly man with his teeth broken off at the gum line stared and laughed at Selina and me as we passed down the avenue. We're running late, Selina grumbled. I know, but I had to see Doc. I patted my side. I was still a little stiff and needed him to work his magic if I'm going to be in a fight. We're definitely going to be in a fight, she replied. He seems like a nice man, given his profession. Oh yeah, he takes his Hippocratic Oath seriously. He also takes his multi-million dollar salary very seriously. His nurse was staring at me awfully hard, Selina mused. Well, she probably thought you were attractive. She's, uh, into women. Then I'll be flattered by her attention, Selina said with relief. I was afraid she was suspicious of me. Oh, that too. But she takes her marching orders from Doc, and he happens to adore you. How do you know? I can just tell. The fireworks storage warehouse loomed ahead of us, a squat, two-story structure of ugly brown stone surrounded by a rusted chain-link fence. Numerous warning signs dotted the fence, one of them with the amusing sketch of a person being blown limb from limb in effigy. All right, I said, just like we planned. She nodded and held her wrists out. I tied rope around them, but individually. When she held them crossed together behind her back, it appeared as if she were thoroughly bound. I added a thin scarf over her eyes for a blindfold, and we found a break in the fence. As soon as we hit the cracked and stained concrete parking lot, we fell into character. I held her arm, pushing her along as Selina pretended to stumble about blindly. Her head bowed and shoulders slumped like a broken captive. Oh, please, sir, she said in a little girl voice. Please don't drag me away and ravish my sweet virgin body. Shh, I said, repressing a grin. You're going to make me laugh and blow our cover. I glanced up at the roof of the warehouse, trying not to be overt about it. I spotted a hunched form near one of the buttresses, roughly humanoid. That had to be the sniper, Miles. This was it, the moment of truth. He was free to take a shot so long as we had not entered the volatile warehouse. But perhaps he was under strict orders not to risk Selena's life. When I'd spoken to Moira on the phone, she had been almost civil, except for her dire warning that if any harm came to her best worker, I would face castration and then a slow, painful death. She had been convincing. I'd almost believed her. Well, I did believe her about the death and castration. Only the concern for her daughter drew my suspicion. When we fell into the aging structure's shadow, I relaxed. Miles would have a hard time hitting us from such an angle, though I supposed it would not be impossible. I pushed open the rear door, which was unlocked, just as Moira had said it would be. Inside, crates stacked up to the ceiling carried a smell of sulfur and glue. Fireworks. Fireworks galore. Twelve-year-old Aiden rejoiced inside of me as I wistfully remembered lighting bottle rockets and firing them at my mopey cousin Derek. Good times. I forced the grin off my face and stepped into the center of the wide-open interior, looking about. I shoved Selena forward, then she fell onto her knees, just as we'd planned. Hello? I called out. Moira? 
I'm afraid she couldn't make it, Professor said, striding out into the pool of radiance cast by the buzzing overhead lights. His hands were clasped behind his back, and his bearded countenance bore a smile of smug confidence. I see the girl is unharmed. More or less, I replied. I enjoyed taking pleasure from her sweet, supple body, but I get tired of my toys after a while. Do you have my money? Professor smiled widely. No. No money for you, Aiden Nain. Only death. At his words, the rest of the seven materialized out of the shadows. Perhaps this was below his pay grade? If Fratkin wasn't present, our chances had just gone up exponentially. I'll kill her, I said, holding a trench knife to Selena's snow-white throat. She cried out in pain as I drew her head back by the hair. I'll fucking do it, old man. I want my money. Go ahead, Professor said, buffing his nails on his fine suit and blowing on them. Saves us the trouble. Her life is forfeit as well. A fitting price for her failure. Please, no, Selina whimpered, eliciting a laugh from Professor. Yo, Selina, Belrock said. No hard feelings, you hear? Just business. I'll make sure you don't suffer. They moved in on us, each one a trained killer. Sop, the toothless man with the chain. Hydern, the machete-wielding Aryan. Duggan, a former linebacker who favored brass knuckles studded with hard metal pyramids, and my old friends Belrock and Sage. But they made a mistake. They believed my love was as helpless as she seemed. When Duggan was less than a foot away from Selena, she leaped to her feet and spun in a tight circle. Remember how I had put down Taekwondo as a next-to-useless, archaic art? Well... I was forced to reconsider my opinion when she pivoted on her back foot and snapped around with a perfectly executed crescent kick to his throat. Duggan's hands snapped up to his neck, his mouth opening to allow a frothy red gurgle to escape. Eyes wide, he dropped to his knees, struggling to breathe through his shattered windpipe. I ducked under Belrock's right cross and slashed his armpit with my knife. I made sure to follow through hard, tearing a red line from front to back. Belrock howled, slapping a hand over his bleeding side and crashing into Sage. The two of them went down in a tangle of limbs and cursing. Sop swung his chain and managed to ensnare my wrist. I struggled to hang on to my knife, expecting him to drag me forward as he had last time. Apparently he had learned, however. He merely held the chain taut, keeping me in check as Professor drew a switchblade from his coat pocket and sent it hurling through the air. I saw it coming for me, blade glinting in the light. Professor, for all of his middle-aged softness, had a mean throwing arm. I couldn't dodge it, couldn't block it, could only watch as it spiraled through the air. Selina appeared out of nowhere and caught the knife by its handle. She sent it flying back at Professor, who raised his arms defensively on instinct. The blade buried in his palm, eliciting a howl from his bearded lips. Hydran chopped with his machete, and I managed to drag myself enough out of the way that he hit the chain binding my wrist. Sparks flew amid a metallic clank, and I was dragged off my feet by the sudden impetus. But the chain fell free, and Hydran grabbed his forearm and hissed behind clenched teeth. Metal on metal. That had to have stung. As I rose to my feet, I noticed a black, syrupy substance on the chain that had just held me prisoner. Poison? It had to be. Dirty fighting motherfucker. But I had to roll out of the way as Sop sent the chain back at me. Selena dashed toward him from behind and dropped into a picture-perfect foot sweep. Sop crashed down hard on his back, and Selena pounced on him like a cat. She split the fingers of her right hand into twin bundles and then thrust them into each of his eye sockets. Sop screamed, clutching at his bleeding face as she rolled off of him just in time for Sajay's axe kick to land on Sop rather than her. I came in on Sajay's blind side and slashed the inside of his thigh with my trench knife. He howled, clasping a hand in an attempt to staunch the fountain of blood spewing forth. He was out of the fight for good now. If he removed his hand, he would quickly bleed out of his femoral artery. Kill them, 
Professor howled as Hydern came in slashing with his machete. I caught him under the wrist, knocking the blade out of his hand as Selina knocked Professor out cold with an elbow to the jaw. I skewered Hydern through his abdomen, twisted the knife and pulled it out, taking some of his intestines to slop loosely through the new hole next to his navel. Another one down. As I looked on grimly at the screaming man in dark triumph, I heard Selina cry out behind me. I turned, my jaw falling open as she stood holding her hand. A red line marred at the edges by oily black had appeared on the back of her hand. I looked down to where the machete lay, and my blood ran cold. Selina, I cried, rushing over to her. I'm fine, she said. It's just a scratch. Burns like hell, though. It's poisoned, I snapped. We don't have much time. I scooped her up into my arms, carrying her toward the exit. Selina clutched onto me, but did so with a scowl. I can walk, Aiden, she said. Which would increase your heart rate and spread the poison faster, I said. I've got you, Selina. I've got you. Wait, she said as I headed out the exit. What about the sniper on the roof? I turned around and drew my pistol, firing a single shot into one of the larger crates. The whistling, crackling sound of lit fireworks emanated forth amid a trail of smoke. That should keep them busy, I said, dashing out the door. I ran all the way across the parking lot as multiple explosions ripped through the warehouse. I didn't stop until we were safely through the fence and several blocks away. I gently set Selena down. She swayed a bit on her feet, keeping her balance by leaning her palm against the textured surface of a stained masonry wall as the warehouse went up behind us. Doc, I said as soon as he answered. I need ambulance service now. Selena sagged to her knees. Would Doc make it in time to save her? Or would I be forced to bury the only woman I ever had, or ever could, love? Chapter 28 Selena I sat bolt upright. A thin blanket flung from my body as a scream tore from my lips. Why was I screaming? Where was I? And what was that medicine smell that stung my nostrils? Please be calm, Miss Selena. Came a familiar, smooth voice more confident than God. I turned my gaze and focused upon the bald plate and peering, intent eyes of the man I only knew as Doc. What's going on? I blurted taking in my surroundings. I lay on a converted sleeper sofa in a posh hotel room with steel-gray carpeting livened by brightly colorful expressionist paintings arranged in a tasteful, soothing array. I'd been here before, briefly, with Aiden. Doc's hotel room in Versailles. But how had I gotten here? The last thing which I remembered was getting cut by the machete. Then some dim images of Aiden carrying me. I glanced down at my hand, covered in a bandage and only mildly sore. Doc sighed and pushed his glasses up further on his nose. His eyes set hard, and it took him several moments to collect his thoughts enough to speak. Miss Selena, you've been poisoned. An inhuman mix of a number of toxins, referred to by the misleadingly charming nomenclature Thailand Cocktail. Your internal organs are shutting down. And I don't have an antidote. I see. I felt oddly energetic for someone dying of poison. Is that why my heart is going a mile a minute? No, Doc said. That would be from the adrenaline shot I just administered. Your heart had been on the verge of shutting down, but I can temporarily alleviate the effects of the poison. Where's Aiden? I asked suddenly. If I don't have much time left, I need to talk to him. Please. Dog pursed his lips and moved over to the bed, upon which lay a leather luggage case. With his back to me, he spoke a bit louder so I could hear him distinctly. Aiden has gone to murder your stepmother in her abode, in the hopes of locating an antidote. It seems likely they have it about. I nodded sagely. Yes, only a total idiot would use poison without having an antidote handy in case they accidentally poison themselves. Wait, did you say her abode? 
My mouth dropped open in horror. He didn't. He couldn't have. Yes, Doc said with a grim glower. I told him that alone he would be unlikely to survive. Yet he would not be dissuaded. He doesn't stand a chance without me, I snapped. Fucking heroic idiot! Why has he gone Don Quixote and tilting at windmills? I suspect he wishes to save your life, Doc replied. He left in a hurry before I could inform him of my plan to get you back on your feet. I know that place like the back of my hand. Why didn't he wait? With a dual metallic snick, Doc opened the luggage. He stood to the side and gestured at the contents. My eyes widened at the sight of so many wonderful toys. An Israeli-made miniature Uzi, twin 9mm semi-automatic pistols, brass knuckles. Were those throwing stars? Those were definitely throwing stars. I would imagine you'd find this gear useful, he said. There's also a set of clothing which should fit you. Yes, it will be useful indeed, I said, rapidly dressing in the black and silver athletic gear. I strapped weapons all over my person. I checked the Uzi and aimed down the sight. I hadn't fired one in ages. A real spray and prey weapon. I preferred more precise firearms, but beggars couldn't be choosers. Wait. Doc said as I headed for the door. The adrenaline is temporary. You'll need another dose before long. He held out a metal case with three syringes filled with amber fluid. I took it and smiled gratefully. Thanks, Doc. I owe you. Just bring him back safely, Doc said. He's significantly less of a pain in the ass than his brothers and cousins. Just saying. Then I'd hate to meet his family, I said stowing the case in my fanny pack. We shared a laugh, and then I suddenly embraced him. Doc seemed taken aback, but did awkwardly pat me on the shoulder. Then I was off. I bounced on the balls of my feet for the entire ride down to the lobby. Once there, a valet locked gazes with me and wordlessly tossed me a set of car keys. I whistled at the sight of the Aston Martin. Blue, my favorite color. I leaped into the early morning and tore off down the highway. The French palace was much like the one in London, though a few stories shorter and constructed of stone, not glass and steel. The French hadn't been willing to allow Moira to demolish a historical building in Versailles, as the English had in London. When I screeched to a halt outside, I marched right up to the front door. A bearded, jovial fellow named Maurice gaped when he saw my approach. Miss Selina, he said in heavily accented English, since he knew my French was dodgy at best. You... you are not supposed to be here. I stepped over the velvet rope, barely looking at him. Yep, I said. Seems that way. Selina, he said with a sigh. I can't just let you waltz in. His speech stopped cold when the barrel of the nine millimeter crushed his nostrils shut. Don't make me kill you, Maurice, I said. We, oui, Maurice said, holding his arms up. I believe I can. In fact, simply let you waltz, tango, or trot. His face twisted into a grin. Make the bitch hurt, he said. Oh, she's going to hurt, I said. I pushed my way inside, ignoring the bodies swirling on the dance floor. The throbbing bass enveloped me and the light stung my eyes. Everything was too loud, too bright. Damn the adrenaline. I headed up the steps to the VIP section. A bouncer I did not know saw my approach and held out a palm. No, he said. I kept coming. His hand twitched, and he went to draw the pistol at his side. I drew mine first and blasted a hole in the center of his chest. But the heavy music... The gunshot went unnoticed. The dancers continued to swirl. The drinks continued to flow. And no one was the wiser as I headed up the stairs to the next level. I caught a flash of motion on the balcony above. I threw myself to my belly on the stairs as shots rang out. Bullets tore the plaster to powder, dusting me with a light coating. 
I waited until the three gunmen went to reload and popped up with the Uzi. Spray and pray. I squeezed the trigger and swept the gun back and forth in a wide arc. It wasn't pretty. I hit more banister than flesh, but flesh I hit nonetheless. Men screamed and bled and died. I was back to my feet again, but out of ammo for the Uzi. I tossed it over my shoulder to thunk heavily down the steps and drew the pistols. Third floor, ladies' lingerie, soft furnishings, and a dozen assailants between me and the man I loved. I kicked a poker table over, chips and drinks flying, and dove behind its stone surface. The table shook under the weight of their combined gunfire. They had me pinned, and would no doubt use their superior numbers to try and flank me. I flopped onto my belly, pointed the guns at ankle level, and fired away. A man took a round through his calf, a gout of blood and meat spurting onto the wall behind him. He screamed, falling to his butt and clutching his injured limb. Three more of them fell before my onslaught. Wishing I'd brought more ammo, I reloaded each pistol with the remaining magazines. One of the black-garbed men appeared at the edge of the table. I kicked his kneecap, shattering bone and causing his leg to bend the wrong direction. He fell on top of me, but I caught him. I had a plan. Rising up, propping the screaming man in front of me, I used him as a human shield to absorb the next profusion of bullets. He shook and shivered like a rag doll as they tore into his body. I peered over his shoulder, took aim, and fired. Only the first man I had shot remained alive, whimpering in a crumpled heap on the floor. I walked over to him and stomped my heel down on his injured calf. Where's Moira? I demanded. He pointed up, which was good enough for me. I kicked him in the teeth for good measure and ran up the steps to the next level. Only when I got to the landing did I realize I could have taken some of their guns. Stupid. I was feeling heavy, my movements slow like I moved through molasses. Time for another adrenaline shot. I dug the case out as I hit the top level at last. Between me and Moira's office stood the mirror. His face twisted into a defiant sneer. I guess that's the expression I wore at the time. I pointed the guns at him and pulled the triggers, but I was out of ammo. The mirror's face grew frightened, echoing my own reaction. Wordlessly, he reached into his holster and ejected the magazine from his gun, and then tossed it aside. I threw my guns down and dug the case fully out. Fratkin taught the people who taught the people who taught the most hitmen to kill. I didn't stand a chance, especially not half dead. I looked at the syringes, and suddenly had an idea. I grabbed all three and jammed them into my thigh. <sighs> I cried, my veins seeming on fire. My heart exploded into a rapid tattoo, faster than a hummingbird's. With a guttural scream, I charged in at the mirror. Fratkin's face adopted a truly horrific grimace. Was that what I look like? No matter... I tossed Shuriken at him for grins and giggles. He ducked under most of them, but took one in the shoulder. Then I speared him with a flying tackle. Both of us tumbling end over end. He got the better of it, and used the momentum to fling me through a decorative glass pane. I hit hard, bounced back up and charged right back in, mouth open in an animal scream. I swept Mira's feet out from under him, and then leaped atop his supine form. My fists fell like rain on his face, turning it into a swollen, mashed, and bloody pulp. I kept hammering away, even after he stopped moving. I had never felt so alive, so powerful. I felt as if I could take on the world. It can't be good on my heart, I thought as I rose to my feet. I kicked the door to Moira's office open, and faced her with my chest heaving with pants. End of the line, Selina, she said, holding a gun on a prone and bleeding Aiden. His nostrils trailed twin lines of crimson down over his mouth, but his eyes widened when he saw me. Selina, run, he sputtered, 
accidentally swallowing blood. I'm dead if I run, I said. I threw my last shuriken. The dart took her in the hand and she dropped the gun. It hit hard with a metallic clunk on the marble floor, sending a round through the 12-foot-long aquarium. Water and Piscine creatures spilled forth out of the gaping hole left behind. You little ingrate, Moira sputtered, clutching her bleeding hand. Where's the antidote, Moira? I asked. Her eyes darted to her desk for the briefest of moments before she sneered. There is no antidote. Aiden pitched a backward somersault and rolled clear. Moira and I both ran for her chrome-plated gun. Her hand slapped onto the pearl grip handle, but my own slapped atop of them both. We rolled about on the floor, struggling for possession of the weapon. Aiden charged in hard at us, and Moira saw him coming and started squeezing off rounds. Aiden danced the hot foot before diving behind her desk. How are you even alive? Moira spat as we grappled. Adrenaline? That won't last long. Especially if you overdosed, as I suspect you have. It doesn't have to last long, I snapped. I slammed her hand down hard on the floor, and the gun shot across the marble, skittering and spinning like a whirling dervish. We rolled apart and got to our feet at the same time. Moira charged in at me, but at the last moment I ducked my shoulder, planted it in her midsection, and stood up straight. Moira flipped over my head and came down hard near the sundered end of the aquarium. She screamed, her face impaled upon the bladed fins of a lionfish. I knew it was venomous and would kill her soon enough. But why should a fish get my satisfaction? I grabbed a piece of broken glass and drew her a new smile under her chin. Moira gurgled, sputtered, and fell forward. Dead at last. I staggered on the slippery floor, lost my balance, and fell into the aquarium. I supposed it would be a fitting coffin. At least I would leave behind a pretty corpse. My heart slowed, and Aiden appeared above me, tears in his eyes. Selena, can you hear me? I smiled. I was dying, but at least I'd had a chance to know him. To love and be loved. Not a fairy tale ending. Exactly, but as good as I would get, and more than I'd ever hoped for. I have the antidote, he said, holding out a plastic bag filled with a brownish powder. He looked around fervently. No water. No water. What kind of person doesn't have bottled water? Nothing but alcohol. My vision grew dim. The hand I stroked his cheek with fell limply to the damp glass of the aquarium bottom. A suckerfish flopped around near my ear. I savored the sound of its death throes, figuring it would be the last thing I ever heard. Aiden stuffed his mouth with the powder, grimacing at its apparently poor taste and mixing it with his saliva. Then he kissed me. I grunted, trying feebly to fend off his efforts, because it really did taste horrible. But he pushed my hands away and finished administering the dose. Selena. Please don't die, he said. Oh, Aiden, I said with a grin. You're not getting off that easy. I'm afraid you're stuck with me for a while. Think I'll take a little nap, though. Everything went black. Best sleep I'd had in ages. Chapter 29 Aiden I held Selena's hand in my own as we walked into the downtown lobby of Main Brothers LLC. The desk clerk smiled broadly at us and pushed the button to allow us ingress to the elevator. I'm nervous, she said with a quick smile. I'm never nervous. Relax, I said, squeezing her hand a bit more tightly. Uncle Lucy is going to love you. I'll bet. Two assassins for the price of one. She sighed and looked over at me. Thanks again for saving me, even if you were really dumb to go after Moira by yourself. We kind of saved each other, I replied with a laugh. I mean, I saw the footage. You were like Chuck Norris mixed with Bruce Lee. 
More like Chuck Liddell mixed with Bruce Campbell, she said. But I appreciate the compliment. Just keep me away from that adrenaline shit. The high is great, but the come down. Whew. I nodded. We had spent over a week recovering before Doc declared we were healthy enough to fly. Or to screw, for that matter. Bastard used his nurse as a chaperone. As we'd been seven days without being intimate, we were both rather anxious. But we couldn't put off meeting with Lucy any longer. He had to meet Selena and officially approve of her, bring her into the firm. Aiden, Lucy said, rising from behind his desk and coming to greet us. His face split in a wide smile. And you must be Selena. So nice to finally meet you. I've been a fan of your work for a long time. Nice to meet you, sir, Selena said. Oh, stop, he said with a chuckle. Call me Uncle Lucy. Your family now. Then she's approved? Lucian looked at me like I was a complete idiot. Would she have set foot in here if not? Sit down, both of you. Have some coffee. Houston blend? I asked as we seated ourselves. Selena settled with her thigh pressed right next to mine, and I slipped an arm over her shoulder. No. Lately I've become enamored of Ethiopian roasts. I think you'll like this one. We sipped coffee and hammered out the details. Selena and I were to work together for the firm, plying our trade wherever the job took us. I couldn't have hoped for anything more, but one leftover bit of unfinished business lingered in my mind. Ah, uh, Uncle Lucy, I said. Yes, he replied. I'm sorry about Giscard Epper. Lucian waved off my concerns as if they were nothing. Will took care of it, he said. Now, I'm sure you'd like to get right back to work. Actually, Uncle Lucy, I was wondering if we could have a day off, I said. Lucy's eyes widened, and a mischievous grin spread over his face. Is this the same workaholic who wanted to go to Morocco without a break? He asked. All right, take your day off. He looked at Selena and grinned. Make it two. Thanks, Uncle Lucy, she said. A short time later, we stood in the hall outside of the condo I used while in the Big Apple. I was having a very hard time unlocking the door with Selena mashing her mouth on top of my own. I finally managed to get the door open, and we spilled inside of the condo together. Selena fell on top of me, and we didn't slow our tonsil hockey session a bit. She pulled away, panting hard and glanced around the condo. Nice place. Then she was mauling me again. We rolled across the floor until I wound up on top. I fumbled with my belt while she hiked up her skirt, revealing the tops of her black stockings and lace garters. What's this? I asked, poking my finger into one of the garters and snapping it against her snow-white skin. A little surprise I picked up before we left France, she said with a grin. I have a surprise for you, too, I said. Several, in fact. Oh, she said, eyes glittering with delight. Are they dirty surprises? What do you think, I asked. After all, I'm your dirty boy. You're my handsome prince, she said, and I'm your damsel in distress. Not yet, I said, kissing her softly, but soon. I fumbled out my cock flopping it onto her belly while she revealed another secret. Her black, translucent panties featured a convenient snap on the side. I peeled them off with a whip of my arm and tossed them over my shoulder. Hey, those are expensive, she said. The real treasure is what lies beneath, I said, groping her naked, wet pussy. Selena gasped, her eyes narrowing. I stroked her with long caresses of my fingers allowing my digits to squeeze her clitoris into a pink bulge. Oh, God, I've so missed you fucking me, she gasped. I know, Doc is a real bastard, I said. I had this whole plan, wine, some fun and games. There's time for that later, she cooed. Just stick it in me before I go insane. I pried her labia open exulting in the musky smell emanating from betwixt their quivering embrace. The head of my cock pressed into her slit, 
shoving its stiffness inside of her pink tunnel. Selena cried out, arching her back to allow me more deeply inside. Oh, yes, she gasped. Yes, Aiden, fill me up. I'm going to stuff you with hard cock all night long, I growled through gritted teeth. I reached up to her bodice and tore the dress open wide, exposing her lace dimmy bustier. The pink, creamy perfection of her nipples peaked above the lace, enticing me with their swollen nubs. Oh, Aiden, she sighed as I mouthed her nipples, switching between each with an eager, delighted energy I hadn't felt in... I'd never felt anything like it in truth. Selena was my match in so many ways, completing me like the opposite side of the same coin. I thrust inside of her, my lips peeling back in a snarl of lust. Selena lifted her knees and wrapped her ankles around my waist, drawing our bodies snugly together. I could feel her heartbeat, taste her sweat, and smell her dripping cunny. It all conspired to create that lightheaded sensation you get when the mood is just perfect and all you want to do is screw until the end of the world. I bounced on top of her, murdering her pussy with my cock. Selena screamed, raking her nails across my back with such intensity that my shirt rolled back in freshly tattered rents. Selena's cries grew tighter, more intense as I screwed her for all I was worth. I felt myself on the edge of release, and struggled on the razor's edge of keeping my erection and not spewing her full of my seed. What if I got her pregnant, I suddenly wondered. I sort of liked the idea. What if we made a baby? I grunted out as I hammered away at her. You're thinking, ah, uh, about kids? Oh, right now? Well, yeah. Oh, oh fuck, you're so tight, baby. Oh, yeah? You like me tight? She cooed, squeezing me with her talented love tunnel muscles. If I have a kid, it may not be so tight anymore. Bullshit, I hissed through gritted teeth. Oh, God, I can't hold back much longer. Haven't you come yet? Several times, she gasped. But don't stop. Please don't stop. I gritted my teeth tighter and redoubled my efforts. I rocked my body as well as thrust, driving the head of my cock into her cervix and stemming her G-spot. Selena threw her head back and hollered fit to wake the dead. Her nails ripped another gash in my shirt, not to mention my skin, but I was too engaged to care. We rolled over so she was on top of me. I reached up and caressed the pliant, supple sweetness of her breasts, mashing and deforming the skin to fit my whims. Selena's hands grasped my wrists, but not to pull my hands away. In fact, she mashed my hands down even harder onto her chest. Selena swiveled her hips like a stripper, gyrating and growling with a snarl crossing her features. Her lips flew open, a sharp gasp precipitated a sudden slowing of her motions. We settled into a rhythm, no longer going at it like rabbits. With the slower speed came greater control and we synced our movements for maximum pleasure. I'd never been so in concert with a woman before, not even Selena. With no more lies between us, no more threat of death, at least not imminent death given our dangerous shared profession, we were free to fully explore our connection to the utmost. Selena planted her hands on my chest for leverage and swished her hips about like a stormy sea. I groaned, harder pressed than ever, no pun intended, not to come. Selena panted, her bare breasts heaving. I pressed them upward against her ribcage until her nipples brushed the bottom of her jaw. Oh, yes, Aiden, she cried. Grab my tits and fuck me. I rolled us over so she was on her back again. We'd actually traveled all the way to the living room in this manner, bumping into the coffee table, which was laden with shiny, glossy gift bags. A bit of tissue paper fell out of one and bounced across the lush carpet. Her groans and gasps became more intense, more guttural, matching my animalistic intensity. I couldn't hold back any further, and finally came inside of her just as she reached an explosive, screaming climax. I collapsed atop her, drenched in sweat and clutching her to me like the precious thing she was. 
Selena threw her arms around the back of my neck and hugged me close as we whispered to one another while our sweat cooled. I love you so much, baby. I murmured into her lustrous ebony hair. I love you too, she gasped. I love you too. Never let me go, Aiden. Never let me go. I won't, I said with sudden fierceness. Not ever. We lay there for some time, caressing and sighing and just enjoying the sensation of being together. The sun stretched shadows long across the floor as it dove toward the horizon. Her skin was lovely in the gentle late afternoon light, glowing with vigor and sweet youth. I could use a drink, I said. Booze? she asked. No, water. I seem to be out of fluids for some reason. She giggled, her eyes crinkling shut as her bare shoulders shook. I could use my vape, she said. At this point, Selena rested atop me, her face on my chest. I pointed at the bags on the glass coffee table. Check the blue and green glitter bag, I said. She cocked an eyebrow and reared up, brushing my face with her heavy, swinging breasts. Selena dug in the bag, tossing tissue paper aside, and came up with a crystal vape engraved with her initials. You're so sweet, she said, kissing me on the lips. Thank you. Now I feel bad I didn't get you anything. Baby, as long as I've got you, I don't need anything else, I said. You're so sweet, she said with a sigh, leaning her head against my chest and toying with the vape in her hand. Abruptly, she lifted her gaze to meet my own. But what's in the other bags? All kinds of goodies, I said, including something you specifically requested. Selena reared up, her blue eyes glowing with intensity. Show me, she commanded. Her command was my wish. Chapter 30 Selena With each new unveiled item from the glittery, festive gift bags, I grew more excited. You'd think after going at it like a pair of coked-up rabbits, we'd have had enough. Nope. I was ready to go again. So, we've got some toys, I said, picking up a set of red leather cuffs with high-quality metal-embossed padlocks. But you won't let me see what's in that bag. I pointed at the pure white gift bag with a snowflake design on the exterior. Aiden grinned and lifted it on his finger, swinging it like a pendulum. Was he trying to hypnotize me? If so, it was already working. Oh, I saved the best for last, he said. But you're going to have to be a very, very good girl if you want to see what's inside of it. What if I want to be a bad girl instead? I asked, arching my brows. That's your decision, but you know that bad girls get spanked. I bit my lower lip, drinking in the sight of his chiseled nude form with my eyes. Aiden had a swimmer's build, but with extra meat. And I'm not referring to the hammer he kept dangling between his legs. Dangling. That would never do. I had my ways of getting it to stand at attention. I reached out and grasped his shaft, but Aiden slapped the back of my hand. I cried out, though it didn't hurt much, laughing as he ticked his finger back and forth. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, he said as if admonishing a child. If you can't keep your hands to yourself... I'm going to have to take them out of the equation. I pouted a little, and he put his arms akimbo and gave me a mock stern glare. Selena, he said admonishingly. Okay, I said, blowing out a sigh. I really want to feel your cock in my hand, though. All in good time, he said, turning away from me to pick up the leather cuffs. I winced at the sight of his back, covered with scratches. A line of blood had trailed out of the worst, drawing into a crust. Oh, honey, I said sadly. You're poor back. I'm so sorry. He looked back and laughed, as if he had yet to notice. I'm not, he said with a grin. It's just like, man, I must be one hell of a stud. You are, baby, I said, holding my hand out so he could encircle my wrist with the first cuff. 
Ooh, there's a fur lining. It feels nice. He grinned, snapping the lock shut. Aiden reached for my other wrist, which I provided to him so he could take it prisoner as well. Aiden wasn't done. He had two more cuffs, one for each of my ankles. They too were fur-lined and featured locking hasps. I stared at my adorned limbs. I liked the way the crimson leather stood out against my pale skin. For the first time, I wasn't self-conscious about my inability to tan. Trust me, no matter what cream or technique I used, I wound up turning into a lobster. Then once the burned flesh peeled away, I was just as white as before. White Russian, what can you do? Aiden dangled the keys to my cuffs in front of my face and then placed them carefully on the glass coffee table behind him. Then he took my hand and helped me to my feet. Thank you. Oh, I cried as he spun me around a face away from him. I shivered as he ran his hand slowly down the outside of my arms until he gripped the cuffs. He gently tugged my hands behind my back and attached the cuffs together with a screw-shut D-ring. I gave an experimental tug, much more comfortable than the Hojujutsu, but I was still rendered at his mercy. Turn around, he said, grasping a nipple to reinforce the order. I spun around, an eager smile crossing my face. Aiden took in the sight of me, his helpless prisoner. The position, my arms held behind my back, enhanced and lifted my breasts, making them seem even larger. I enjoyed the way Aiden sweated and licked his lips while he gazed at them. Looks like you're having fun, I said between pants. I stared pointedly at his erect cock, crowned by a glistening pearl of precum. So are you, he said, nostrils flaring. I can smell that dirty, nasty pussy getting all hot and slippery for me. I sighed, feeling a bit of moisture leaking out between my engorged pussy lips and sliding down my inner thigh. On your knees, Selena, he said firmly. I sank down to a kneeling position, knowing what he had in mind, but pretending resistance. Oh no, what are you going to make me do, you sadistic pervert? I'm going to force you to suck my cock, he growled. Something I'm sure you've never done before. We laughed, breaking character, but it didn't matter. All that mattered was that we were together. We loved each other. And of course, that no one was actively trying to kill us. Win, win, and win. I opened my mouth and tried to take the head of his penis inside. But Aiden twisted his hips to the side and pulled it out of reach. I chuckled and then tried again with the same results. I gobbled at the air like a plump koi at the surface of a Japanese pond, hoping for a tidbit. Come on, suck it, he said, backing away and forcing me to chase him on my knees. I enjoyed the challenge and surged forward to grasp his crown in my lips. Aiden stopped resisting immediately, his lips flying open in a gasp. I rolled my gaze up to meet his beautiful blue eyes, running my tongue through the slit at the end of his magnificent rod. Aiden moaned, imprisoned by his own desires and, of course, my lips. Again, I felt that sensation of being perfectly safe, taken care of despite my seeming captivity, or perhaps because of it. I knew Aiden would never hurt me, and that allowed me to give myself over fully to him, body and soul. I leaned forward, coming up on my knees and engulfing his veined, throbbing rod until it hit the back of my throat. I gagged, coming off for a moment so I could breathe. A line of sticky, clear fluid connected his member to my lips before tension caused it to break and spatter against my chest. I exulted in being covered in Aiden's cum. I wore it like a badge of honor. Good girl, Aiden said, eliciting a sigh and a contented smile from my stained lips. Now it's time for your reward. I watched intently as he returned to the table and withdrew an object from the final bag. He turned about and held it up for my inspection. I gasped at the sight of the red, apple-shaped, sparkly ball gag. He remembered, I said as he approached with it. 
Any last words? He asked, as he took me by the throat, squeezing just enough that my blood flow slowed and gave me a head rush. Only three, I said. Fuck me hard. He grinned, and I opened my mouth to take the apple inside. I found it to be semi-soft and, surprisingly, apple-flavored. I smiled around the gag as Aiden buckled it behind my head, pulling the strap tight. Then his hand was around my throat. Get up, he said, dragging me to my feet and choking me with his grip. I loved every second of it. Aiden kept his choking hand in place and reached down to slap each of my breasts firmly in turn. I cooed behind the gag, drool running out of the corner of my mouth to leave a wet spot on the carpet. I loved him so very much, and I loved it when he took charge. You want this? He asked, releasing my neck and grasping his thick member with his newly freed hand. I nodded vigorously, making eager whimpers behind the silicone apple in my mouth. Then come here, he said, grasping my hair near the scalp. He dragged me by my mane over toward the waiting sofa. We hadn't even reached the bedroom yet. Oh well, there was always tomorrow, I thought happily. Aiden shoved me face first down onto the sofa, arranging me so I knelt on the cushions with my chin resting on the back. I peered over my shoulder as he stepped behind me and pried my pussy lips open with his fingers. God, I love your little cunny so much, he said, burying his face in it. I cooed, flexing my muscles and making it dance against him. Aiden laughed eagerly, masticating my engorged labia with his lips, sliding his tongue all over my snatch until it enveloped my clitoral mound. I came hard, squirting all over his couch. Look what you did, he said with mock indignation, getting your dirty, nasty pussy juice all over my stuff. Aiden stood up and smacked the palm of his hand into my ass. I cried out, squealing with delight around the apple gag. He added another firm slap, and then another. Such a bad girl, he growled, reddening my cheeks with repeated spankings. Your ass is glorious. It's such a shame I have to punish it. Such a shame. He punctuated each word with an increasingly firm slap. I groaned behind the gag, feeling close to another climax. My belly clenched, and I thrust my bottom out for more of what he was dishing out. Aiden took the wrong message, or perhaps the right one, from my motion, however. Oh, you want the dick? he said. Then beg for it. I turned my head enough so I could see over my shoulder, and did my best to form the words. I was pretty unintelligible, but Aiden seemed satisfied, not to mention pleased. Good girl, he said. You beg so pretty for me. All right, here it comes. He shoved his rod inside of my quivering mass of love jelly. My eyes squeezed shut and I howled around the apple. Aiden thrust in all the way from behind until his balls slapped against my clitoris. Fireworks exploded behind my eyelids as I hit another level of orgasm. And he was just getting started. I felt as I had the first time riding a looping, sweeping steel roller coaster, locked in for the ride, helpless to determine the outcome but enjoying every scream. Aiden pounded my pussy, and I exulted in the sensation of being used so utterly, so completely by him. His pleasure was my pleasure, and vice versa. His cock was just perfect as it filled me up, and every time his testicles slammed into my engorged, glistening clit, I let out a micro-scream until my throat grew sore and my breaths came in ragged gasps. And still, he ravished me pounding me harder than ever before. I felt his fingers dig into my hips and heard him cry out with wanton abandon. Then he filled me with his seed at the same time I howled an orgasm. My muffled voice cut the air, high in pitch, and then dropping off to a moan as he collapsed on top of me. Aiden kissed the back of my neck, his hands all over my body as he cooed in my ear. I love you, Selena, he whispered. I love you. I tried to say I loved him too, 
but alas, the red apple made it impossible. Fortunately, Aiden removed it. As soon as my mouth was free, I used it to kiss him. Later, we lay on the sofa in each other's arms, watching the sunset over New York's iconic skyline. Aiden played with my hair idly as I snuggled in with a contented sigh. You're the best, babe, Aiden said softly. I know, I said with a smug tone. You got really lucky, babe. He laughed, but then kissed the top of my head. Yes, he agreed. Yes, I did.